All right. Um, the first thing is our agenda. Um, note that I downloaded the board packet this morning and I have 247 pages. You might want to double check what you have. I'll be using page numbers referring to that particular one. Also, and I'll double check with Jessica, but we got a note yesterday that Matt Larson will not be available today, but he really didn't have anything to update anyway. So that'll be something we actually will be striking from our agenda. Is that correct, Jessica? We couldn't hear you, Jessica. Uh-oh, Jessica's microphone is not working. You might have to, she says it is correct, but she will probably have to um, exit and restart. And one thing that used to happen to me occasionally, Jessica, I don't know if it's happened to you or whatever, but if I would start my Zoom before I would plug my microphone in, it never worked. I always had to make sure my mic was plugged in first, my headset or whatever it was, and then start it up. So anyhow, that's um, one thought. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we okay. got you, good. I just had to toggle a different switch. All right. The um, other thing I want to consider on the agenda is um, we're looking, we, I noticed that we have a tri-state partial contract opportunity presentation today. Will any of that need to be in executive session? I'll ask you, Jessica, again. No, and it's not much of an update because legally we cannot give a detailed update. So um, it'll probably only take five minutes. All right. And then finally, um, I would like to hear any staff details that they know of on the Hesperus solar project. And if you know anything that should be an executive session, we should do it there. So I'm also asking you about that. Again, we cannot talk about that project legally because they are an applicant in the RFP. And so we are prohibited from discussing that in detail. Okay. So with that said, it sounds like there won't be an executive session. If something happens between now and then, we'll ask one more time when that agenda item comes up probably this afternoon. All right, let's see. Are there any other changes anybody's got? Well, first, let me ask for a motion to approve the agenda with that one change regarding the executive session. Would anybody want to move that? So moved. Moved Tim. by Tim. Is there a second? A second to have Bob. Bob would second it. Is there any discussion or other changes to the agenda that any directors are aware of? Seeing no discussion, all those who would like to approve this agenda, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed, unmute and let us know. Or any abstentions? Okay, the agenda is passed unanimously, so we'll get started. The next item is the member comments and concerns. The first item I wanted to address is that we received a letter from the Board of Directors of McKenzie Electric Cooperative in North Dakota and the Sheridan Electric Cooperative in Montana. Their GNT is Upper Missouri, who similar to Tri-State gets power from Basin Electric Cooperative. They wanted to alert us of a couple items. One is that they're very concerned about the Dakota coal gasification projects, billion dollar losses that Basin passes on to their affiliated GNTs. I think they're going to start uh, trying to raise more conversation about that. Secondly, they wanted to inform us related cooperatives that they are also trying to get a fair exit charge from their GNT and are already two years into that effort. Uh, so I think all of you received that letter. You might want to take a look at some point and it's just something to kind of keep an eye on. I don't think anything more needs to be said about that. So now we'll look out to the, our attendees at this meeting. I show 15 and I see three hands up. So Drew, if you would, could you bring in the first person who has their hand up? And as we always do, those who wish to speak at our meeting, please identify yourself and either give us your direction or, or your, your um, address or what district you're in. So Brett, I'm doing it. I'm gonna let Dana in first. Okay, thank you, Janelle. You're welcome. Hey, Dana. Okay, Dana, we're not hearing you yet. Go ahead and give it another try. 
Hi, Dana, while you work on your microphone issue, um, we'll go ahead and have ask Janelle to bring in the next person. Okay, that's gonna be Gwen. Hi, um, I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Rick Bassett. For, Gwen, go ahead and identify yourself and your location. Oh, sorry. And then go on. Yeah, Gwen Unger, I'm in District 4. Um, again, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank Britt Bassett for everything that he's done for the co-op and for the board over the last, I guess it's nine years. Um, I know that <clears throat> when I was on the board and I needed an answer to something, the first person I would think of going to was Britt because he always, he seemed to have information about anything from elections to rates to what's going on at other co-ops. And uh, <clears throat> he, was, he was always you know, very precise about making sure that he had the right answers. So I, I think I probably speak for a lot of pe people in the, in the members of the co-op in <clears throat> saying that I think we're going to miss Britt. Um, but I, I understand he's, <clears throat> he's, you know, ready to go on to other things. And so, again, I just, I just want to tell you, Britt, I really appreciate everything you've been doing. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Gwen, and I'm sure we'll be staying in touch. And that also makes me think that um, I did receive a very nice card a nice digital card from staff and directors. And I did read through those yesterday and I downloaded that PDF so that I can keep track of it and look at it from time to time. So I want to first say thank you to staff and directors for making that nice gesture. Okay, Janelle, you can go ahead with the next person. Okay, let's try Dana one more time. Dana, can you unmute? Nope, not hearing from Dana again. So um, Janelle, okay. on to the next. Okay, let's go to Dale. Can you hear me? Yes, Dale, introduce yourself and where you're at and then tell us what you've got. Dale Ruggles, um, Rural Bayfield, District 4. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one, um, I too appreciate uh, you talking to me, Brett. Uh, last month, and some emails and some very valuable information. I appreciate that very much. I wish I would have gotten involved a little sooner. Um, but I do have some questions. I, I uh, was reading over uh, your financials, and I notice on line two of your cons consolidated financial statement, you have uh, what seems to be the most of or all of the tri state uh, energy credits listed there. Um, do you agree to that? It's the line items like 85 million? You know, that might be specific enough. It would be hard during this session to go through and, and be able to answer those, but we definitely want to provide you an answer. So well, there's just no other line item big enough to, ham to uh, have those. Um, because, yeah, there would be two things perhaps related to that. One would be how much we buy from power in them, and another would be what our what they have allocated to us in capital credits to this time, right. okay? So, so, and then the other part I have is in your bylaws, uh, Article 9, um, disposition of property. It says, if property may sell, mortgage, lease, otherwise dispose of, or en encumber any property provided by law in such manner under the terms and conditions deemed by the board of directors, to be in the best uh, association best interest, except that all sales of such assets shall not in any one year exceed the value of 10% of the value of all the assets of the cooperative, unless a majority of the members voting um, there aren't authorized annual sales exceeding that, that value. So it kind of tells me that um, if you're going to, if we're planning on using those credits as part of any buyout, that you can't do more than about 23 and a half million uh, of those credits. And I was wondering, um, how are you working around that particular issue? Um, what, tell me again, which um, article in the bylaws that was? Article 9, disposition of the property. Article 9, disposition. Okay. Um, that's an interesting twist we haven't 
as discussed before, my assumption would be that means things we're selling off our own assets or hardware at some point. But unless I'll look to Graham, unless he specifically can answer that now, it's something we will make note of and provide a more detailed answer. Graham, can you go ahead and address disposition of property and what that means related to Tri-State? I, I mean, I, I can't off the top of my head. I think this is a pretty sophisticated question that's gonna require a thoughtful answer. And so um, I think if uh, uh, Mr. Ruggles could submit something like this in writing and we can have a, a, a formal written response that we can uh, address these in, in detail is probably uh, what's best suited for. And, and Dale, I, I, I would like you to do that, but I'll also ask staff to try and make a note so it's not forgotten, because I think that is a good question. I think that will help us clarify some things. So it's, it's, it's uh, appreciate you thinking about that and looking into that detail to be able to ask that question. Uh, Dale, do you have something else? No, no, that's it. I was just, uh concerned about the 10%, that, that would limit you to about 23 and a half million. Um, and I, I, I just, I know, I know there's a lot of people that would like to see a vote of leaving Tri-State or at least some more um, clarity on the decision. And so I, I think one way or another, we've got to get some clarity or go for a vote. And I think this kind of holds the board's feet to the fire a little bit is all I'd like to say. And, and it's not that all of us are against this. Um, it's just that we're not been, we haven't been provided enough information to uh, make a reasonable conclusion on our own. And so, Dale, I completely agree time. with you. And from the board's, board's point of view, we're in the same boat. We've never been able to get the information that we need to be able to you know, carry through with making that decision. We will continue to do that. But I think clarifying questions like this about the bylaws would be helpful to everybody. So appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, um, Janelle, if you could go on with the next person. Okay. Let's go with Ms. Ray. Okay, Lisa, unmute and go ahead and we'll see if we can hear you. I still see, Lisa, that you, it shows on my screen that you have a microphone button that shows that you're um, muted. Is that something you can figure out? There okay. My name is Lisa Ray. I live in Durango. <clears throat> and um, my first question is, I didn't hear what district Mr. Ruggles was in. He's in Bayfield, so that would be south of 160, I'm assuming, so that is District 432. Four, he, uh, he indicated District 4, I guess. Response. District yeah. 4? Okay. Yeah. I think he um, meant that too, though, but go ahead, okay. listen. Well, part um, of Bayfield is, bis Bayfield is now bisected, so part of it is in 4. Ah, that's right. That's right. So if he lived north of 160, thank you, Tim. Good clarification. So he's probably right. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm here today to thank Britt Bassett for your years of service on the board. And I want you to know that uh, your added presence on the board allowed my voice to be heard because before my opinions fell largely on deaf ears. And uh, speaking of opinions, I think um, this whole time, your opinions have been well-researched, data-driven, delivered in a manner that's respected by both staff and board, um, and they have helped steer LPEA in a direction that we needed to go in a 21st century world. Um, you've enabled uh, navigation on this sea change in the industry. I really appreciate that. Um, your leadership has resulted in the adoption of strategic goals that are going to help LPA accomplish their mission in years to come. So 
I know I'm speaking for myself, but also I think that um, my thoughts are expressing many of those members that are in your district that you have represented. Um, we're most grateful for all the hours spent in the boardroom. Um, wish you the best for the future and your endeavors to come. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate those words. And I am certainly encouraged by how transparent LPA is now compared to what it was some years ago. And I will say you certainly have contributed to that with your activism over the years. And we appreciate your efforts as well. Thank you. Um, Janelle, go ahead with the next person. Okay, let's go with Marge Morris. Yeah, hi, and thank you for the opportunity to participate today. The reason I'm here is um, my understanding is that there is some um, vote or some kind of consideration for fiber optics versus 5G perhaps in our community. And I'm just here to share my personal experience with, with Wi-Fi in my own home and how I have spent the past year becoming wired again with ethernet and just, and the reason for that is severe insomnia that I have had over the years. And this has been a significant impact on my life and ability to sleep. And just wondering where the board is with this and what the status is in terms of this kind of consideration with going fiber optics versus 5G. Um, appreciate the comment. We do have a broadband committee update that will be taking place this morning, roughly around 10.30 to 10.40. And that committee is tasked to decide what LPA is going to do with broadband in the future. And they're hoping to be able to figure out the report in a couple of months or so. Um, so we don't really have an answer for you at this time. And it's really from the broadband committee's point of view uh, probably still a couple of months off. Uh, Kirsten, can you say anything more about that since you're chair of that broadband committee for Marge? Yeah, thank you, Britt. Um, hi, hi, Marge, thank you for, for your question. So we have been assessing what, if any, role LPA might play. We have not been too much into the weeds of any particular platform. So the different kinds of platforms, there's fiber optics, there's, well, there's still dial-up, there's... Uh, uh, wireless options, there's cable and such. So we, we haven't been digging into that. We currently have a feasibility study underway and I will give some more update that at around 10 o'clock. Um, but we certainly have been hearing from a lot of folks about the concerns about fiber versus anything wireless, whether it's microwave, uh, cellular, and, and, and certainly 5G. So we have been hearing these and I certainly appreciate that input. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, Janelle, if you would move on to the next person. Okay, let's go with Deborah Schussler. Okay, I was, I was worried about that mute button because I couldn't find it. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Deborah Schussler, District 2. Um, LPA's mission and first commitment is to deliver safe, reliable, affordable electricity. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I respect the manner with which you, the board, are handling the many challenges now on your plate. I trust that you will make the best decision going forward. That being said, however, historically, when there has been big challenges facing rural Americans, it has been the rural electrics that have stepped up. First, when groups of farmers banded together, creating co-ops and connected us with electricity. The next challenge was a telephone and the co-ops stepped up to see it through. Once again, we are faced with a communication challenge, that of being recognized as the most underserved internet area of the state. As one of many, I have faith that you, you, if you choose to do so, the RECs, the RECs can deliver a more quality fiber op optic network than any private provider. I believe it's because we are a member owned co-op and you pride yourself in good work ethic with quality results. I wanna to speak to the latest episodes and what makes a friend jokingly refer to me as the poster child for the digital divide. Two months ago, my husband and I received another notice 
of an increase in our charge for our high speed internet with CenturyLink. With a 0.1 upload and a 0.1 download speed, it's anything but high speed. It is particularly frustrating because I paid for fiber to the premises in the mid nineties. We all did. That money from the rate payers, two billion in Colorado from 2015 to 2019 was and continues to be fraudulently taken and diverted for the marketing and implementation of 5G, a new untested wireless spectrum that uses 10 times the energy of fiber and is unsustainable. It's the big lie, or what Bruce Kushnick, the regulator, refers to as broken promises. It's what caused the digital divide. The FCC's fraudulent accounting method being used across the country was revealed in the 2019 case of the regulators versus the FCC. CC Doucette, the top wireless educator in the country, mentioned at a recent Massachusetts for Safe Tech meeting that it looked like Colorado would be the first to secure irregulator money. She may have been referring to a grant proposal now being written by Dr. Timothy Sheckley. People across the country are catching on and so is fiber. And many of the fiber optic builds are being done through RECs. Just this week, I looked across the road and spotted the fiber box and coiled fiber hanging from a pole around hundred yards from my house heading down 172 to Ignacio. Our electrician verified it as fast track fiber, middle mile. 25 feet from our upper driveway, there's more coiled fiber on another pole. While riding my bike down County Road 308 yesterday, I noticed an orange cable around three inches in diameter being buried on the side of 308. Workers verified it as fiber. Further up the road, I stopped and spoke with a network technician who informed me that it was CenturyLink Fiber. We spoke for around 20 minutes. As you can imagine, I'm not enthralled with the idea of CenturyLink possibly providing me with fiber because they've proven themselves untrustworthy as most private telecom companies have. LBA has a great opportunity. I've been listening to webinars with Fiber Broadband Association and, and reading and listening to Muni Network episodes for over six months. Every story is a success story. It can take time, but it always succeeds. Fiber is the future and a great way to build back following the pandemic. I know you know this, but with fiber, LPA's future energy options are wide open, allowing the possibility for your own grid management and solar microgrids with the use of the wired Emma meter that will be released next year. I sure hope you decide to take on this challenge that would enrich the lives of our people and give us a continuing revenue stream for a better, richer Durango economy. Thank you, everybody. And I too want to thank Britt for all your years of service, Britt. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. That was pretty well rehearsed, Deborah. You were only over by about five seconds for your five minutes. Uh, I tried. I, I tried, you guys. I know. I'm a little chatty. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, appreciate it. Um, let's see, I don't see any other hands up now. So I'll ask the attendees again, if anybody wishes to speak at this time. All right, we've got Dana again, and maybe we figured out the microphone issue. So Janelle, if you would bring her up. You've got Tim. Dana. Can, can yes. you hear me? We got you, Dana. Hi. I've been trying, I've re been rebooting, you name it, I've been trying to get on here. Anyway, um, I really appreciate the chance to speak to you all. And I, I want to speak as someone who's very sensitive to wireless technology already. And I must tell you that I am pretty terrified for the future with 5G when there'll be no place to hide for anybody or anything on the planet. So I am so in support of this idea of fiber I think it is so forward thinking on the part of um, your company and all of us in this community. So I just want to say that I'm very supportive of that. Um, you know, a lot, an awful lot of scientists now do believe that 5G could be very harmful to all living things. And I think there just needs to be more research before we institute something like that. Um, anyway, to me, fiber to the premises is a huge step forward in protecting sensitive people 
And I know that you may think that's just a few people out there, but I, from everything I'm reading, it's 20% of the population already. And they, most people don't know that they're sensitive. They have these vague symptoms like insomnia, they have migraines, they have things they're going to their doctor for and getting drugs, but they don't know that the real problem is their wireless devices. Um, and the other thing that really concerns me is security. We have all this ransomware going on in the world, and we know that the fiber will be much more secure than what we have now. And it just seems prudent to think about the future and where all that is headed. Um, the only thing that I can say that I see as a downside is that more people will want to move to Durango, both for the efficiency of fiber if we have it, and also there are a lot of people out there who are aware that they need to get out of wireless radiation. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you all for your service. I know it's hard to listen to all these people complaining all the time. Okay, Dana, thank you. By the way, what district or whereabouts are you? Oh, I'm sorry. In? I didn't even say that my name or anything. I'm Dana Barlow and I, you know, I'm in Kohler's district. So Kohler, what district okay. am I in? <laughs> two, Kohler says. That's what I thought, but it just seems so odd. I'm in the Animus Valley and I'm in district two. So um, anyway. Yeah, the new border, you must be west of 550. That's yeah. How, yeah, that's how we do I it. Am. It's easy. Okay. okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, we've got another familiar name I see is here with his hands up. So Janelle, if you would bring Gary Lewin in. Okay. Okay, I'm Gary Lewin. I live up on the west side in District 4 I, on Junction Creek Road. And I want uh, first to thank you, Britt. You've been most helpful in our personal uh, vendetta with regard to base charges and opting out and so forth. So thank you for that and for your years of service. Um, with regard to the fiber optic, <clears throat> I pretty much echo what Dana was saying. She made some really good points. Radiation is radiation. Microwave is radiation. I read that there are thousands of tests that exist, studies that exist, and conclusions that prove that radiation, such as microwave technology, is damaging to the human being, to trees, to plants, to all the little critters that live on this planet, especially 5G. 5G, as I understand it, was invented as a war tool way back when in the 50s and 60s, it was used as a war tool. And of course, depending on the amplitude at which you use it, it can do a lot of damage. Um, there are thousands of satellites now being launched that are beaming this radiation down on the planet. It makes me grateful that I have a metal roof because some of that is blocked. Uh, Studies have shown that 5G ionizes our cells, living cells. It literally changes our cells. So I think if one looks at the studies and the results of those studies, it's pretty clear to see that 5G is not about human health, uh, although it does damage our human health. It's more about the power and the reach and the cash flow of the telecom industry, who holds, obviously, as anyone can deduce, the FCC is a captive agency. And of course, it was rubber stamped without testing, as Dana said, and others have said over and over. They keep bypassing normal testing procedures because they don't want to know, they want the money. And a lot of other sources are saying that 5G is the basis of the surveillance state, which is being pushed around the corner on us. Um, that aside, or uh, because of all of that that I just said, fiber optic presents a really good option for people in Durango to not use 5G, <clears throat> to have a good speed, and to keep the money local. It will provide a lot of jobs here. It will create cash flow for, for LPEA and maybe help stabilize our rates, especially with the cost of 
buying out the contract with Tri-State if that's what's around the corner. So I'm just uh, online here to voice my opinion and that is fully in support of the fiber optic technology as far as whatever it can do to help us avoid as much 5G as possible and as much wireless as possible, which is also a form of radiation, which is not good for our bodies. So that, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for letting me speak and I'll chair, hand the chair this microphone back over. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, I see that Dale has got his hand up again, so maybe there was a follow-up of clarification. So, Jill, if you would bring him on again, we'll let him go. Okay. Thanks, Brett. Hey, I just wanted to <clears throat> chime in there on the fiber optic thing, if that's okay. Is that all right, Brett? Yeah, as long as it's brief. Yeah, it's brief. Um, you know, I, I understand what the last two callers were saying, and I, I'm not so sure I disagree with them. But I also uh, have a little bit of common sense in realizing that if, we, you're, if, if they're expecting La Plata Electric to run fiber optic to the property lines of every member of La Plata Electric, I mean, you're probably talking billions and billions of dollars. And, you know, that's unreasonable. And you guys don't control what, what AT&T and Verizon and everybody else, the 5G signals, and that a lot of this fight, we need to go to them. I mean, you guys, instead of you guys, to stop the 5G if we're going to stop the 5G. But the cost to run fiber, I mean, somehow we should be able to get a class five bid to run fiber to 50,000 residences, and you're going to see it billions of dollars. So, but I don't disagree that maybe there is an issue, but thank you, Brett, and thank you again for your service like everybody else. Okay, and that will be what this study being done and what the report is. We'll be looking at some of these numbers. I wouldn't, think from um, initial in information we got, Dale, it's probably not in the billions, but it's definitely probably in the hundreds of millions. Okay, I think everybody's had an opportunity now. Um, I think we can go ahead, unless there's somebody who hasn't already spoken who wishes to speak, we will go on with the rest of our agenda. Fred, I, I, I think Tim might have a... Uh, response to one of those. He's got, he's had his hand up for the. Okay. Uh, at this point, I've only been looking at panelists. So Tim, if you would go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Britt. Um, you, I just want to correct something you said <clears throat> in response to one of the people who mentioned something about 5G and fiber. And that is this committee is not making a decision on what LPA will do. It's coming to provide a recommendation to the board who will make the decision. So I just want to make sure that's uh, clearly understood. Ah, correct. The committees can only recommend things to the board. The full board's always got to make the decisions. Appreciate that correction. And it was good clarification that Kirsten had about what it is that the committee is doing. It's been an interesting juxtaposition between past careers where I was involved in fiber networking and LPA, which is electrical. These two things have sort of come together now. It'll be interesting to see what occurs. Okay, so thank you all attendees. And we will now go on to the rest of the agenda. Um, the next item is the consent board items. They are the approval of the board minutes, the accepting a new members list, capital credit payment to estates and our monthly write-offs. We will group these together, and if there are any changes to the minutes, they can be handled during discussion of this motion. So at this point, I would like a motion to approve those four consent board items. I move to so move by consent board Colbert. items. I got John Lee made the motion to approve those, and um, now I'm looking for a second. Second by Kohler. Seconded by Kohler. All right, is there any discussion on these four consent board items before we look to motion or vote on those. Uh, Dan Huntington, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just, we've kind of dummied down the discussion and the minutes on reports and whatnot. Is there a possibility of putting a link in the minutes for people who read the minutes and don't know where to go to get the reports, put that link in there to make it more user-friendly. 
or attach oh. the reports to the minutes? Yeah, do you, let's see, I'm thinking, do you have a oh, specific okay. example of what you're thinking about there? Like, because well, not all the attorney's are... report in the minutes, the attorney report just says he hit the highlighted items in the report and uh, whoever's reading the minutes has no idea what those highlighted uh, items are. Yeah, and I guess that so would be if, the thought I have is, Graham, when you um, create your attorney's report for us, is that something that could typically be shared via a link to the minutes? Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm off the top of my head, I'm concerned about the attorney-client privileged nature of that document. And, uh, you know, sometimes there is confidential information in that. Um, and a lot of times it, it, it uh, does need to be um, kept between the attorney and the client. So I think, uh, you know, that there, you know, there might be some ability to expand a little bit on uh, the, you know, public attorney um, reporting uh, details, but I think, um, you know, generally the, the idea of uh, sort of uh, our minutes as a, as a brief synopsis of, of the meeting and not a transcript of the meeting is, is uh, the way I've always understood um, the minutes to be kept. Okay, but I will um, expand on what Dan said with the idea of transparency. Um, it could be useful, particularly for reports that are given that we may consider putting on our website anyway, that there could be links put to those for ease of people to get additional information. I think a lot of that stuff we are putting on the web, but if it's not difficult, and I think it's reasonable to consider linking things which the public could see to our minutes. It's something we haven't actually done in the minutes before. I don't know if that's appropriate place for it or not. So I will ask that to any staff who would want to consider that request that perhaps there could be some links in the minutes to reports that would be available otherwise. I mean, and Britt, I will, I'll say that we, we do have, you know, under our um, cooperative information disclosure policies, um, a list of what is automatically uh, placed on our website. And so I think right now we queue pretty directly to that. And so to, to deviate from that, I, I'd need to pull up policy uh, to kind of quote it to you, but you know, there's a, it would sort of require ad hoc um, board action to sort of add, I mean, there, there's the opportunity to add additional things, but sometimes it requires sort of ad hoc board action. I also would say that, um, but one of the things that is included on that list of everything that's automatically on our website is the recording of the entirety of the meeting itself. So it's, it's pretty easy uh, online to get back and, and rewatch the entire meeting um, can't remember off the top of my head exactly how long the policy indicates that we keep those on the website, but it's it's pretty decent. Is it two years? Okay, yeah. I believe so. so yeah, Tim. Um, Tim say, said two as well. Britt. So one thing we'll take this back and look at it. Um, I think that Dan's point is well taken, um, but we have we're more transparent than most co-ops in the U.S. because most don't record. Um, at least live stream as well. Well, some record, but um, I th believe that we have a lot more transparency for our members than usual. So what we can do is we can look back on the website where we have the board meetings posted and make sure it's packaged so that the boards or any member looking at the last board meeting can click on the minutes, they can click on the recording, and then they can click on the public reports that all of you provide. So if that works, I think that would probably be a good way. And then everything is covered for transparency purposes. Does that work for folks? That sounds real good to me. Dan, do you have any follow-up on that? Yeah, the attorney report, I, I agree with Graham on a lot of that. That was the first thing that came to mind. But um, like the director points and whatnot, 
director reports. You know, those are already posted, but there's a lot of people. That website is not very user friendly for someone like myself. And I think the links would help guide people to the place to find the information that they need through the minutes. Yeah. Okay, website and finding one's way through is always a challenge. There's no doubt. As one gets more used to certain things, I've certainly found the what staff has done related to our past resolutions and minutes and all that in the new tabular format to be really great to be able to find information much better than we've had. So yes, it'll continue to be a struggle. And if people have specific things they can point to in the website that can help staff, let them know. But um, it, it's um, one of those things. It's, it's always hard to get all the information you want at your fingertips. We appreciate people continuing to ask for it. That's transparency. All right, we're in discussion of this motion and it has to do with the minutes and the consent board items. So Kohler, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not too sure if I missed it or not, but Dan mentioned it and also Jessica kind of mentioned it, but is there a possibility in the minutes that we could put not a link, but a time where the people can find that subject on the recorded um, streamlined video? And I've had a lot of people say that it's really hard to find where that discussion is in the video. And maybe that's a good place to put it is in the minutes. So if it's the attorney's report, you can look at 2.03 p.m. on the, on the video and, and find the discussion that happened to the public. Just a suggestion, and maybe that's what you already mentioned, Jessica. Thank you. Any response? All right. Okay, any more discussion on this motion to approve the consent board items? Seeing none at this time, all those who would approve this motion, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any who oppose approval of this motion, aye. please unmute and let us know. No opposes, any abstentions? Okay, that motion is passed. The consent board items have been passed. We're now going on to the CEO and staff reports. The division dashboard starts on page 39. Jessica, would you start there and lead us on? Yes, can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. It looks like everybody's doing some kind of dance on that picture. Could you explain what that dance is? Yeah, and, and I can punt it over to Jerry as well, but um, you know, bringing Jerry on as the new VP of operations really brought some new fresh ideas. And one of those was to do stretching and calisthenics in the morning, which is actually a proven um, technique across the US actually. We even had it at our last couple companies where if you do proper stretching, which we should all be doing in the morning, um, you reduce, um, strains and sprains and all sorts of different things. Um, so Jerry is having his crews do this on the dock in the mornings. And as you can see, it's actually expanded to other people. So um, the other office, the other side of the office, uh, like even Brad is in there and Shay, um, everyone gets involved sometimes. So it's a really great opportunity to one, see each other in the mornings and then try to increase our uh, safety measures and avoid future slips, strains, um, anything else related to your body. Jerry, did you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, that's our number one insurance claim is strains and, and, and sprains. And so we're trying to do everything we can to reduce that number. Okay. Table of contents. Okay, so we'll get to the key performance indicators. Um, these are all green checks, so we're doing well. And Carl will go into more detail about some of these, but everything is right on track and we're meeting or exceeding our performance goals. These are May highlights. Uh, so this is a newish employee, Emily in the black background. Um, and she was at one of the ride and drive events. So we're participating in more of those around the community, which has been successful. This again is our North Star, and these are the items that the board has set and the um, big buckets where we are following this. And so we're reporting in the dashboard on all these items. 
But the first one is the executive report. And so the two main items for last month were really uh, Mesa Hotline School. I was able to go out and attend that with our crews. Um, our crews split weeks. And the week that I was able to attend was um, Pagosa office. So they had their line crews out here. Um, and then one of our foremen from the Durango office, Michael Messier, was also there. It's a great opportunity to meet and work with other line crews um, across the state, co-ops, including um, tri-state crews were there. And Jessica, meet vendors. where does that occur at? It's in Grand Junction. Thank you. And um, it's a newer facility. It's pretty impressive. They have a classroom um, that they are building out. They have bigger plans to actually expand this. Uh, but all the vendors were there. So we were able to meet with Western United, the CEO, Greg, was there. Um, folks that are actually supplying our um, a lot of our equipment on the line. So it was really interesting. We saw a demonstration on uh, pole wrapping where some of the co-ops are starting to think about, well, let's just wrap the poles to, to um, keep the stability and, and really keep the poles safe from forest fires. I know the Holy Cross and Jerry, maybe you know who else is doing this, maybe Poudre Valley, but they're starting to wrap poles. Um, and so we're going to, I think they just started last year. So we'll see how it goes with the fires. Holy Cross has already had a fire, a couple of them in their service territory this year. Uh, but I don't think it's a, around where they had their poles wrapped. And really, you, you really uh, want to wrap poles more around transmission lines. So high critical areas, that's because they are expensive and many of them you do have to replace. So, but I think the other point is, is that, you know, one thing I learned from the linemen at this week long event is that there's not just one way to do things. And so I was really proud of our crews to, to talk about that and to meet other crews and they split them up so that they're working with other crews across the state to learn different techniques. Um, just a really great program though. And then um, I've also, I spent a lot of time this last month in the CEO orientation. So just completed that program. Again, learning a lot about NRECA and different opportunities. I'm getting really involved in that group, which is fun. Um, they asked me to be uh, one of their advisors, NRECA national advisors. So they only ask 20 CEOs from across the U.S. to do two year, two year program or two year obligation. And so I've agreed to that. Um, so that's pretty exciting so that I work with Jim Matheson and his senior staff to really guide the future of NRECA for the next two years. Okay, so we've really, got one question that's come up, Jessica. So I'll ask Bob to go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I just had a quick question on the hotline school. Uh, one, one is how many of our folks went? And second is, is that the facility where, does that lineman school where people when young people go away for the longer term training, is that the same place? Uh, yeah, Jerry, how many people attended that total? Oh, uh, we've got a highlight coming up. Okay. To speak to. So I won't steal his thunder, but we'll, we'll, Jerry will be able to talk a little more, more about that if that's okay, Bob. I don't want to take his thunder. <laughs> yeah. Is that the same facility though, where you yes. go for extensive lineman training? Yeah. Okay, and what was really fun, I was hoping to get that picture in here, but um, one of our uh, awardees came up to us when we were taking pictures with the linemen, um, the scholarship grant funding for lineman school. And he came up and said, thank you. I love it. So it was actually really fun to see that, you know, we're funding these young people to, to start their future in being a lineman. So that was really exciting to see. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, move to Jerry on this one. So uh, accidents and incidents, we had uh, one accident. One of our foremen was rear-ended at a stoplight, uh, not his fault and no injuries, just a minor fender bender. And then we had a near miss with a crew who was hand digging around a pole and about 20 inches down, the pole was butt rot, and it ended up falling over into the county road. Um, crew did a fantastic job of making the scene safe um, and really reworking their original plan so nobody was injured, uh, the public was safe the whole time. And uh, 
COVID cases, we had one. Um, we are back, lobbies open, and it's really nice seeing faces again. Okay, and the next one is Drew. So the, the Durango office wireless infrastructure that we previously had for about the last decade, um, it, it served its purpose and worked well, but it was a really complicated system. And so we've just recently replaced that uh, with a, a system that's simpler and it gives us a lot more visibility into what's going on uh, with our wireless connections. And so uh, it's, it's a big improvement to take care of us for a while. So we're, we're happy to have that completed. Okay, any questions on that slide? No, uh, Bob, did you have anything else? No, his hand was up is all. Go ahead. Sorry, I'll take my hand out. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, and Hillary, on the disconnect notification. Okay, so we have a, a team that's kind of within the billing department and also the member services department that is focused on our disconnects. And they came together and brainstormed a process that would make this um, better for our members and also better for our staff. So they implemented a new disconnect process. It, it actually gives one final call to our members on the day of disconnect. And this has been incredibly successful in its first month. Um, it prevented 27 field connects, which uh, disconnects, which would actually require our meter techs to go out in the field to disconnect. So a lot of time um, and resources saved in that. And it also prevented a total of 78 total disconnects. So um, as you can imagine, it's very, very inconvenient and um, frustrating when your power is shut off. And so we really feel like this is providing a better service to our members. So big kudos to that team. Hillary, a quick question on that. I know we did have a couple of members speak up or provide information about some unhappiness with some of the disconnects. Did this process start because of that or did that play any role in this? Um, I believe those were related to a, a different a portion of, of the process, but that definitely did get fed into fed into their discussions. And, and as always, we're, we're iterating. Um, so we welcome any any additional comments from members too. Okay, I um, will this be something that you will put into a newsletter or some bulletins to members? We hadn't planned on it. Um, you know, we, we don't generally always update when we, we have process changes, but we think anyone who this does impact will, will recognize it. It's yeah, a smaller certainly... subset of our members, but. Ryan, you certainly are the best judge of what's good information to go out. It's just if um, in some cases, if you're able to uh, let the members know that um, they were heard and changes were made in some way, that's always good. So, so go ahead, thank you. Thank you. That was it. Joe, did you have a question? Um, Joe, go ahead. No, I just wanted to thank uh, Hillary and the team for doing this. It's these little things that really make a difference for our members. And I, I certainly hope that they recognize that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I think Hillary and the MSRs are working really hard because um, more than any of us, they're the ones that get the calls of, of customers crying and it's pretty heart-wrenching. So anything that they can do to help our members, they're, they're doing. Okay, and Garrett's actually gonna fill in on the Mesa Hotline School and give us more details. So Jessica pretty much nailed it. Um, so we, Bob, to answer your question, we had six apprentices and four linemen uh, go up there. And uh, uh, pretty much what Jessica was saying, it's a two week school. Uh, so we send one group up one week and then another group up for the second week. Uh, this picture was taken there. Um, the guys get to practice, um, get training on just all aspects of line work um, from underground installations, uh, transmission, distribution. Um, the vendors are there. They get to check out the newest equipment and, uh, you know, hand tools. Um, yeah, I really don't have any more much to add to that, but. It's just a great learning experience for the guys. Garrett, um, I got a quick question. Do Are these techniques and things that the 
the linemen kind of already know how to do? Or are they getting introduced to some brand new stuff as well? Or is it mostly practice on what they know? Um, I'd say a little bit of both. Like this picture here, some of these things they, so they're working on de-energized lines. So some of these apprentices, they don't have the time in yet to be able to do something like this. So it's, it's, it's new, it's practice, it's, it's a little bit of both. So, okay, thank you. Uh, Kirsten, go ahead. So with having the vendors there, do these guys come back with big shopping lists? <laughs> yes. <to> <laughs> yes. <laughs> big wish lists. Even, even I do. <laughs> I got this at the... <laughs> Oh, no, maybe it, was, people will see some of that on the capital budget next year then. <laughs> well, and I mean, honestly, a lot of it um, is about fire mitigation, like this kind of stuff. I'm sure Dan loves seeing all these like diagrams and stuff, but yeah, pretty interesting. Okay, I'm going to go into the next page. Okay, um, capital projects. This is Jerry. So we've kicked off our capital projects and... Uh, we're, we're cruising on them. Um, everything's going really smooth and we are, our, one, our crew is doing the FALFA project. So if you're ever out that way, stop by and say hello. Just make sure you have your hard hat on. Okay, and then uh, Garrett's gonna talk about helicopter inspection. So the helicopter inspection is something that we do annually. Uh, however, we're going to up it a bit and do it two or three times a year as part of our uh, fire mitigation efforts. Um, so on this trip, uh, we sent a couple of our staking engineers, a servicemen, our line superintendent, and basically they just flew over our entire system, um, transmission system, and we're looking for any vegetation in our right of way that needs trimming. Um, they're looking at structures, problem trees, uh, anything that might need attention. Uh, they did find a few trouble trees um, on that inspection and um, we had the tree trimmers um, already take care of that. So, uh, so one thing, gonna, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say one thing that Kirsten asked in the email um, was drone inspections. So Jerry or Garrett, do you wanna quickly answer her question on that. So right now we have three companies that are gonna do pilot projects for us uh, so we can compare what they have to offer. Um, they all have, they say that they all do the same things and we want to compare the three before we uh, hire one to do our drone inspections for us. Um, the capabilities of these drones these days uh, are amazing. And they don't have to get nearly as close with the camera technology as they used to. So they, the clearances that they can stay away from our structures, um, it's great. Um, and hopefully we can find these problem spots with the infrared technology as well and hit the maintenance before it causes problems and outages. Hey, we've got a few questions now, and we'll start off with uh, Tim Wheeler. So, Tim, go ahead. Great, thank you. So, the capital projects on track photo shows a trench there, and I, you know, I assume that that's perhaps new service or replacement of existing service. I just wonder when we open, you know, create a trench for electrical connection, do we also consider uh, conduit for broadband for fiber in any of these? What, what, to what extent do we do that? Maybe is a better way to phrase that. You know, on this one here, this is the, the project in Highlands out here in Pagosa, but um, we did not plan on doing anything like that um, out here. Um, but that is something to consider. Um, that's a good idea. And Tim, we, we've looked at in capital projects um, various things. We have not adopted a policy, a blanket policy, anytime we open a trench to put conduit in it. If it's something that leads towards an asset that, you know, we're still working under an operational fiber 
uh, plan right now. If it has um, any possibility of connecting into our assets, we'll we'll put conduit in there. For instance, we were thinking about putting a uh, doing a, a cable replacement job in Pagosa that could possibly connect around the Pagosa Medical Center out towards one of our, our fiber existing fiber lines. In which case, we would definitely put conduit in something like that. So another possibility is to consider ensuring those who might want to do that have the opportunity to maybe participate in, in putting that kind of kind of, if, if it's not operationally beneficial to Lapata Electric uh, in the near future or part of our capital plan, just the act of you know, digging a trench as I'm sure you're aware is expensive and, and uh, difficult sometimes. And so, you know, is there a way to coordinate with others, vendors, who might need that or want that fast track comes to mind, of course, but there are others. So I, I just, I guess I would make a request that we take a look at that sooner than later because um, capital projects are ongoing throughout the year. And I don't know if that's something uh, staff could come up with a recommendation on or something. Anyway, I, I just hate to see a potential opportunity um, not taken advantage of. Thanks. Okay, uh, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Tim. That's a very good point. Uh, back to the to the drones. Um, when we do get that, of course, it's a major communication thing because we like to do target practice uh, on drones and, and having people understand what we're doing out there is going to be super important. And I know you guys have, have done your homework on that, so I'm looking forward to seeing that roll out. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, on, on the uh, I really like that the um, fire prevention inspections are increasing, and and I hope we do some media outreach on that. I think you know fire concerns is just on everyone's mind these days, as far as I can tell, and I think it would be good to just keep telling people that LPA is doing lots of stuff to. Uh, to make sure we, you know, we can hopefully prevent a fire. Um, directly related to that is the question I have probably for Garrett and then um, maybe it would be for Jerry otherwise. Um, I ran into a friend actually just yesterday who is a surveyor and he specifically said he's doing work on LPA lines between Pagosa and Bayfield, pretty extensive surveying in the forest. And he asked me what it was for. And I tried to get him to describe it. And he said, well, they're just going along the sides of power lines. So it made me have a feeling it was exactly what Joe asked about, but I didn't know for sure. So um, Garrett, are you the one who could address what those surveyors are doing? And I could tell him. Um, I would think that they'd be surveying for the 115 line. But um, is that right, Jerry? I mean, that's what I would assume. And that would be important improving our 69 to 115 that project or, or something else yes sir all right so is there a right-of-way change when you go from 69 to 115 because the right-of-way is already there there will be uh, oh go ahead Graham. i was just gonna say it, it depends on what existing right-of-way is there right you know i mean so uh, um there's a variety of right-of-ways uh, along those lines they're not homogenous Okay, so yeah. Right. Oops, sorry, Brett. Is is there any change of the width of the right of way when you go from sixty nine to one fifteen? We're trying to work with the forest right now because if you look at uh, Tri State's right of way, it's a hundred foot, and it works as a fantastic fire break. And Dan and I have talked about it, and Graham and all of us. Uh, um, so. We're working, we're trying to work right now um, with our right of way agent and the Forest Service to see if we can't widen it in, in certain areas since the project's going to be so big. Because I think it would benefit both of us. Right. Okay. And then to reiterate what Joe is saying, yeah, fire's on everybody's minds. So, what we can do to help and to keep our members informed of efforts will be good. Are there any more questions at this time before Jessica moves on? I'm not seeing any. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. 
And honestly, this uh, point that Dan's gonna talk about will probably address item D on the agenda as well, because this is the update on the RFP partial contract opportunity. So we will hit both at the same time. All right, Dan? Yes, thank you, Jessica. I was just about to mention that as well. So yeah, just to give you an update on where things stand, uh, maybe I'll hit that second bullet first and uh, let everybody know that um, during the open season process, LPA did get the full one or full 71 megawatts that we requested in partial capacity. Um, so that was that was good to see. There were a total of three utilities that uh, requested capacity within the open season process. It was under the 300 megawatts, so everyone received the full allocation that they requested. Now um, we. We saw that we were gonna have it, at least something to go out to bid for. So we'd actually released the RFPs prior to our allocation announcement. And that was sent to 50 potential bidders. We had a informational webinar on May 20th. Um, since then, just to give you a, you know, continue that update, we did get um, uh, 13 letters of interest. That was the next phase that people had to do was submit a letter of interest in bidding um, after that point. Uh, 13, I'm very happy with that number there. We have now, and we now have 13 NDAs that have been signed so that we can openly discuss, um, you know, our load profiles and, and everything else that's needed with these, um, these potential bidders. Now, um, don't be concerned that we sent it out to 50 and only got 30, 13 uh, letters of interest. A lot of the people that were included in the uh, release of the information that we sent the RFP to were uh, maybe just solar developers. We knew that they couldn't by themselves um, uh, submit an RFP that would meet a, a block of power, because keep in mind, we are looking at the max option, a 24 seven block of power. So although they themselves couldn't do it, they um, were included because they could team up with other um, aggregators and such in the area. Uh, we've been working with a lot of developers, um, built a lot of relationships. I know there's a lot of good projects that have potential here in our area. So we want to make sure that they uh, know what's going on and have that opportunity to, to work with uh, somebody that could put, their, put that package together for us and submit a proposal to us. Pause there for any questions. Yeah, Tim's got one. So go ahead, Tim. Sorry, I had to find the unmute button there. Um, so you, you mentioned 71 megawatts, but previously we've talked about 74. What, what's, so when it? the uh, initial um, release of the open season occurred and they submitted that to FERC, that was based on 2019 loading for approval by FERC. When FERC uh, did do their approval, they said they had to re- um, Let's re-notify all the members and start the process over because FERC said Tri-State wasn't allowed to jump the gun and start the process as early as they did. They had to restart the process when they did. They then looked at 2020 loading. Our loading was a little bit lower in 2020, thus resulting in a, a lower uh, capacity for the 50% that we were talking for. Um, can I ask one more question there? Um, I know that we have our 5%, we have our um, potential to roughly 2% on community solar, and, I, and then our 95% uh, our, our from Tri-State. And you have, I think you or somebody described it as different buckets, right? So I'm curious uh, if we were to get the 71 megawatts of capacity, where does that lead us in terms of uh, the percentage of supply that we would receive subsequent to that from, from Tri-State? Would it be 50%? How, how would that be calculated then? Yeah, that's a great question, Tim. Um, and something we've, we've struggled, we have gotten clarity on that. The 5%, when we talk about the typical 5%, that's always been a percentage based on kilowatt hour sales or kilowatt hour purchases from Tri-State. Uh, when we start talking about partial, that's actually a percentage based on capacity, a peak capacity even. And so we now have 71 megawatts. If you do 71 megawatts 24 seven, that's actually 66% of our kilowatt hours that we, 
that we purchase. So two third, we can self supply through this partial two thirds of our energy purchases. Um, then layer on top of that the five percent. Then layer on top of that the two percent. Um, you know where we could be buying less than thirty percent of our kilowatt hour sales from Tri-State um, with with this if it's fully deployed. Um, the opportunities that we'll have out there, I should say. So that leads to another question. I'm sorry. Um, but I think it's important. And there's a bylaw amendment that Tri-State's going to have in their August meeting around um, members retain their seat at 50%. Um, so any idea how we would fit within that? Would we be out of that or in that? It's a little, uh, there's a lot of percentages here. It's yeah, kind of yeah that's another great question. We have to look at that a little more carefully, Tim. That's something we'll get back with you on because we want to make sure that if that's a kilowatt hour or a capacity limitation, it makes a big difference. Right. Hey, thank you, Jim. Got that as a follow-up item there, Jessica, for our list. All right. Kohler, go ahead. You know, just a, a point on that bylaw change. The board did not pass a recommendation to change the 65% down to the 50% in the change on the amendment to the, the membership. And I believe that when it goes in front of the membership, if it's brought back up by a motion, it will fail again. So it'll probably be 65% instead of the 50. And Kohler, to be, explain that explicitly, is it 65, if you're buying 65% or more from Tri-State, you get a vote? Um, so explain that. That's right, You, if you buy, you can't buy anything less than 65% and keep your, your seat on the board. Now, again, I, I can't remember now if that's capacity um, or energy. I, I, I can't remember that part, but it, it will stay at 65% unless a motion is brought up and it does pass, but I, I don't expect that. All right, so that sounds like it is something to be looked into a bit in the future, and the staff has that as in the future agenda item to be addressed, because yeah, it will be interesting how that turns out. We've got a couple of more questions. Uh, Holly, go ahead. Thank you, sir. I just want to reiterate that that is really super important point for me that I've been thinking a lot about, and I'm, I'm a little um, disturbed, I guess I could say, about that information, Kohler, but thank you for it. Can well, I Go ahead, Jessica. Just to remind people, though, that, um, and Kohler, correct me if I'm wrong, but being on the board, being a voting member is not like it used to be, just to remind folks, because now the authority is not with the board like it used to be. It's now with, tri it's now with FERC. So it doesn't even often matter if the board passes something, which is, which is an indication of the um, policy 125 that the tri-state board um, sent on to FERC, and that was then denied by FERC, and FERC said go back and start over on that policy, and that's the one where it dictated how how to go about a full buyout, getting the full number. Um, and even Dwayne, we did a um, a town hall meeting with Dwayne last week, and he said the same thing. He said that it's now clear to the board at FERC or at Tri-State that um, they have lost a lot of their ability to um, dictate and manage um, and have that authority because now it is at FERC. So I want to get to, I mean, there's other, you know, I don't know all the ramifications of losing a board seat, honestly, but it is not as, as it used to be, just to remind people, because you still have the ability, if you, regardless if you're a voting member or not at Tri-State, you still have a voice at FERC. So, so there are some benefits that we're seeing of going to FERC in that regard. We do have an option, especially now that if we do lose a board seat, we can still go to FERC, submit comments, get, in, get involved in negotiations on wholesale rates, do everything we would have done otherwise. Well, then I'll ask the follow-up if um, Tri-State would remove us from a board seat, even though we buy far more power than 20 or 30 other members, is that something that LPA would bring up to FERC and say, hey, that's not fair. It shouldn't be based on percentage. It should be based on what you're buying. I know you can't answer that now. I'm just throwing that out there as, as something else to think about. 
and obviously colored something that, that you'd want to think about as, as well. Um, there's a couple more questions. And, and I might just, go ahead. And I mentioned one thing about what Jessica talked about. And I think she's 100% correct when it deals with rates. The other issues, though, is still in the in the board's hands. But the rates, that's correct. It, it does go to FERC. All right. Um, Joe Lewandowski, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Dan, I, I don't know what you can say about this, but can you explain a little bit about, you know, is, is Tri-State evaluating this and kind of what's the steps and do we have any kind of, any kind of a timeline or, or anything um, as far as, you know, getting, a, getting approved, I guess, uh, uh, to go this route? It's, this is approved. This is a path forward for us today, right now. Um, so now it's the next steps are going to be, we have a, we go and find a replacement power supply. Um, and that's what the RFP is out there for. We evaluate that. We have to make that final determination of, of uh, what, you know, do the numbers all add up. The, uh, the other part that is lingering out there is that Tri-State has filed, and, and I guess I need to be careful when I say approved versus accepted. I might have to have Graham or, or Matt, you know, talk about some of those things, but um, I, I, I think this is an approved, actually in the approved phase. Um, the, the, one, the one of the question marks out there still is what they call the BDP, the buy down payment. Um, they do have a filed payment that um, I sort of look at is it's not going to get any worse than that, not to exceed that. Um, we are working with Tri-State to lower that now that there's uh, fewer question marks out there. They know here's three utilities that are going to do this. The power transmission aspects are going to look like this. I think we have room to get that down lower. So we're, we're working on um, doing that with, with FERC and Tri-State. Um, so I think what's, what's to come is still a good thing. Um, so once we have those the proposals, we'll evaluate those, really try to put the, the final uh, pencil to it all, determine all the transmission aspects. That's still a little bit of a question mark that we're working on. And then we'll, uh, that's why we have that time gap between sort of now and uh, later in August. We have to evaluate what's given to us so we can get that, that presentation buttoned up. Yeah, and Dan, Dan will send out the um, email again, Dan, because we sent you guys out an email with the timeline on this. So maybe we'll send it again, just to remind folks. Um, but the reminder is that we are working with our consultants. It's because it's very detailed and technical. And we will have a committee of the whole meeting. We'll schedule it, I believe, in September to walk through the, the kind of final slate and give our recommendation. So there will be ample time to talk to the board um, about these projects and get into the details of the cost benefit analysis. So that will be coming later in August and September. Okay, great. Um, we'll go on with the next question that is Kirsten. So Kirsten, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to revisit the, uh, the tri-state board issue. I, I, I don't think the board is, is totally impotent. They certainly are in the, in the rate thing and the rate issue, some of that has been Conway, but as, as far as some other decisions, not so much. On the other hand, I think that we are still members. So Jessica is still going to be attending all the manager meetings. And I think even if we don't have a board seat, we should still have a representative up at that board. So something to keep in mind, so much of that is about the relationship, about being in, being in people's faces in a nice, in a, in a nice way, usually, but not, not always. And, and really working on those relationships. So board seat or not, we still have a good say at, at Tri-State. And I don't, I don't want to you know, raise, throw up our hands and say, well, that's worthless, because it, it is not. Those relationships are what it's about. Yeah, and there will have to be some clarification of terminology, whether you're, you're simply voters removed or the membership or whatever, but that's stuff to be determined in the future that, that's gotta be looked at. So appreciate you bringing that up again, Kirsten. Okay, I think, uh, Dan, you can probably go on to the other thing. As you can tell, obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of interest in the power requirements and what's going on with that. So yeah, go I, ahead. I think I've covered both the, the check marks and checkpoints here. Um, so we'll continue on down the road and got some other topics coming up later. Okay. okay. All right, so Hillary has both these. 
Um, right. So we were active in our media relations efforts in this last month, um, sending four news releases and answering numerous queries around the elections, around our future power supply, uh, tri-state CTP methodology, rate reduction, and the electric vehicle readiness plan. So there was a lot going on in the media last month. Um, as Jessica also alluded to earlier, we are re-engaging in the community in face-to-face -face events, which is just so much fun. Um, and my team is just really eager to, to continue doing that. Um, we were a participant in the Home and Ranch show and um, our booth had uh, one of the more popular slots um, in the Home Builder Association's um, lineup. Uh, we also participated in two different EV ride and drive events and we're back doing our electric safety demonstrations. Um, the picture here is Amanda, who's our solar expert, um, doing a demonstration for the kiddos at Sunnyside Elementary. So I'm um, really excited to get back out there in the community again. Uh, All right, really a question. An anecdotal comment I have is it seems to me as if our members are even more informed about all things LPA than they used to be. And we've always had an informed group. I know it's hard to ever measure how that's occurring, but it seems to me as if the new newsletter methodologies and some of the additional stuff we're reaching out, I, I'm really encouraged with how much more informed our community seems to be from my point of view about what's going on. So um, I wanted to say thank you for that effort. Uh, Kirsten, go ahead. Hillary, I know later on we talked about the F-150s we have on, on order. Um, you want to do some big excitement at the Farm and Ranch Show, bring a couple of those F-150s for people to drive <laughs> Yeah, I think that I think we're going to have a big internal fight about who gets those trucks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm they may have the, to be in the pool. The truck <laughs> races, the truck races, yes. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next one is Drew, credit card devices. Yep, so we replaced the uh, devices that you use to swipe your credit card at, at uh, both offices in order to stay up to date with the latest uh, security and stay compliant with the PCI uh, standards and so forth. So um, that'll take care of us for a couple of years and then we'll replace them again. Uh, but you also have to get them kind of configured with our with our accounting system and such. But um, yeah, that's just something we do periodically. Thanks, Drew. As always, keeping us secure. Okay. And then Carl will talk about COSA. Yeah, we met with um, EES Consulting, who are the the firm we're using for the cost of service study um, towards the end of May. And I think it was a very good meeting, lots of ideas bounced around. Um, I know just speaking from personal experience, the, the, the involvement and the expertise from Dan's team was incredibly welcome. And uh, it's gonna make this a lot easier and a lot more fun. My, my previous co-op, this was very much a finance centric um, <clears throat> task, which I think you missed, you missed the mark on quite a few things when you look at it that way. Um, so currently we're working on a pretty hefty um, data request. Uh, I know Dan's team and my team have got most of the stuff um, ready, uh, not all of it, but we, we're hoping to have that by the end of this week. And I know there was a question on Kirsten's email, when do we think we might be ready? But that's probably gonna be, we're a couple of months out from that. And there's quite a lot of work still to do. So I would say August is a, a good timeline. Okay, questions for Carl or Drew? All right, I'm, I'm not seeing any. Okay, the next one is still, uh, actually these next two are Carl. Yeah, um, so quite exciting. Um, we've, we've had very low numbers on our delinquent accounts uh, really ever since we went to these the six month payment plan um, at the, you know, kind of fall last year. So that plan is finished. So this, this, um, these numbers aren't now a direct result of that, but I think that really helped some people get caught up. And we have, um, at the end of May, our delinquent accounts were less than $5,000. 
And I did some research. Um, we've got some historical information going back to the year 2000. And I can tell you then that we have the lowest delinquent accounts that we've had this century, which is quite exciting. <laughs> it's very rare you get to say, say something. Well, this millennium, let's go with that. Oh. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, they, they have actually creeped up a little bit to about five, $5,500, but still extraordinarily low. So great kudos to my billing crew and Hillary's MSRs. They, they've been doing a wonderful job. I mean, I think the, the disconnect process that Hillary's already mentioned was, is hugely helpful in that it gives everyone the most opportunity possible to, to get settled or to make uh, arrangements. Carl, hey, that Carl. is very good news. How many people roughly does that represent? A dozen, something of that order? No, it's, it's, you know, there's some pretty small amounts in there. It's about 50. Oh, okay. Yeah, really. Thank you. And just to not belabor this, but I think it's really important that why you guys were able to kind of really look through the process is because Carl and Hillary have been working really closely together, which hasn't been a factor in the past. And her teams haven't, that both teams have not been working together. So this is one of those efforts to break down the silos and really bring groups together and think through the process from the beginning to the end. And so just really want to shout out to Carl and Hillary and both their teams because they're meeting together, they're talking about from the process of when the customer, actually from the very beginning of the billing, then when the customer gets into problems. And so they're trying to create this value stream for the member and make it easier for them to pay and help them with process and ideas of how to lower their rates. So it's just a really good um, exercise. And this is the fruits of their labor of how these teams are now working collaboratively to think through how to make the process better. So this was a huge continuous improvement project. So again, this is just, I mean, this is remarkable. I I've never seen this before where you can say lowest levels in 20 years. So thanks to Carl and Hillary. Thank you. There's any other questions on that? Um, and just a very informational piece, but I know it's very important to, to you guys and to the members. Uh, the Form 990 was filed on time in May and um, is, is available for review on our website. Okay. Keep going. All right, and the next two are Dan. Okay. Who's driven past the transit center lately? Anybody's noticed that uh, there's two very large um, level three chargers being installed right there as we speak. I drove by there yesterday. Some of the stuff uh, still crated, but uh, the chargers are, are out, probably just being displayed out there. So uh, it'll be hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have level three charging in Durango. Very exciting. Uh, and uh, Bob, you should be proud. We are we have reserved two F one fifty Lightnings. Um, we are uh, they're 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 out there though. It'll be May of twenty two. We're we're thinking since we got our reservation in so soon that we may actually get these a little bit earlier. So uh, it'll be good to have have those. Uh, like like Hillary said, we're we're arm wrestling for for where these go. Um, and so nice job getting in line. Good work. Three, three. I put my hundred dollars in. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, I'll, and I I'll, think, lend, I'll lend it to you guys. I'll take you guys for joy rides. <laughs> and I think the important thing with this is that um, it's not that we're adding two new vehicles to our fleet. Uh, we're actually retiring older vehicles. And yeah. so we have old vehicles that are no longer reliable for our service crews. And so it was a situation of, well, do we replace them with another truck or do we walk the talk and go ahead and, and look at the electric vehicles? Plus, we've got a lot of numbers asking us about, um, well, I'm going to wait until I see a, a truck or something else. So this is also an opportunity to show our members that there are now trucks, there are electric vehicles if they're interested. So um, again, that's why we thought that this was um, financially solid for our company and the life, I guess, I, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the life of these vehicles a bit longer than gas? Yeah, and I mean, especially when we can fill them you know, with uh, Laplatte Electric's, you know, power, it's, it's going to be very economical for us to run these as opposed to, and, you know, we're seeing at the gas pump, and I think that's going to be driving more and more people this way. Gas prices keep coming up. Um, 
And so it's, it, it definitely gets people's attention when, when that happens. Uh, and, and also to mention too, we do have our budget process will be coming up. Um, you know, it's all part of our, our fleet review, but if there is the need for more vehicles that we need in our fleet as uh, we do budget reviews, you might see that we, um, you know, reserve even, even some more, but we know we need at least a couple here that, that would fit into to our needs. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, Jessica, uh, I was in, just got back from California. There was an amazing amount of Teslas and other electric vehicles driving around there. Is there anything going on at the national level? You know, there's a concern by state governments that with the gas tax, you know, falling because of electric vehicles that, you know, new sources of income will be needed to maintain roads. And I'm just wondering, is, is any kind of discussion started um, with, you know, NRCA or, or anything um, on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Joe. The discussion's more um, in the larger um, cities, metropolitan areas. I was on the West Coast um, Electric Vehicle Coordination Group that included California, Oregon, Washington. And um, one thing that to address that issue is they're actually thinking about taxing people driving across county lines to go into cities. So for example, Seattle, um, city of Seattle is probably going to um, apply a commuter tax or charge. And that's to address issues that you just mentioned that people aren't filling up their gas. So they're having to pay for roads and infrastructure. So they're gonna start taxing people driving into cities. But right. I haven't heard of anything um, beyond that. And I will look though, because Biden's infrastructure plan may include additional items, but it's such a huge plan. It's just, it's hard to get through. And I think Bob might be able to clearly answer this when he looks at his uh, tax receipt that he gets for his vehicle registration, but I believe there's something on there for electric vehicles now. And that's, that's what I was gonna, just since you brought that up, throw out that you, you do pay when you um, renew your license tags, a fee, I can't think of how much it is right now. I can share that, but there's a fee there. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching the launch event for the F-150 and you got in there and got a reservation. So <laughs> good for you, it was pretty big scale production. Um, while we're on it, just that electrical vehicle, electric vehicle front. Um, I don't know if you saw recently, Tesla launched a new car, the upgrade to their Model S that now is the fastest production car in the, in the world, 1.9 seconds, zero to 60. So we probably don't need that. But if you, you know, want to know reasons, barriers to why not to have an electric car falling every day, including particularly trucks and range and feasibility and capability and all that. So good for us. Okay, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, the state of Colorado in its just closed session passed a bill that uh, puts uh, fees on uh, registration like Bob just mentioned. It uh, altered the uh, tax on uh, fuel and uh, it also uh, put fees on use of Uber and other kinds of things in an attempt to raise an additional like $5 billion a year for transportation. It made that transportation uh, not just automobile vehicle, but also uh, looking at other forms of transportation like rail and so forth to reduce our carbon footprint as a state. So Joe, that's a place I think you could look to find, uh, I don't have the, the number of the bill off the top of my head, but it did pass a, a week or so ago. And I think it will have a profound impact on some of this. So stay tuned. Uh, last thing I'll, I'll mention here is, uh, you know, kudos to, once again to the board for getting our um, level three EV rate, rate structure passed as well. Um, that is why we have three level three chargers in our area instead of two. Um, that, that's clearly, they, they moved it out of San Miguel's County uh, service territory and put it in ours because of the, the rate tariff that we have. And I, I expect that's going to help uh, other private entities develop more level three charging in our area also. That's all, all right. Um, where's the third in, one? Where's the third um, one, Dan? Purgatory. It's, that's, hey, you haven't broken ground quite on that one yet, but it's very close. Great, uh, thank you. 
Um, we're going to take a break at this time. It will certainly be very exciting in another year or two to see a, a pickup like that with the LPA logo going by. We will all watch for it. That'll be really good publicity as well as good news. Um, it's now 1036. Let's go ahead and take a nine minute break and start this meeting again at 1045. So we'll see you shortly. Thank you. Hey, everybody, go ahead and turn your video back on and let's see if we can <clears throat> get started again. The next item that we're moving to on our agenda will be the financial report. On page 69 is the highlights of the financial report that Carl will be reporting on and the detailed report for your review or if you have any specific questions that starts on page 28. So Carl, if you would, starting us on page 69, please go ahead. Thanks, Brett. Um, so let's move in. Um, as you can see, everything's got a nice green check mark. Uh, all of the financial goals were met in May. Um, operating margin, obviously, substantially over where the goal was approved. Um, but that's looking at year to date. Um, for the month of May, uh, once again, as we saw in April, uh, expenses are kind of back where they should be. In fact, they were slightly over budget in, um, in May. Uh, there, was, there was a few items, you know, the, the helicopter, um, I was say the helicopter ride that really uh, doesn't give it the importance that it has, but the, the patrol um, would be a better word. Uh, so we're really ramping up the fire mitigation and maintenance efforts. So um, if you look at the detail on the May results, the, they are in the, you know, the transmission, the operation and maintenance lines where we're very slightly over budget for May, but obviously substantially under for the year to date. Um, I know Kirsten had mentioned, um, you know, what, what do we do to get closer to where we're budgeted in 2022? And um, assuming that kind of this new normal where, the, where we're at now, where, you know, most, most people are vaccinated or at least the majority, um, we are seeing things be a lot more normal. And mm -hmm. April and May have shown that. And we are going to budget once again, assuming that things will be normal. Um, and I don't think we will have that, you know, uh, shortfall on expenses that we saw at the beginning of 2021 compared to budget. Uh, there are some things we can do better. I'm not gonna say we were faultless. I think the spread of some expenses wasn't quite right. Um, you know, we had some fire mitigation stuff in January and February, which is, you know, it's very difficult to do when there's snow on the ground and so forth. So we need to just make some tweaks, make sure we get things in the right months I think uh, for the year as a whole, we, we did okay, but I think our timing could be better. Um, cash okay, reserves. Carl, hang on just a minute. I think there's a question there. So uh, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Carl, for, for addressing that, that concern and what can we do to do better. I know it's a heck of a time to be trying to do budgeting this last year and a half, and I appreciate that. When I'm looking at page 69 and I see our first goal there, the operating margin is 6.78% of operating revenue. I know that our goal is greater than or equal to one. And go, going forward, I know we periodically look at these. We didn't that long ago look at this, and I certainly was part of that. I wonder if we want to band that and have it between one and three, because we want to try to keep as much money in our members' pockets, I think, in the uh, short term as possible because as these margins grow, we actually then uh, have to pay them back in, in allocations, uh, which which benefits former members frequently. So just putting a note out for uh, whoever is going to be on the financial committee that uh, maybe think about banding that as a between one and three 
because certainly a 6.78% operating revenue, if we were an uh, IOU, that'd be fabulous. <laughs> but we're not, and so anything we can do to, to keep that as thin as possible and still be um, a safe and reliable company, I'm all about. Thank you, Carl. Okay, Kirsten, I think we got that, and Carl will make a note so that obviously our um, goals need to be looked at from time to time to see if they need to be changed. And so that will come up at some point with the financial committee. Thank you, uh, Carl, go ahead. Yeah, in response to that, I would also say that that, that goal steps up. When it's, it goes up half a percent each year um, until it gets to three. Um, I think three is a pretty good number to aim at. Uh, the, the thing is, if you have a band and you say three is your maximum, well, how do you address that? Do you go and spend a million dollars next month on stuff? Um, you know, I think the, the point is well made that you, you don't, we are not a for-profit entity, so we shouldn't have inflated margins. Uh, the 6.78 will shrink as the year goes on. Um, but I, I just want to mention that this doesn't benefit prior members. If, if we have a very high operating margin at the end of, year, end of 2021, and I anticipate it will be, you know, significantly higher than we've budgeted, that gets allocated to the current membership. It's um, on retirements. If you do a FIFO retirement, that's what benefits people who are no longer members. Just want to make that clear. All right, so it's allocated to current members, but they're not going to see it for up to 20 years. Well, it depends on how we retire. If we do a big LIFO retirement again, then they will. Yes, sir. Thank you for that correction. So, um, the, the equity percentage is, is uh, over the band, uh, but once the retirement, uh, the 1.5 million that was approved um, is actioned, then that will reduce. Um, one thing to point out on that is that the motion did ask for to wait for the FERC approval. Um, one thing you may want to consider is that although FERC has not uh, actually ratified that, Tri-State have already reducing the bills. So I would think it would be safe to go ahead with the retirement pre-FERC. So just something to put out there. Uh, any Carl, other questions? To, to do that, that would be require a motion of the board to change that previous resolution or something on that order. Do you think that's appropriate to do this month? I would think so, yes. All right. Um, I don't know where else on the agenda that that would occur at. Um, is there any more discussion of that or any other staff that wants to weigh in on that? We would need to find that resolution or motion to see exactly the words that we would need, but um, that's it. Would it would take specific action? So, is there any more thought or discussion on do we actually do that? Is there a reason to need? Or we is there any reason to wait? I don't think so. Well, I go, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> um. A couple of things to consider, I think, is, um, you know, what is the risk of, what is the risk and then the consequence if FERC did not approve it? And we had already made that. So, we'd, you know, we don't want to be in a position of <laughs> asking, you know, finding a way to get that money retrieved. So, uh, are we in a cash position, Carl, such that if we gave that money away and Tri State? change or for change their mind some way which none of us expect that would put us at any kind of a risk no there's, there's no risk from that we we're 17.3 percent as of this report we're actually around 19 and a half percent today so you know obviously one and a half million dollars is a substantial amount of money but we do have the cash reserves to to do it um and if and I, I would say the chances of uh, FERC not approving it are less than 1% based on conversations I've had with my peers and with Tri-State. And um, I don't think that's gonna happen, but just say it did. 
then all we would need to do is, you know, when we come to the normal retirement timetable in the fall, we, we kind of adjust accordingly. All right, on, on that basis, I would make a motion to um, provide the 1.5 million uh, bill credit whatever the proper term is. <laughs> yeah, and I would, I don't know if Graham's had a chance to look up whether we, was that a resolution we passed or a motion that we made? It was a resolution, yeah. I think. I, yeah. I, 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 it was actually a recommendation that came out of the Finance and Audit Committee. Yeah. And I don't recall whether it was a resolution. It was, it was resolution 2021-09. All right, All so right. Then, then, the Tim, then Tim is making a motion to modify resolution 2021-09 such that we will not wait for FERC approval, but we'll pass on that those capital credits now as soon as is practically possible. So that motion I think is a good one is on the floor. Is there a second for that? Rachel seconds. Rachel seconds. Now we're looking for discussion of that. Uh, Joe, is your hand is up, so go ahead. I'm not, I, I guess I don't quite understand Oops, Joe, you just froze up and cut out right as you said, I don't understand and I didn't get what you didn't understand. I don't know if you're still there, but again, to reiterate it, we have passed a resolution that says we're going to give our members this money, but we're not going to do it until FERC finally approves Tri-State's rates. And FERC may take months to do that. And Carl says we're in good enough shape. Plus, if they don't do that, we can modify the, um, what we give away in the fall so we can do this now. We've kind of already promised our members to do it. So that's some more information. Uh, you might have, Joe's probably dropped off. So John Lee, go ahead. So this is new business for us. And are, do we need to change the agenda then if you're calling for a vote to well, change no, the resolution? In a way it's under the board action agenda under the finance and audit committee update we're jumping around well this is ceo and staff report but i didn't see perhaps a better place to do it and so it's old business you know we could wait until the finance and audit committee under the board action agenda that might be more appropriate because it would be action then rather than just reports yeah i would think that this is still in reports and okay i agree with I john we will that motion will be um, held until we get to that item on the agenda. And then I will look to Tim again to make that. And if there's other any other information people need before then, they can be prepared to ask for that. And I'll make an, a note for that there. But uh, uh, John, a uh, motion, uh, I mean, your point is well taken. Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay, uh, Dan. Brett, it's, it's Jill. My my internet froze just as I finished that question, so I guess we'll have more discussion on this later. Then, correct? Correct. We'll under the finance and audit committee um, update under board action agendas when we will um, get to this. Okay, um, we've got one more hand up, and then we'll continue on with Carl's report. So, Dan Huntington, go ahead. And uh, Dan, you need to unmute. I'll right. move to table this motion till uh, under item five B. Five B. All right. All in motion made to table this item. Is there a second to that, or do you need a motion a second for a table? I can't remember all the rules on that one. We do. Is there a second? Second by Kohler. Second, Second by Kohler. By Kohler. And a All vote, in favor vote, of no, no uh, discussion. The vote right. should be kept. Right. All in favor of tabling this item until item 5B appears on the agenda, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any who oppose or abstain? Okay. We've, we're officially tabled this item until 5B. And um, we'll make that motion and discuss it then and see what happens. Uh, Carl, thank you for bringing it up, even though it was out of order. <clears throat> but uh, oh, I, please I, go ahead. 
<laughs> I, I can only apologize. Um, I, I did men, mean to send an email out yesterday. Unfortunately, I was out of commission yesterday, not, not feeling not very well. So mm. I do apologize for disrupting everything with my <laughs> ins legal insanity. So um, any other questions on financial goals? Uh, Dan, did you have something else or the hand just left up? No, sorry. Okay. Uh, no more questions than Carl, please go ahead. So looking at some highlights. Um, so for the year to date, we're still substantially below uh, on our operating costs of 1.4 million below, uh, although that somewhat reduced as we saw May uh, operating costs being pretty much where we thought they would be. Um, the, our labor costs for May were, you know, within a few dollars of where we, we had budgeted. So that was very good, comforting to see. And we can see, you know, things are writing themselves, as it were. Um, we've already touched on this, still, and I've gone a bit more hyperbolic here with lowest in the 21st century. Um, actual kilowatt hours are still somewhat below forecast. Um, it's really the, the robust strength of the, the residential sales that are keeping the point below and that our gross margins are above forecast. The um, seeing a couple of months of the rate decrease as well is already a factor there because obviously we didn't budget for that. Um, and in summary, year to date operating margins are $2.1 million over forecast. That will probably be within 100,000 or so where we land for the full year. Okay, are there any further questions for Carl in his financial report, or if there was something you'd already wanted to question him on in the detailed financial report and appendix, et cetera? Sue McWilliams, go ahead. Thank you, I had to unmute. I am back on page 36. And, you know, it talks about the rate for each class of, um, each class of our memberships. And last year I noticed we were about 12 and a half cents for residential. And this year to date, we're at a little over 16 cents a kilowatt. So again, I just want to reiterate how important that cost of service study is. And, um, Hopefully that will show that we need to be reducing our rates regardless of price dates reduction. It appears to me that we are overcharging our members. Uh, just, you know, it's four cents more a kilowatt than what it was a year ago. They have very much agreed on the cost of service, so that would be... Uh, um, Do you, Carl, the recollect that as well? Would there, could have there been an error a year ago? Because I don't remember our, our residential rates ever being down to what our commercial rates were. I remember they were lower, but um, two cents lower I might go for, but not four. I think when I look back that it was 12.4 cents a kilowatt last year before the demand uh, peak rate was put into place. So yeah, four cents a kilowatt hour definitely doesn't sound right. Um, but obviously, you know, I'm not saying you're wrong, Sue. I'm saying I, I need to dive into that report because we we have as Dan will comment on you know when he does his report we're, we're we are around that five percent that we uh, had had promised and that's if that's not what we're seeing um, I do know we need to dive into something on um, the the solar garden and uh, in terms of we may be up it's not something that will impact margins, but it looks like we may be overstating our revenues and cost of service, uh, not cost of service, and our cost of power. Uh, and that may be the answer, Sue. Um, and I will get back to you with a full report on that. Maybe uh, it would be a good topic for the next Finance and Audit Committee. And certainly point well taken about the cost of service study, if there is a need to balance between residential, commercial, industrial, et cetera, that will be the information needed to determine that. So, so we've got that. All right, uh, Sue, anything else? No, that's all I had in this section. 
Okay, uh, Kirsten, go ahead. Uh, Carl, I'm sorry you're not feeling great. I hope you're better. I do have a, a few, and I think they're probably quick. Page 34, I think I should see the rate stabilization fund on a balance sheet, but educate me, please, on that. Yeah, temporary investments. So that's our money market fund, um, and that's where that cash is held, $3.004 million. Okay, so it's it's not flagged on the balance sheet, but it is flagged someplace. But that that that's what that is. Yeah, it's it's some about oh a third of the way down under in the assets is called temporary investments. And Carl, I'll ask you the question: Is um, is that the best name for this? No, it's but it's just what um, <clears throat> the system spits out at you, unfortunately, but. We do convert it to um, to an Excel sheet, so we could overwrite it. The, the trouble is, um, really, that's our money market fund, and that's all it was in prior years. Although we were using it in 2020, and that's the only other number you can see. Yeah, we could change that. I, I don't have an issue with that. I, I think that might tell a clearer story. Thank you. And on page 35 in the cash flow, um, the deferred credits, which were quite a bit different in 2021 from 2020. Deferred credits are... Um, so there's a number of things that flow through that account. Um, they are uh, the medical accrual sits there, which, as you know, we're working on this year. And also... Um, there's, there's a substantial balance relating to the uh, when we paid, paid off our RUS debt early. There was a fee for that, and that's amortized through the year. Those are the two main items in that um, heading. Why it's so different to 2020, I will have to get back to you all. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And then on um, the uh, is page 30. Eight years still? No, page. No, page. Yes, page thirty-eight. Still, you. The performance statistics, or is that? Yeah, that might help too, if necessary, on the performance statistics. Cool. So I'm thrilled to see, and this is a kudo to Hillary and her team too, about the roundup accounts going up. And I know we see that later on too. I think that's fabulous, and that pushes a really important thing. Um, and I have a, a, a request for somewhere down the line. Uh, a lot of this billing activity that we see, that we see um, a month to month, I would love to see that over a period of time so that we can see what it looks like, for instance, before we changed. How many time of use of folks did we have before we changed the rate structure compared to after? And, and what influences perhaps different activities? So for, I don't know if we have on a quarterly or an annual basis um, a longer term uh, than just a month to month. On these billing activities, I think that would be super helpful. And I believe that's what my questions. That okay. could be a potential quarterly report that you would add, add to that set of graphs that you're planning on using from time to time, because I don't believe that one is there now that tracks the number of time of use accounts, for instance. Kirsten, did you have anything more in mind other than the number of time of use accounts or there's <clears throat> something else? Well, I think a lot of that in that billing activity, and I'm sorry, I just closed that page. Um, I don't remember what were on there. I, I think a lot of those ones that we just see a month to month on that periodically seeing a, um, a more of a life cycle on it would be helpful. Okay, and so and I'll I leave that up. as a suggestion to staff if they think there's some other interesting ones in addition to time of use to go back and graph historically, that could be helpful. All right. Um, Sue, go ahead. Sorry, I forgot to um, lower my hand. I don't have anything else in this section. Okay, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, um, I may not have heard Sue's question correctly previously about revenue for residential, but in performance statistics part one on page 37, you can see the revenue per kilowatt hour sold is compared uh, for May year to date, is compared to May year to date 2020. A year ago, it was 15 cents a kilowatt watt an hour. 
Um, and this year it's 16. There's not a four cent difference there. My hunch is that there was something wrong on the pie chart graph table underneath it from a year ago, because I kind of remember us looking at that before and saying something that they went and fixed. So my hunch is that um, you're right, Tim, it's, and um, Sue is reading number that was not right. And we probably, you know, from an old report is what it amounts to. So um, Sue, that's another place to look at these, a bit harder to find, but it does kind of reiterate the point that it's from last year, it's gone up about a cent. Okay. Okay, I'll have to look back at, at um, my previous notes because I know when I was running for election last year that the average kilowatt rate for residential then was about 12 and a half cents. And I think that included the kilowatt rate plus the base fee. But I'll just have to go back and do some research on that. Appreciate you pointing this out for us too. Okay. Is there anything else for Carl on the financial report at this time? I'm not seeing anything. So it looks as if we finished that. And so now we're gonna go on to Dan and the review of the peak power charge results. That's on page 72 of our board packet for you to follow along. And um, Dan, you'll probably put those slides up for the um, attendees. And unmute. Yeah, I'm working on that right now, we'll get that. Hey Britt, there was one quick question on the phone. Well, something, another question showed up. Let me bring that back up to see who that was. It was Tim. Yeah. Um, the line loss in May, year to date, is like very, very large. This is on performance statistics page part two. Uh, I don't remember which page that is. 38. 21% and... Whoops, 21%. <laughs> Budget was 20%. I just wonder if that's a correct or not. It probably comes out of a spreadsheet and something did must have got grabbed wrong. Dan, do you got any idea? It's not 21%, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of be a lot of meter tampering on that one. <laughs> well, well, that. So thanks. Okay, just verify and maybe let us know. Thanks. Okay. Are you guys uh, seeing the presentation there now? Yes. Okay, I seem to be in a mode that doesn't show anybody's faces at all, so I'm sort of going the blind here right now, but... Uh, I'll keep an eye out for questions for okay. you. Okay, thank you, Brett. Uh, so uh, back in October or so, we reviewed what the peak power charge impact was just on the month of September. Um, we looked at just one month there. Now we have a few more months, so we wanted to, to see what that looked like, uh, more of a, since we've implemented it till now. Now, we, we chose September, even though we implemented the charge in July, um, there was a little bit of lag with billing cycles and everything that we really didn't have full, complete sets and a good picture of data, good data set to work with until the month of September. That's why we go from September 2020 until April of 21, um, which was the data set we were using here for this. So... Uh, this presentation is very, very similar to what we gave you before. The same key observations are, are pretty much there. We were targeting a 4.7% rate increase for the general service rate. We are seeing 4.8% right now, so very close to what we're looking for there. Now we do see a average dollar change of 550. We were targeting 480. Now the reason for that is because we do have uh, eight months of higher usage data. If we think about September through April, we have the winter months in there without the lower uh, summer months usage in there. So I expect those three months of lower summer usage will bring that average dollar amount down. Um, we are seeing the, since we do have a good indicator that the percentage is doing what we want it to. And uh, as anticipated, there are worse some net metered accounts that we'll get into the details on that here in just a little bit as well. That did see a larger percent change and that's by design. Um, because if you're not paying anything towards a peak power charge with a very low bill that's only the base charge at the time, any kind of uh, you know, $5 increase is going to be a relatively large percentage. Now, we will see some that do have some uh, um, large percentage increases that are not time of use or not net metered customers. But we found a lot of these would be like vacation homes 
where somebody maybe comes in and is occupying the home just for a few days. And when they're there for those three days, let's say they turn things on, that does create a peak um, for them with only just a few days of kilowatt hours. So then that peak power charge becomes a greater percentage. We've talked with some of these homeowners and uh, time of use is a great solution for them to, uh, to look at and consider. And many of them have switched over to a time of use rate uh, when looking at that type of option. Okay, now to get into some of the, the hard numbers and data here, um, what we like to show you with charts like this is, uh, it's a, called a histogram, and it's showing uh, a range of percentages and how many bills or how many customers fall into those ranges. And this is sort of compiling all nine months of data into, uh, you know, for each customer, then that nine months of data and what percent increase they have seen overall. Pretty hard to show just individual bills for all customers that have lots of records there, but um, that pretty much tells the same story anyway. So you'll see that uh, certainly the highest uh, percent in, or the highest category we are seeing is in that four to five percent range, exactly where we're targeted. I'm glad to see that this did tail off pretty quickly. It didn't uh, stretch out linearly over to 20 percent or anything like that. So that means that we got everybody clustered into this uh, fairly small bracket um, pretty well there. Now you do see some outliers over here towards the end that uh, do have a, a larger percentage increase, but typically the dollar amount is, is fairly small in there. There is a, a maximum of, of $51 in there. I looked at that one in particular. It is a, I can't remember exactly what kind of account it was, but um, it was a large bill that was in the magnitude of $300. And so when you know, you're know you talking a percent wise, it um, still ends up being a large dollar amount too but it is one of those uh, you know, occasional peaks that, that pop up there. It was 35 kW. And so if you, if you think about 35 kW being on peak for La Plata Electric, that 35 kW actually costs La Plata Electric uh, 35 times 20, so $700. I mean, that, that's what the impact of a peak has on La Plata Electric uh, when we have a $20 per kW demand charge. So that's a $700 impact to La Plata Electric for that one customer if they are on peak there. Okay, moving on. Now we're, uh, I'm gonna go back to where I was. This next slide just shows the same data, but without net needed. Hang on account. just a minute, Dan. Um, yes. Kirsten, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Boy, do I love this stuff. So <laughs> look, first histogram, which is everybody, and that includes net metering, and your second one doesn't have net metering. So that tells me that that max charge, that 5115, is a net metering customer. That's, they're not on the... Yep, you're right. Yep, you're right. Sorry about that. Um, I thought that was a fascinating way to look at it of what it costs when somebody peaks when we're paying peak. I thought that was a really sound way to look at that. And if you would write that down for me... You know, so it's so, so go through that again. Say it one more time for me. What I'm saying is that for this, for so if they have a max charge, a peak charge of fifty-one dollars and fifteen cents, that means they have a peak KW of thirty-five KW. Just thirty-five times a buck fifty is is what gives you that. And so thirty-five KW times our demand charge that we get from Tri-State for being on peak at twenty dollars. You know, the 35 times the 20 is $700. So that's what La Plata Electric paid for that. If that, if that peak did align with our, with our peak time exactly. That makes sense? Pretty, yeah. Pretty helpful. So, so me, yeah. on these outliers, uh, we see that it was more net metering that got hit. Does this, are we anticipating that our COSA is going to tell us that? Yes, this helps us get closer to actual cost of, of net metering to our systems. I, I think it's absolutely going to show that. You know, just as in the example we just said, that you know is costing us seven hundred. You know, could be costing us seven hundred bucks, and so there, it's it's going to show that that buck fifty needs to be higher is what the coast is going to show. But um, um, just with our with the way our demand charges are, are structured there. Super. Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Um, so as Kirsten was alluding to, the next slide is going to show this without net metering being involved. So you can especially see that greater than 20% uh, bar go down significantly there. So that's what it looks like um, under the, the case of, of non-net metered accounts there. Um, you'll see that the overall uh, change in percentages and targets didn't, didn't change a whole lot just because of the, the relatively few number of net metered accounts. So we've been looking at- Dan, I got a, just a comment real quick there because I did have to explain this a couple of times and I think some other directors should think of this way of explaining it. Some of the net metered people are gonna complain about these higher bills. The response is, hey, we didn't lower your energy charge. You're getting the exact same payback that you were planning on getting be, that when you first put your system in, all we we're doing is generating a little bit more money across the board for LPA. Yes, and, that, and Dan, go ahead. That, that's that's exactly the, the the strategy we use when talking with these customers. The other phrase I'll use is, "We are asking you to contribute to the cost of our the increased cost of running our facilities, just like we are all of our other customers." Um, that's what this dollar fifty was about: was the cost of running our facilities, which all net meter customers need just as much as. Um, or other members, so that's that's the other part we'll use to. And, and to very uh, to be quite frank, when we have those discussions with people, um, they're like, "Oh, I get it, thanks." Um, and and typically the discussions go pretty easily. So, um, yeah. In these last couple of charts, we were looking at a histogram based on percentages down here. This next one's gonna be based on dollars, so it changes a little bit here. Um, it, it spreads out more because we have people with diff, with varying degrees of usage. Um, but most of them did land in that target zone that we were shooting for and that four to five dollars. The ones with the higher dollar amounts are because they have larger bills. Um, if somebody has a you know a 10,000 square foot home or uh, a five six hundred dollar a month power bill, of course, the peak power charge is going to be greater to them on a dollar amount but the uh, percentages all are pretty tight, which is what we were looking for there. And once again, we have our, our, our median, um, it was 493, so pretty close to the 480 there. Um, the average, like I said, I'm expecting that to come down once we get the other um, summer months included in here. So that was the, the summary of the impact to the customer's bills. But I know there's been also been questions on hey, is this rate accomplishing what we want it to accomplish? And uh, how is that impacting our system? Are there behavioral changes that are occurring? Um, so I've got some couple of slides on that I wanna share with you here. Um, first off, I wanna show you our, our LPAs, LPA in total, our load profile for the month of April. Now, Kirsten, you had asked about um, in your email, well, a peak's a peak, why didn't we get charged for these? And I think you sort of alluded to the answer in your email as well. These green circles are outside of Tri-State's peak window. So Tri-State's only looking for peak demands between <clears> noon <throat> and 10 p.m. Um, so the first one that occurred in that noon to 10 p.m. was here on April 6th at 8.30 p.m. is what we are seeing there. And um, so that's, that's the, the time we Laplace Electric was built for there. And so it's, it's really important to know, okay, so how did our customers respond? What did the load profile look like on this day when we were charged for that peak? So we're zooming into that day now, which is shown in the yellow line here. This is April 6th of 2021. Now, the, the thing I was encouraged to see here, well, first off, let me explain what the vertical lines here are because there's a lot of things going on as we are trying to control loads with a variety of different programs. The dotted lines, I've put it in here because I think it's important to see where time of use is falling. Um, so the green line is as we're in, the green dotted line is as we're entering a on-peak time of use period. The blue dotted line is as we are leaving an on-peak time of use period. So what you do see, and this is characteristics amongst every day, is that you'll see a little uptick in usage as we come out of a time of use period because things with timers, ETS heaters, a variety of different things are coming on at that point. It's harder to see going into it because the loads are on the rise. And so it just sort of deflects it down a little bit. Um, this is April, which is a shoulder season. There's not a lot of heating load. 
going on at this point. There is still some out there, but not like a January or anything where this is definitely more pronounced um, on, the, on the time of use side of things. And you'll what I've overlaid here is April 6th from 2020 as well, just so we have that as a little bit of a benchmark, you'll see the um, some similar characteristics and load shape there. So let's move over to these solid lines. Um, so we do have a time to use period in the evening. So that same thing is sort of going on there, but the solid lines indicate the peak period window that we have for our um, residential rate now, where we come into it at 4 p.m. and we leave it at 9 p.m. I was uh, very pleasantly surprised to see this uptick in usage uh, that, that shows up as we're coming out. It's once again, harder to see as we're going in to it, but as we're coming out, it's definitely coming up. This is, these are kilowatts that, you know, maybe not quite all um, happening at the same time, but would have been right on top of our peak here otherwise. And so this was load that our members definitely responded to and shifted as they looked at that peak power, at that, at that peak period there. So uh, very pleasantly surprised to see that. The, uh, and that's, that's very, um, obvious on every day that, that we're looking at going forward here is this uptick at 9 p.m. and then another one at 10. Um, you'll, you'll see other upticks that happen because we don't allow all ETS heaters and time of use stuff to all come on at the same time. We are staggering that by 30 minute intervals, uh, which is why it sort of goes down and comes back up again. So, um, you know, we are like, uh, we, we are load profile artists that we are shaping and molding going on here. So I, I think the group's doing a great job as we're, as we're working through these, these kind of challenges here. That's a whole lot of information thrown at you. Kirsten, one thing you did ask was, can you overlay a profile, a, a similar profile before the peak period charge went in? That's what I was trying to do here with the same day from the previous year. This is before the gray line is before our peak power charge went in. Of course, weather and all sorts of things really play a role in what that looks like. But what you do not see is that distinctive uptick right here after the 9 p.m. So that's that's where I'm attributing this is some, some change that we're seeing from that. So any questions here? Well, it's interesting to have an uptick occur so quickly in a sense since we put that program in people are still getting used to it in some senses but to have that means oh i don't know how many people that represents but quite a few to be able to make the uptick that noticeable and you stated you're seeing this on pretty much every day yes on a lot of days on a lot of days so so that's good and and perhaps the only thing that would be bad if that uptick would be too dramatic at nine by which then we would have to do something about it yeah, let me, I had one more slide in my back pocket here. I might just show this to you here. I'm not going to put it in presentation mode right now. But um, this is actually that April 6th profile in yellow against our winter peak day and our summer peak day for the year. Um, it just so happens that this April, it's, it's pretty flat and the peak is pushed way out there into the evening. Um, so it, it does look like it might, you know, start to approach that overall peak, but you're seeing on these other days that we, we still have quite a room, quite a bit of room to play with. By the time it starts to approach this, we'll have DER in place and be able to soften that uptick out quite a bit. All right, we've got a couple of questions or comments. So Joe Lewandowski, go ahead. Yeah, I got a few questions. Dan, what's DVR? Uh, I, D -E -R? I meant to say DER or DER, whatever. Distributed yeah. energy resources. And so those would be all the things that we could work with. And they could be electric vehicles. It could be smart thermostats. It could be water heaters. It could be, um, you know, different, different type of control items that we would work with our members and provide incentives to allow LPA to control certain things. Okay. Um, as far as, uh, are, are you going to uh, give us one of these, you know, with, uh, well, with all this uh, hot weather, I got to believe our peak is going to be different um, here, you know, for June and probably into July, the way things are looking. Yeah. Um, can you, we, 
can you give us another one of these, you know, in, in maybe in August or something to let us know how we did? Because, I, you know, April, this is great presentation, but April seems to be, I don't know, a little bit of an outlier because it is, you know, after winter, before summer. So I'm not sure, you know, how much this tells us at this point. Right. So, good, good question there, Joe. Now this uh, June 24th of 2020, um, for the summer profile here, that was really before we implemented the peak power charge. So you're really not seeing that uptick. Um, as we go towards December, um, when we peak in the wintertime, December 2020, we did have the peak power charge in place. It, I don't know if you could call it an uptick as much mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, a, a flattening instead of a decline. So yeah, I'll be really curious to see. That's the, the real source of truth is see what it does on our, on our peak days. So we'll keep an eye yeah. on I don't have AC, but um, boy, at eight, as soon as that sun dips behind the ridge at my place at eight o'clock, my fans are going. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I'm on time of use too, and they, they run most of the night. So um, just uh, uh, like to see that again. Uh, getting back to the, um, I, uh, we were talking about earlier about, you know, the cost of service study and these, and these houses that kind of the outliers. Uh, I have a friend who um, just sold a townhouse in uh, a 32 unit development up in, in, um, in Dalton Ranch. And uh, of those 32 uh, townhouses, 24 are second homes. So most of the time they are empty during the, you know, during probably most of the year. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this now, but I'm just wondering, you know, I, I would guess that most of those people don't really care about what their peak charge is. They probably don't even really look at their electric bill. Um, as we're doing our cost of, cost of service study, is there any way to kind of look at, you know, all the second home ownership, what kind of, you know, issues it poses for us in, in uh, you know, our peak power load that, uh, you know, that we run into every month. Because uh, 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 anyway, it, I was just really surprised that. And uh, is there any way that we can look at that? And, and I'm not sure what we can do about it, but it, it does seem to be something we should be at least aware of. Um, right. So we'll take a look at that. Thanks. Right, uh, Tim, go ahead. Thanks. Dan, when does the, the peak, um, look, looking at your April 6th residential load profile, right? huh? when does the uh, tri-state um, peak end? That is there a, a risk of that uh, bump after 9 p.m. hitting there, causing a coincident peak of any kind? It, it could. Um, that's why we're going to keep an eye on that because the window extends until 10 p.m. Right, so that's the same as time of use, essentially. Yeah, all of Tri-State's looking at us is from noon to 10 p.m. I'm really darn sure we're not gonna peak between, well, barely, <laughs> between um, noon and four, a, a weird thing happened in May, but um, typically not peaking between noon and four, so we're really focused on that late afternoon and into the early evening. All right, thank you. Um, caller has, there been any discussion at Tri-State about them needing to change their peak period? Because I know they, you report and they report on quite a few members are doing a pretty good job of peaking outside of it. No, there hasn't been discussion. And, and so far, the there has been quite a few that peaked outside the window, but the actual difference in the in the, the volume of the peak is, is real small. So it's, it, it hasn't really hit the radar in a big way yet. Okay, good, because it's nice that thing will stay the same for a little bit anyway. Okay, well, very good, Dan. It looks like we've got the questions taken care of and have gone through that so we can go on to the next part of our agenda. And um, Kirsten, the next part of our agenda is the board action agenda, the broadband committee update. Now that's on page 81. So people would turn to page 81 and Kirsten can talk to us about that. So go ahead. Let's see, I'm looking for Kirsten. There she is, Kirsten. 
Yeah, my director point just logged out. I need to log back in so I can get the same place we are. Sorry. Use the right password. Here I am. Okay, so we are on page 81. A little bit closer to my face. I decided to have a picture up of the illustrious uh, 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 committee, in case you guys don't know who everybody is, but there we are on our thing. Um, so we got, we had two things going on. One was a update from Jessica Zufalo, who we started calling Je Jessica Z, because we also have Jessica M. Uh, her update on that feasibility study, and that is uh, going along well. Um, she she talked a little bit more about ARPA than we were prepared for, and that's mostly it's just the lay of the land right now is things are changing so fast that as these things come up, people are having to respond to them. So uh, folks that we've been talking to have been trying to get on the agendas of towns and counties trying to put in some, some um, see we would love to have those funds kinds of, of, of discussions. And I think, Jessica Matlock, you've even had some of those discussions of we don't really know where we're going, but don't forget about broadband on that infrastructure. Um, I, I pasted a couple of what I considered important things from the Magellan um, feasibility study. Any questions on that feasibility study before I talk about uh, the the second piece of the meeting. I don't have my. I'm not seeing any, Kirsten. I'll watch for them for you. No questions are up at the moment. Okay, and then I heard, well, we also heard from Jason Cox and Eric Kittle. They're from the Archer County Archer County Broadband Office (BSMO) Broadband Services Management Office, um, and they're really doing some very excited stuff. They are. It's it's. It's typical uh, startup kind of thing. It's doing anything and everything to get the job done, and they're really hustling out there. We are we LPA is working with them on looking at some possible swaps that make sense for for uh, all folks, and that can also be used advantageously by Archuleta to be possible matching funds. So that's a great thing. It's it's good for LPA. It's good for Archuleta County. And that's very good. I have a couple of, of slide charts for you to look at. They're maps, which um, they have have a, a, a decent mapping uh, structure. This, these are from screen prints, as I didn't have their um, their these their presentation. Who are those maps you. from? Those are from the uh, BSMO, from so from the Archuleta Broadband Service Management Office. Okay, and, we might and uh, Kirsten, hang on a minute. We got one question, so we'll see what Rachel's got. Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, apologies, Kirsten. This is taking us back to the Magellan report. Um, but I was just curious, you know, reading through their recommendations on the ARPA funds, the it seemed like they were really pushing for a middle mile backbone, and that's where LPA's play would be. And I just was curious how how much they knew about fast track and and because I thought they were middle mile folks and yeah I, I don't know maybe it's we'll get into the report at more detail at a later time but that was just one thing that popped up yeah thank you thank you Rachel they have had a, a, several discussions with fast track um, and I can get you a list one of the things that that she has listed are the folks that she's talked to uh, also on Friday after I sent this in we did get in outline of uh, of another interim report, which I have chosen not to send out yet because I wasn't sure how to couch it to the rest of the board. So I would like to think I want to get that out, but I wanted to check with the rest of the. Whoop, Kirsten, are you there? Kirsten. She just hung up her phone. 
I'm trying to dolly again. Boy, it'd be nice to get her broadband or at least get her what Bob have. Bob's pretty connected now. Sorry, guys, I managed to hang up my phone. So there you go. We can't blame my broadband on that. That was me uh -oh. hanging up my phone by accident. Um, so anyway, I, I would like to get that out to folks, I think is what I was talking about. Uh, but I did want to check with the other broadband folks first. I was there looking at uh, the, the, the needs and also the capabilities. And so, of course, when you're looking at capabilities, you have to be looking at, at fast track also. Joe. Yeah, just for the benefit of the public and for me, uh, can you uh, give the definition of the acronym ARPA and can you talk briefly about what middle mile is? Again, so public understands what we're talking about here. Sure, I'm going to mess up on ARPA, American. I see it on, on page Plan 81 Act. there, bottom of page 81, so American. The Rescue American Rescue Plan, Plan, Plan Act. Act of 2021. <laughs> There we go. Ah. Thank you. I did have, I know I had it somewhere. And I also have what an IFR, which is, which was the interim final um, rule. rule. So how you can have both an interim and a final on the same <laughs> definition, I don't know. Um, let me get back there. So, and then the other question, sir, was what? I'm sorry. The middle mile. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a shot at it, and I would appreciate, Tim, if you could could help me out. So the middle mile is in between, <laughs> it's in between the long haul and the last mile. Now, I'm sure that doesn't help you at all. So the long haul are going to be the people who get it from major centers to perhaps other major centers. The middle mile are going to be the folks who get it out to uh, perhaps feeders. Uh, so maybe from from uh, Durango to Pagosa would be considered a middle mile. One of the things that Archuleta is considering is middle mile is also maybe getting it down 84 because there's gonna be a lot of sub feeders off of that. So the middle mile is, is everything that's not the, the great big things that go big city to big city. And it's not the last mile, which would go directly to the, to the house to the steps, to the to the premises. I know I'm using it in its own definition. Does that help, Joe? Okay, and thank you for keeping me honest about using the um, acronyms. Any other questions about the uh, the study, the feasibility study? So that's cruising along, and and we're going to be talking later, or are we going to be talking now, Britt? Because um, I would like to see about scheduling a. Uh, when we can schedule a, a cow on this, a committee of the whole on this. And I'd also right. like to understand what Let's role, if any, you might address have. that now um, because it would help everybody to get something on your calendar if there is going to be something needed. Now, that had been discussed that perhaps in August, perhaps August 23rd, there would be a half day committee of the whole where there would be more detailed reporting on the broadband committee. Um, is there any further discussion on that? And is anybody against that date? Or does that date still look like it would be useful? And if so, we'll just informally put it on the calendar. Comments? Bob Lynch, go ahead. I was just checking the calendar, Brent. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't the normal third Monday be the 16th or is it 23rd? So yes, it would be the 16th. That. However, there was some staff, uh, staff, um, uh, conflicts at that time. Jessica, is that correct? Okay. That's right. The 23rd is the only Monday in August that works for staff to have a cow, unfortunately. Okay. I apologize for that. Yeah, no, no, that's that's fine. I was just clarifying that and, and the 23rd is fine with me. So thank you. Okay. And, and unfortunately I've got Rachel. Have... Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, I think the other part that is in the back of my mind that I sent out that report about the board retreat is the notion that it'd be nice. They were looking for an hour and a half at some point. Um, and I think either they said July would work and I was just looking over my notes to see potentially if we could sandwich that into the August um, cow. 
Um, so Kirsten, just so that we don't have to have separate, separate yeah, meetings. Yeah, that's a thought. Um, Kirsten, how would you feel if they, they had an hour to an hour and a half to talk about board retreat related things? Um, well, you know, if we led with that, because I think kind of reminding us about our good behavior would be helpful as we go into a uh, discussion on, on how to come to terms with things we might disagree upon. And Rachel, you know I mean? it might make sense if you would ask them to limit it to no more than an hour, um, knowing that this had to go on, because then you'd potentially be looking at a committee of the whole from one to six, something like that, if you started after lunch. Um, and we'll see if there's any further discussion of that. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, uh, somebody asked about the August dates and uh, I believe August, we changed the date of the board meeting to be a week later, didn't we? That might be why there's some confusion around third and fourth um, Wednesdays and Mondays and so forth. It's not on my calendar, so I don't know. Could somebody else verify that? Yes, Tim is, <laughs> Tim is correct. It, the board meeting is on the 25th of August. Aha, uh -huh. so that would work out well for the committee of the whole and the meeting because that week has had to have been set aside. So I hope everybody has got that straight. Uh, Rachel, anything else? Yeah, I was just looking back at that RFP schedule that you all had sent out, um, just Dan. Kind of and I know at some point we were hoping to have a cow to discuss, um, as you were saying, more detailed, do a deeper dive into some of the work you've been doing. So has that been bumped to September now? Yes, we had mentioned Perfect. that before because we won't have all the details until September. But yes, thanks for reminding people of that too. So then you might tentatively be holding a spot for another committee meeting in September, which would be the Monday before that third Wednesday again, which looks to be about the 13th. Is that how it looks to other people? You might um, put a tentative hold on your calendars for that until it becomes clear. Is that correct? That's correct, and please hold it from 8.30 to at least 12, I believe. Is that right, Dan? Is that enough time? Well, we'll come back to you, but please hold that date, September 13th. All right, uh, Joe Lewandowski, go ahead. Sorry, my internet froze again, just as I was asking a question. What was the date again for the, for the COW meeting on, in August, is that the 23rd? Yes. That is correct. It would be the okay. 23rd from 1 to 6. Asking okay. you to potentially hold out one hour longer. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on future planning for the broadband committee before I bring up one other issue related to it? Yeah, and, and just Joe. one. And that is our next uh, committee meeting is probably going to be July 15th. It was on its normal schedule, it would be July 1, and that is just not going to work. Um, so I have not heard back from the rest of the committee about July 15th, but we're going to see if that can work for folks. And there may be a new committee, as which I think, Britt, you're going to be talking about next. Yeah, and I think that's a good time to discuss. Now, we've, the, well, let me see if I can find that and bring that up. As you know, with committees, we have something called a statement of function for those committees. And part of that is sort of the lifetime of the committee and part of it is who is on it. And the board president typically addresses who's going to be on that committee. And sometimes we have staff on it as well. Now this committee is going over the election and two of the key directors who are on this, obviously Kirsten, who's the committee chair is up for reelection and Tim is up for re-election. And it was thought since there's only a couple of more months of lifetime for this committee, that it might make sense, similar to what was done in the past on Fast Track, that if one or both of those directors lose the election, that they would remain on the committee just to keep it moving forward. And they would keep donating their time until that committee was finished. And I shouldn't say donate because the charter says everybody is on it will get um, their normal uh, pay, per diem pay. But that action can't be done without a motion and approval of this board to change the 
statement of function for that committee because the board always approves those things. So there would be two changes. One, we before we actually extended that committee's lifetime through August. I don't know if that needs to be moved through September or through August is adequate. And the other, there would be a new sentence added to that statement of function that would say the existing board members will remain on the committee regardless of the election until the committee's complete work is completed. Those are the things we would potentially be asking this board to do if the board thought that that was a good idea. Um, Tim has said that he would continue to do that. Uh, Kirsten informally has said she would continue to do that, but I haven't got a complete yes shake of her head like we have now. So she's formally said she would continue. So now we're looking for potentially a motion to accomplish that, a potentially a discussion or anything else. So let's go ahead with that. Sue, go ahead. Okay, I move that we do not do that, do not extend the committee members. Um, you know, I mean, we've already extended the Broadbed Committee's lifetime once earlier this year. And I guess I have concern that there might be, we might be wanting to extend that further into the future. And I believe that should be handled by whoever the current board members are. All so, right, so there is a motion to not modify the current statement of function, or in other words, to not extend the time of that. Is there a second for that? Caller will second. Okay, we've got a motion made and a second. So now we're looking for discussion on this motion to not extend the lifetime of the committee's memberships if they're not reelected. Um, we've got Kirsten up. Kirsten, go ahead. Okay, so as I understand the motion, this is just about within the current time frame, which is still August, not extending the perhaps exiting board members if they're not reelected into the That's August. Correct. Nobody's talking about extending if, the. If this motion passes, then the new board president at your next meeting would have to. Um, uh, what would be the word designate missing members to that committee? Okay, so what I would suggest is if you wait until the next board meeting, which will be after the next broadband meeting, you may have an un, you may not have a broadband meeting because you're going to be missing to, you might still have a quorum. So if, if you don't want to extend the time of the broadband committee, you may want to consider, uh, continuing the effort. And I think it's important to do this before the election results because some, somehow it seems less, like I, I don't want, you know, like if, if I lose, I don't want to then come back and say, oh, but I want to be on it. So I'm just saying win or lose, I want to be there. Um, so th that's why we're, we're asking it now. So I would vote against this since this is a not action. So I would recommend voting against this so that we can extend folks who may no longer be board directors uh, and still take advantage of their expertise, if not just their um, sheer willingness to serve. All right, um, Rachel, you're up next in discussion of this motion. Yeah, so the motion, yeah, I just wanted to echo that there's been so much work that folks have put in. And so to kind of ask if Tim or Kirsten isn't reelected to just kind of lose that institutional knowledge to me um, seems uh, like a loss to the cause, um, especially since we're so close to finishing up this feasibility study. So I'm just in support of them continuing to be on this um, come what may the election. So you're also suggesting just to be clear that you would vote no on this is the way you understand it. Okay. Holly, go ahead. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, with all due respect, Ms. Sue, I would have to also vote no on this particular motion just because of the sheer fact that it has taken me as a member of the broadband committee so much time and effort to get up to the speed that I am that I would be afraid of the loss of that information and knowledge that has already been put in by um, Director Skihan and Wheeler. So respectfully, I'd have to also vote no on that. 
Okay, is there any further discussion of this? Sue, I see your hand. Did you have some more comments? I did. Um, you know, and again, if I'm not being disrespectful to our current directors that are on that committee because I know there has been a lot of hard work done. And if they are not reelected, they could always attend the broadband committee meetings, uh, you know, because they are open to public and could give their input there. But I think it's really important that if we have new directors, um, whoever that president is that would select that next committee, they need to be brought up to speed also. So if, well, we could ask, you know, Tim and Kirsten to come back and talk to the committee. I think it's more important to have whoever that new committee is to carry that forward rather than having directors that are no longer directors on there. All right, Dan Huntington, your discussion of this motion. I'll move to amend the motion <clears throat> to not have them serve past September, the September board meeting on the committee. I don't know if that's changing the whole intent of the motion or not, but anyway, let them yeah, continue motion. through September. So anyway, uh, there's an amendment yeah, to let the them motion. Do their August to, there's an amendment to the motion to allow the directors, regardless of the election, who are on this committee to continue through September. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second. Got a second by Tim. All right, now there is an amendment mode, amended motion, which is on the table, which yes, does change the basic tenant of the original motion that's been put out there, but that's fair game. Um, and now we're having discussion on this amendment to the motion. Is Tim, go ahead, you're up next. All right, so my hand was up for the previous motion. <laughs> um, here, here's, here's the thing that, that strikes me on this. First, what's the best thing for our members? I mean, we've put a lot of energy and time and effort a lot of us uh, on the board and the staff to come up with a recommendation for uh, LPA's role in broadband. And, you know, I mean, if it takes longer to get it right, I've always thought, you know, uh, accuracy and getting something right is more than important than expediency. And so this suggestion is really not taking away any authority from any new chair or board directors, they could say, okay, we're gonna add two more directors to this committee and, uh, and, and so be it. But the knowledge that was gained in this process, which has been over a long period of time and a lot of delay because of pandemic related activities and uh, difficulties, you know, to, to not utilize two of the key members <laughs> to the benefit of the, of the membership at whole in this regard seems to me to be uh, uh, penny wise and pound foolish. So I, I would just say, you know, this is, it's obviously the will of the board, but this is just about being common sense. Keep some people on the board if they lose this election, or excuse me, on the committee if they lose the election to allow uh, a, a much smoother transition and a, a, a better recommendation on behalf of the membership, uh, the total membership of the LPA co-op. So thanks. All right, Kohler, this is discussion on this amendment to the motion. Go ahead. So uh, I'm gonna tie the amendment also in with the original motion and I, I am in favor of the original motion. The amendment doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And my, my concern is we're setting a precedent here. We've already done this with Fast Track to where we kept people on the, that committee after they lost their election. It could happen also, we might bring up the financial part. We could also say the same thing about buying out of Tri-State because a lot of us have knowledge 
that a new person would not have. And, and I think it's a bad precedent to set. So I am voting in favor of, I'll vote against the amendment and in favor of the original motion if the amendment fails or passes. Okay, is there further discussion of this amendment to the motion? I'm not seeing any. So at this time, since it, oh, I've got a couple more hands up, so we'll go ahead and get to them. John Witchell, go ahead. John, John, unmute and go ahead. Just a quick process check in this question, I suppose, is directly to Graham. Do, is, there, or is there any obstacles? Um, do we have the right to do this? Um, should we choose to? Is there anything we need to consider from that perspective? Uh, excellent question, John. So um, the statement of function is uh, generated by the board of directors and the board of directors can amend it uh, when it wants to under policy 110. Um, as a matter of Colorado nonprofit corporate law, all of our boards are advisory in nature because none of them have the authority to bind the company themselves. They would just have to report back to the whole board and only the whole board can make uh, a uh, a, a binding decision. So uh, theoretically, you could staff any um, any board with uh, non-directors if you want, because they're all advisory in nature. So uh, yes, you you can do this if uh, the board elect. But didn't. But, um, but the entire board has to elect to do this. Does the um, don't um, don't your committees have the right to spend money if they're budgeted? Uh, as as part of the statement of functions, this particular committee did have a budget and deadline and some things like that. They can't unilaterally spend money uh, that's outside of that budget. So again, that budget authority okay. uh, vests with the entire. That, that money was spent, right? Uh, so, so I believe. It's funding the um, feasibility study. I, I'm, all I'm trying to do is look around the corner and, and if, if if we if we move forward with if we leave these guys on the board for another couple of months and then they incur expenses, the optics of that that that's not an issue. Tim, you're shaking your head. Well, it's not leaving members on the board, John. It's leaving members on a committee. Uh, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. I, I was just trying to look around the corner. That you guys spent all your money, right? The, the committee spent all the money, so this is a non-issue, right? Well, except for per diem. Um, yeah, yeah but that's, we're allowed to give per diem to you know anybody we put on any boards like we do with Roundup, etc. Okay. Okay. Then I have no further questions. Thank you. Can I inject here just real quick? Was just look at that policy. It does say at least one executive uh, committee member shall be on the. At least uh -huh. the executive. I was wondering committee. if anybody would <clears throat> one bit if anybody noticed that because we actually. <laughs> never did that with the broadband committee. We, and we were supposed to, one of the executive committee was supposed to be on it. Isn't Tim on the executive committee? Actually it states the vice president or president should be on oh, each committee. You. It doesn't say executive committee if you go back and look at the policy. And you're right, that was never done for this committee. I'm not sure, well, I guess in the finance audit committee, you Britt as president were on there, but, Yes, the policy states that each board committee, one of the, either the president or the vice president should be on that committee. I think that may have- Graham can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I mean, most of the standing committees have uh, specific uh, director positions, officer positions that are required to be on the standing committees. I think uh, the committee on policies is the only one that just says four board members uh, or up to four board members. We currently only have three uh, directors that are on the committee on policies. Um, so yes, I, I mean there. I mean there's the 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 broadband committee is a little bit different committee because it's an ad hoc committee, not a uh, standing committee. So its statement of functions is more malleable by the board. So, um, but yes, I think that would probably something that would need to happen to come into compliance is that when we have uh, a uh, uh, new officer appointments after the election, probably need to uh, 
amend the statement of functions again to add an additional uh, an additional officer to this committee if that's something that the board wants to do. All right, Kirsten, go ahead. We're still discussing the amendment to this motion. Yes. Yeah, and I just need to understand the amendment. It kind of sounded like it flipped the intent of the, the main one. I just need to understand what the amendment it is. It did. If we pass this amendment, then the main motion would have been modified, but we would still have to vote on the main motion. And the flip was to specifically, but no longer than September, allow existing board members to continue to serve regardless of the results of the election. So if, if you vote yes on that, and then no on the main, it's still gone. I don't... I, That's can correct. You, can you do... It, it has can to pass. Can you do something that flips it like that? <laughs> well, the first thing is just changing the motion. The second has to pass the motion. Uh, any comment on that, Graham? Oh. I mean, it, it's a very cloudy operation parliamentary-wise to sort of amend... The men, uh, to amend the motion to the, be the inverse of the stated motion. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, you, you, know, you have the authority to amend motions, uh, but I think it gets real confusing to do it that way. I won't argue. It wouldn't be confusion. my recommendation. My recommendation would be to, to have had to vote on the original one and then to, uh, and then to amend it. But um, with that, the, I, there, I, I think, as a matter of parliamentary procedure, you can have the amendment if that's how. All right, Kirsten, anything else? Uh, Tim, anything else? Yeah, just to clarify, you know, the this is not an, uh, an analogy to the uh, to the situation with fast track, right? And that, 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 that's a mischaracterization in my opinion. What happened with fast track was this board appointed a representative to fast track that representative subsequently in two, in two years running was not reelected. But at that point, they are a board member of Fast Track and Fast Track's board agreed to keep them. This board did not reappoint them again, right? So I think that's a, that's a fundamental difference. It's not the same as what we're talking about here. So I just wanna make that clarification. It's, it's kind of a misnomer. All right, uh, John Lee, go ahead. You know, this is only a matter of days, and if we're not quite certain that the board was formed correctly, and now we've got the parliamentary procedures oddly placed, can't we just wait a few days to find out the status and then see if this is even an issue? And then, like Graham was saying, we could go back in and readdress the functionality of it. Uh, we would have to have a special board meeting or you would have to wait until the next board meeting to change the statement of function. Now, that's the, the hold up with when there's another committee meeting already scheduled, tentatively scheduled and some other work going on. Uh, that's the, the rub, I guess. But the, but the broadband committee meeting isn't isn't happening on the 1st of July, and it might happen the week before the July next meeting for our board. It's only a matter of days then as well. Yeah, I'm trying to think um, theoretically what could happen is the, if nothing is done, this amendment is voted down and the motion is <clears throat> then passed and those one or more of those directors are not reelected, then at the next board meeting, there could be an action taken to um, appoint one of them as a member of the public or something like that too. This was um, in a sense, just allowing the, the board to continue as it is <clears throat> in case something happens before the next election and at the next board meeting, something else wasn't occurred. Well, let's go ahead and finish this parliamentary procedure uh, so we can get go on with this. Um, and we've got an amendment to the motion on the floor now. Is there any further discussion with that? 
All right, I'm looking for a vote on this amendment. It looks like there's gonna be some, it's not going to be unanimous. So I will look for a raise of hands and I will announce those people and count them so we can try and get it squared away. The, the, the motion, the amendment to the motion is that the current board members shall continue to serve on the broadband board regardless of the election no later than the end of September. All those who are in favor broadband of that, committee. of the broadband committee, all those who are in favor of that amended motion, please acknowledge, do so now by raising your hand. I'll see who I can see who, who has voted for this. And I will vote for it just in case. One, and I've got two for Kirsten. I've got three for Tim. I've got four for Bob, five for Holly. And I've got six for Rachel, seven for Dan, and Joe Lewandowski is eight. So there are eight votes in favor of this amendment. So the amendment passes. I see John now after the fact raising as number nine. Uh, okay, nine in favor of it. All those who are against it for the records, so please raise your hand now and I'll read those names out. That would be Kohler and Sue and John Lee. All right, that amendment has passed. Now the motion that we're looking to pass is that those board members shall remain on the committee through no later than the end of September. Um, and is there any further discussion of that motion now that it's been amended? Rachel, go ahead. Just quick clarification. So if we, it's clear to me what happens if we pass this motion. If we vote against it, what are we voting to do? If you vote against it, then the, the, the um, statement of function exists as it now stands, um, which if it exists as it now stands, let me bring that up again to see if there's anything else that would, I think maybe there it is way over in this window. It just says directors, director Tim Miller, director Holly Metzler. So the broadband committee or this statement of function wouldn't be quite right depending on the vote of the election. So this is modifying that statement of function so that those members would serve regardless of them being directors or not. And the board could last to the end of September. We had never changed the end date from April Quick, okay, can I just uh, mirror back what I heard to make sure I'm clear on this? So if I vote in support of this motion, I'm voting that in the event of turnover in the elections, Kirsten and Tim would stay on through September. If I vote against this motion, I am voting that they're off if there's turnover? Yes, if they're, if they're not still directors, they would be off. And this would have to be brought up again to make any changes to it. Would have to, this would have to come up again in the next board meeting for the committee to continue. All right, further discussion? All those in favor of this amended, oh, Holly, go ahead. I'm sorry, Brett, I am confused. I thought we just voted on the amendment just we now. Did. But the amendment passed, but the motion hasn't passed. Remember, you can you can amend a motion umpteen times, but you still don't get anywhere unless you pass the motion. Okay. Can you reread the amendment? Can you reread the motion as it stands? Yeah, the motion would be in that the current directors would remain on the broadband committee through the end of September no later than the end of September, regardless of the results of the election. And the broadband committee would continue no later than the end of September. All right, any other questions? I've got, Jessica's got a comment to make. Sorry, this is taking a while, Jessica, <laughs> we'll get no, there. No, it's okay. And I'm just acting as a, as a fake parliamentarian, um, but I believe that what Dan said was correct in that the policy dictates um, someone on the executive committee be on the board. So how would you meet the policy 
if you took this vote. I just, I'm just trying to make sure it's not in conflict with our policy, which this would result in a conflict. Yeah, it has actually resulted in a conflict in a conflict to the best of my knowledge in the past due to an oversight. Um, on the other hand, this is an ad hoc committee by which you can, you could override that theoretically if you chose to. We haven't, in a, so in a sense, the fact that we didn't specify somebody on the committee was perhaps an oversight, but it wasn't an egregious one um, because we've stated who's on the committee. I don't know if that's a good way of saying it, Graham, or not. Well, I mean, we do have an executive committee member on this committee, right? Tim Wheeler is our treasurer and he is on the committee. So we are not out of compliance with that currently. And so I think the concern is that would we get out of compliance by doing this, right? And all of our standing committees do have a, you know, a notation of who the officer is that is automatically appointed. So uh, would that we had, uh, say, Bob Lynch as vice president, who as, uh, as the vice president was a, a member of a standing committee and he was up for reelection and he was not reelected, you know, we would have a process to sort of automatically fill that with a director, right? And, that, and so that's the concern that we have here is that if the member of that committee who is also a member of the executive committee is not reelected, does that get us out of compliance with our policy and how do we address that, right? And so I think, you know, the idea is, uh, you know, I, I know we didn't identify Tim Wheeler treasurer in the statement of functions, but effectively we've done that, we've complied with that rule currently. And the concern is that we may come out of compliance with that rule. If we've Based been at the next century. board meeting, that would have to be addressed. It wouldn't, you know, that would, that's all I see. I don't, okay. Nothing more than that, Graham. Just next board meeting would be addressed if we're out of compliance. <laughs> okay, um, couple, we're, we're still discussing this motion. Uh, Joe Lundowski is next. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Sue, is uh, the way it was stated, is is that correct? Because I'm kind of with Holly, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, so are, are you, does this look the way, what you intended? Uh, not really in that I had not considered what the policy was stating. I just don't think it prudent or wise to have um, directors that are no longer directors continuing on a committee that should have new members from that are board members. Now, one solution to that, which was brought up is to add, you know, a couple new directors next month at after election. But again, I go back to the, the idea that both Tim and Kirsten, if they're not on the committee, can still give input to the committee, but they would not be on the committee itself. That would be whoever the president appoints as new director or new appointees on that committee. So my original motion was that they no longer stay on the committee after election. That's right. So this is an amended motion, of course, that flips that. So you would go against it. We got to wrap this up so we can go on. It's not going to be the end of the world regardless of what happens here. So let's go ahead and have another um, one more first comment and let's vote on it. Dan Huntington, go ahead. Well, sitting here thinking about it, the new board members are not seated until the next board meeting, right? Right. Am I correct? So at the next broadband committee meeting, Kim and Kirst, if they're still on that committee till the next board meeting. Well, they would officially so no longer be the, the yeah they they would officially no longer be directors, however, because in, as in my case, as soon as somebody else is elected to take my place, I am no longer on the board. The new members haven't been seated, but they're no the, the people who are are not up or who have been defeated are no longer on the board. Does that that little bit make sense, Dan? <laughs> yeah, that's well, what we'll say. It's a uh, month there that. 
you know, we're in limbo. Mm -hmm. So and I guess I got to apologize for screwing up the motion. So <laughs> I, we'll get through it. Like I say, it's not the end of the world to get it. It's, but let's, let's, let's try and get through this. Let's have a vote. Tim, final comment. Yeah, could, could somebody read the motion that we're going to vote on? Yes, the amended motion is that the current directors shall remain on the broadband committee through the end of September and no later than September, regardless of the outcome of the direction of the election. And the committee shall continue through September. Didn't we just vote on that? That was the amended motion. And you, an amended motion is not passing a motion, just passing an amendment. Now we're going to pass the motion. Yeah, that was just a vote to determine what the motion actually is, right? So it's a, the amendment you becomes approved, a motion. You approved the just, amendment to the motion, and now the motion. Do you have the original vote. motion then, Red? If that's what we're voting on. Okay. Um, are you? Pardon me, Tim. You needed. Well, we're, you we're not something taking on. another vote on a motion. We're not taking a vote on a, an amended motion. Yeah, a motion that has been amended. The motion has amended. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got it now. Thank you. That's... Thanks, Bob. That's probably the best lingo. We're taking a vote on a motion as amended. Thank you. That's I'll... very clear now. Okay. All those who are in favor of this motion as amended to a have the current directors remain on this committee regardless of the outcome of the election, etc. Please um, raise your hand now so I can count them off. All right, I'm counting me for one. And then I've got Kirsten for two, John Witchell three, Tim Wheeler four, Bob Lynch five, Rachel six, Holly seven, Joe eight. All right, I have eight in favor of this. Those who are against this motion as amended, go ahead and raise your hand for the record so we can see that would be Kohler is one, John is two, Sue is three, and Dan is four. Okay, that amended motion has passed. So this committee shall remain as is, at least through the next board meeting. Remember, anybody's always welcome to bring up motions to change committees during that part of the business. Okay, we have finished that. That was difficult, but we're done. Um, that's it for the broadband committee. It's about 1220. Um, this might be a good place to take a break, to take about a half hour break. So let's see if we could get back to start again at 1250, 1250, about half, 29 minutes from now. And then we'll start with the finance and audit committee at that time. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and jump into a break. Look to get started at 12.50 with the Finance and Audit Committee. Thank you for everybody for putting up with my clumsy parliamentarian procedures, but we got through it. Okay, if everybody's out there, time to start turning on the monitors and un getting ready to unmute. And we're going to go on to the next item in our agenda. The um, Finance and Audit Committee update is on page 87 of the board packet. Hey, Britt, can I, can I um, Seven, just say eight. something real quickly? Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry. To, uh, I have to leave at sharply at 3. I got this really exciting dental appointment I got to go to. Oh, sorry about that. I'm just saying that in advance. And, and I'm going to miss you tremendously. And I know we'll have some tributes to you that I... If I miss, I just want to say how much I appreciated being on the board with you and how much you contributed over these years. You're irreplaceable. Huh. Well, I appreciate that, Bob. I hope to be able to get over your way and visit you in Pagosa now and then. We should have an old directors gathering in Pagosa Springs. We That's, could get together with Mark <laughs> as well. That'd be fun. That'd be very good. <laughs> yeah, look forward to it, Britt. All the best. Team. All right. Thanks. So we'll, you'll be dodging out at three. Okay. Hopefully we'll be getting yeah. close to the end of our agenda by then. Um, yeah, I think, I think you're doing speed up. Yeah, you're cranking a, right along. Good well, for, it's good a little slow, friend. but we'll see. 
Okay, with that all said, um, Tim, it's up to you now to take it away with the Finance and Audit Committee update. So if you would. Uh, okay, well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, these fast meals in between the yeah. 29 minutes is always a challenge here. So um, <clears throat> I guess that, that suggests we should budget better maybe. Huh? So um, the, uh, the FAC um, report is in the packet and uh, there were no um, recommendations that came out of the meeting this month that the board would need to take any action upon um, other than we have changed the date uh, upon which we'll, the FAC will meet in July from the 8th to the 15th because um, otherwise it doesn't allow enough time for the FAC to see financials. They aren't prepared uh, so early in the month <clears throat> as a function of the fact that the first uh, Wednesday is, or the first of the month is a Wednesday and uh, or Thursday, I can't remember which. Anyway, <clears throat> the calendar didn't favor us, so we changed it to the 15th. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know, I don't think that it's highly useful to go through everything that we went through here. Um, so maybe I'll just open it up for questions for anyone who has questions about uh, the, uh, the report. All right, Bob Lynch, go ahead. Sorry, Brett, I just didn't take my hand down. My apologies. Okay. Are there any questions for the Finance and Audit Committee report for Tim? Kirsten, go ahead. Uh, not a question so much as something that I would like to really highlight is Carl's presentation about the uh, uh, cred capital credits allocation versus retirement. And that's something that each of us have as directors need to revisit multiple times because we will find ourselves confused every time. It's on page... Uh, a summary of it is on page 88. 88, yes, indeed. We find ourselves confused sometimes even after nine years. I was missing something there too. I was like, oh my God. So yes, good advice for all of us. Anything else on the Finance and Audit Committee? Any other discussions, questions? Carl, Here's do you want to add anything? Is there anything you want to? I don't think so, Tim. I thought your report summed it up nicely. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> all right. Then... Kirsten, hand down, and we will move on to the Committee on Policies update. Um, look to page 92, and I you'll see... I thought we can do that motion, Britt, at 5B. Ah, right. We, were, we held something over for this, so I appreciate that. Um, as Carl just reminded me, there is a tabled motion that we need to take up again during the board action agenda, not during reports. When we tried to do it before, that was pointed out by John. Um, that motion was to go ahead and um, could somebody look up or remind me what the name of that resolution is that we're authorizing, we're slightly changing so I can get the wording right. Yes, <clears throat> Britt, that is resolution 2021-09, special retirement of capital credits and uh, originally, it had said, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of La Plata Electric Association Incorporated that the 1500000 special retirement of capital credits be approved conditioned upon FERC approval of the proposed settlement. And so it's my understanding that you'd be striking uh, upon, uh, conditioned upon uh, FERC approval of the proposed settlement and the rest of the resolution would remain the same. Yeah, um, Car Graham, do you know, now that motion has been posted on our website, resolution. Um, if we made a motion to modify it, would we go back and change that resolution? Or, or how would that work? Or we would make a motion uh, to ignore it? I think it? we could probably do... Well, you, so you could basically pass a, a new motion, uh, you know, let's call it 2021-10, uh, and um, basically have the text of it be identical except for that removed portion, or uh, you could uh, 
call it amended, and we could perhaps uh, we could uh, identify it either way. I think that they'll yeah, work I know. as long as it's captured in a resolution and published on our website according to our policies. And what would be, I think it's cleaner to actually have a new resolution out there because then we don't have to change the previous one. We just have a new one that um, mm -hmm. is over it. And what would the number of that resolution be? I believe it would be 10. Let me double check. All right. While you're double checking, we will... Six, yeah, it looks like it's that. 10. Okay. Now, whomever made this motion before, we're slightly changing it so that it's a you move to adopt resolution 2021-10, which would be the same as resolution 2021-9, except the part about waiting for FERC to approve would be rescinded. And I'm looking for somebody to make that motion now. Uh, John Lee, go ahead. I think it's uh, in poor form that we are trying to move to amend a resolution and not, a resolution is a, a standing document. And Correct. so we have it and we should be able to read it, not paraphrase it and, and then be able to have the discussion on it. We don't oh. just want to vote to take out a paragraph of a resolution. That's, that's what the hurry up last month did to get that resolution in front of us and then it wasn't accurate and now we're getting ready to do the the same thing by not having a resolution by not having it uh wordsmithed and for us to be able to know which direction that we're heading with it so i i i don't understand what we're, we're not amending something we need a, a resolution to take this action and say that we don't want to wait for the FERC ruling to make the rate applicable. We want to ignore the rate setting organization and do it now because we're in a hurry. Um, the Right, this would not be an amended resolution. I agree with you on that part. This would be an entirely new resolution that would be identical to the previous resolution, except for the part about awaiting FERC. Um, I, I find that straightforward enough to go forward with. We will see if anybody else on the board does or chooses to make a motion to that and see how that turns out. We get your warning on that. Um, Kohler, go ahead. Yes, I think um, we need an additional. Sorry, can I just jump in real quick? I'm sorry. Um, me. Uh, Carl, was that you? Yeah, I'm real sorry to interrupt. I Because there is literally just deleting a couple of lines from a document, I can put a 21-10 in front of you right in like two minutes. Okay. <clears throat> you do that uh, while I, we're having further discussion and see what's going on, and we'll see if, if what happens with that. A color, go ahead. Well, I, I would only support it if we also added an additional whereas. And in that whereas that Tri-State has gone ahead and applied that 2% discount effective back to March on our current bills. That would make sense. Something in that effect. That would make sense. And, and I would ask also staff, did the reduction, did it actually compensate for going back to March? On have we seen that got? in our, have we already seen that in our bills? Yes, yes. I'm seeing shake your head. Okay, so I, I, I wouldn't want that whereas in there. And again, like John, I think I need to see this to really see what we're doing. But if he can do it real quick, let's do it. Yeah, and if, and if it actually, if it is going, needs a little bit of time, we can put it off to later in our agenda or if it's something that's quick enough, we could do it now. Is there any further discussion of this? All right, so the next step would be seeing the resolution in front of us with the proper numbers on it. Um, <clears throat> Carl, we won't make you do it momentarily. We will go on to, and 
I will move that to look in again after we do something. It's gonna take a little while, I think, and that's the Committee on the Policies Update. And this motion then will occur right after that. Resolution, motion to approve resolution 2021-10. Okay, I've got that in there and highlighted. So, so Britt, do we have a... Do Rick, do we have a motion to, to table this again? Is it no, that? there is no motion made. We're, this, we're still under the table in a sense, if you might. We had some background discussion on it, but no motion has been made. Okay. Um, <clears throat> John Lee, go ahead, and then we'll move on to the next item in the agenda. Oop, hands up. So with this cost of service coming out, and we're pushing up against it, wouldn't it be financially responsible for us to take a look at that cost of service study and apply this type of rate reduction across the board in a, in a longer term than, than giving this small percent for now or small dollar figure now? Well, that would be a different type of motion and change. We already have passed a resolution to distribute this amount of money. And the only thing that's keeping us from doing that is the awaiting FERC approval. If you wanted to do something different, that would have to be struck down, you might say. Um, and the whole issue of rates and things, I think everybody was pretty comfortable with the idea that yes, we will be looking at rates again after the cost of service study, the distribution of them. But this was kind of, in a sense, we're ahead financially now, and it was a way to distribute some of that back to our members. Um, that's sort of that discussion. But let's hold off on that and keep those thoughts, and we'll see what happens when we get to it after the Committee on Policies update. And again, then I'm gonna jump to page 92 of our board packet, and I'm gonna ask uh, Graham to start that discussion. He has that memorandum on page 92. So Graham, if you would, go ahead. All right, thank you, Britt. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, is that blown up enough for everybody to be able to see that? Is that good? I know sometimes when I share, share this, it's the print is too small for people to read along. It's looking okay from my point of view. All right. So um, just walk through this really quickly. Uh, as I addressed in the memo and uh, circulated around, uh, these are uh, the changes to policies uh, 105 and 129 are dictated by the new governance statute that came out uh, this legislative session. And uh, so we're obligated to promulgate some policies or amend our current policies. Uh, start with 105 really quickly. Um, one thing that was uh, required by, or was what, that we noticed in our review was this uh, term right here, um, that the nominating uh, petitions um, need to be signed by uh, people in the district in which the director's term expires. That's the exact same language out of the bylaws. Uh, that didn't track through into the policies, so the Committee on Policies decided to insert that to make sure it tracks the bylaws. Uh, then the next spot here is uh, this red underlined text uh, that uh, gives a more um, specific definition of our um, uh, joint membership rules. Uh, this is basically cut directly out of Article 2, Section 5 of our bylaws. So we've always had a bylaw on this, but the new law says we have to set it out in our election policy. Since 105 is our election policy, we're setting it out there. Um, a question real quick. Then, Kohler, go ahead. Yep. So I, I have two questions. And the first one is on that B1, the first change that you had. And it's not the change itself, but in that same mm -hmm. sentence, it says and submitted to the board is that correct it's submitted to the board or is it submitted to lpa staff it's it's the board 
it's actually is uh, the um, it's actually the election supervisory committee that uh, that they're I mean so I guess staff collects them and then the election supervisory committee vets them and uh, and then they are the one who determines uh, if a candidate is qualified or not so um, I suppose um, that did not, in the course of creating an election supervisory committee and updating these policies, that uh, was not uh, internally uh, consistent, that change. So, so can it, should it be changed? I think it's probably the most accurate reflection of our election supervisory committee. Um, okay. Uh, role to in, to change board and put election supervisory committee in there. Okay. Then my next one is under three that you were kind of getting to before I was recognized. And in that first change that you put in there, it said if a married couple. And then down below in B1, mm -hmm. it refers to people as joint member. And I'm wondering about mm -hmm. married couple because it might be maybe two college kids together, not married, that are actually joint members. So should we change married couple to um, if joint members hold a joint membership? I, I just worry about married. Then you're gonna get out of compliance. Well, then you're gonna get out of compliance with our bylaws, right? So this, this is verbatim out of our bylaws. And so now, now you would make this policy inconsistent with the bylaws and the bylaws would control. And so if we needed to change that, I think um, that would need to go to a vote of the members. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, it looks like there's another question on these two before we go further and I'll let Kirsten mm -hmm. go. Sure. Yeah, um, Graham, I think uh, that bylaw change, we should probably look at that and any other, what do they call that, outdated wording or something Certainly. that we might want to suggest for the bylaws for next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there definitely is uh, some of that. And uh, I have undertaken a, a pretty comprehensive review of our policies um, that I'm working on. Um, there's a lot of internal inconsistencies like this. And uh, so I have a long range project where I'm working to try and, and track down as many of these as I can find. So um, the, what we've, uh, what the Committee on Policies has brought uh, this month is uh, a few things that are mandated by statute and then um, some electric service regulations that haven't been amended in uh, about six or seven years. And so if we can just add bylaws to that to that review, and again, it's mm -hmm. going to be for the next uh, annual meeting. So we've got a, a year, but we only really have six months to work on it before we start uh, putting yeah, that together. Because we need Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, call or something else. Go ahead. Yeah, because we wouldn't be able to get that changed for another year. So could we add in there, um, if a married couple or joint members hold a joint, can we add or joint members? Because uh, what I'm worried about is you have two college kids and they aren't married couple, then there's nothing that applies to them as far as just one vote. So can we add that without, um, uh, okay. without violating the bylaws? Take a quick look at the bylaws. Um, a, a quick look at the bylaws. That's a oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, that's the current definition of joint member in our bylaws, and I appreciate that it is out of date in a lot of ways, um, but that is uh, what we have. Um, so I don't, I don't know that we can um, expand that here without changing it in the bylaws. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, on these two, uh, Tim, go ahead. Doesn't, uh, in just following up on Kohler's question there, doesn't uh, B1 sort of resolve that by saying only one member can actually sign the ballot? You're not going to get two ballots right, for one bill. So <clears throat> I think there's a, there's a bit of a safeguard there. I'm just trying to point that out. All right. I think we've got these two then more or less straightened out. So, um, okay. William, if you go ahead. That's the only two I see on policy. I think that's it for five or one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah let's, so let's that was stop that, there. And then, uh, Let's not go on and let's see if we can approve those changes. The other changes were just dates on this, which were last reviewed, last revised, last reviewed, those sorts of things. And remember, there was one other change submitted or suggested by Kohler where the change of the word board was going to be changed yes. to election supervisory committee. So there are two red line changes and the one change suggested by Kohler with everybody knowing that and having seen this, I'm now looking for a motion to approve this revised policy number 105. Tim, go ahead. So I'll move that we uh, approve the revised policy 105 with the red lines that we've seen and the replacement of board with election supervisory committee that uh, Kohler suggested. All right, in B1. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second by I got Sue to second it. Is there any further discussion of this motion to approve policy number 105? Uh, Tim, did you have further discussion? Uh, no, sorry, I just forgot to lower my hand. We just All want right. to make sure at the top that the date up there is correct also in the red line mm -hmm. showing 1-6. Uh, so, I'm sure that um, Graham will take care of that to make sure that's all right. Six, yeah, so 616 2021 is right. what I'm seeing on first page through page three. Okay. Some of the that's, other pages may not be quite yeah. great. Okay, we've got the motion made and seconded. I'm not seeing any further discussion. So, all those who are in favor of approving this policy 105, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any who oppose this approval, unmute and let me know. And any wish to abstain? All right. The approval was unanimously approved. Or the, this policy unanimously approved. And if, if Graham, would you go on to the next one, please? Yes. So the next policy uh, is a policy 129 code of ethics and conduct. Uh, again, these are all uh, more largely uh, changes that are mandated by statute. Um, the first one, uh, we are uh, required to add a duty of loyalty provision. Um, this language is taken directly from the, uh, from the law that was passed. Uh, it includes uh, this information about dual directorships and a uh, director who owes fiduciary duties to both association, uh, both a distribution cooperative and a generation and transmission cooperative shall not prioritize one uh, duty over the other. This is, uh, this is a matter of statute. I've, I've taken this as closely from the statute as I can. Um, and then... Uh, we had 
Uh, well, hang on, just hang on, just uh, a minute. We after I circulated this, Tim, we got one question, so we'll just yes. hit it while we're right there because I assume it's on that. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to make the motion to approve it, but I'm oh, there's there. there's a, there's a change. Okay, I'll wait. There's another change. Okay. Uh -huh. Um. So, uh, what isn't reflected on this document, but uh, did get circulated uh, in my re request for comments that I felt was uh, at least non-wordsmithing enough that we could address it here. We had a request for uh, nominal value to be defined as $50. Um, so that kind of like uh, Kohler's suggestion above to include, to amend from the board to election supervisory committee, this would be uh, to add an additional sentence here uh, where nominal value is identified as uh, $50. Or less. So would you just put that in parentheses after nominal value with dollar sign five zeros mm -hmm. that we're talking about? Yes. All right. Are you able to type that? Certainly. In I could just say, uh, or I was thinking, I was thinking of another sentence here. I don't know. I, let me see if I can open this as a Word document. Because it seems like you wouldn't need another sentence just to put in parentheses $50. Yeah. Okay, but anyhow, that's item E1 then has a suggested change if we are to pass this policy. That would be um, nominal value would be. That. I didn't see that you put anything in in front of the screen that I'm looking at. Here, is this, is this true? Oh, um, let me uh, change my screen share. Right here. I see it. All right, that looks good. Good. Okay. Then um, this uh, uh, was uh, required to be added. Um, a director of the board of directors is required to disclose in writing when a decision of the board could provide directly uh, and as a proximate result of the decision of financial or other material benefit to the director. Uh, if the benefit is unique to that director and not shared by similarly situated cooperative members, a parent, grandparent, spouse, partner in a civil union, child or sibling of the director, if the benefit is unique to that person and not shared by similarly situated cooperative members, or an entity in which the director is an officer or director has financial interests unique to that director. So um, sorry for the tortured language, but that pretty much comes directly out of the statute. One thing I would note is that we also do have section three above, uh, which is um, the general conflict of interest uh, in statute uh, regarding all nonprofit corporations. And so I believe that that still applies as well as this. My recommendation is that we leave both of those in there. Any questions on that? I, don't, I had to sort of take down nope, my not at the moment. Little so, and then I believe that was that's all of the uh, suggested changes for uh, policy one twenty nine. All right. The, then I'm at this time looking for a motion to approve policy number one twenty nine with the changes as outlined to us. I've got Rachel, go ahead. I move that we approve policy 109 with proposed changes. 129, okay, and I'm um, looking for a second. Holly? I'll second it. All right, now we're looking for a discussion on this motion to approve policy number 129. Is there any discussion? Holly? Graham, would you mind going back to page four of the policy? So, because I missed the actual changing and adding of the fifty dollars. Yeah. Um. 
And the reason why I'm asking is that that bill, the legislation that passed and was signed into law, it starts at $50, but it's adjusted for inflation. So I don't know if, if we ha need to capture that somehow. Actually, Holly, that was removed from the bill that was passed. So um, it this tracks the actual language of the statute that it is, uh, doesn't have that escalator clause in it anymore. Okay, and thank so you. So it's uh, just it's, it just says nominal value, but uh, we did have a request that even though the statute doesn't identify nominal value, that that we identify it. Um, yes, specifically that's helpful. As Fifty dollars, and I will say that Holly is correct. When this was originally presented, it. Uh, the statute would have required us to include some language similar to this uh, anyway, but um, through part of the lobbying process that I wasn't part of, it got removed. So I don't, I don't know. Thank how goodness. <laughs> Is there further discussion on this motion to approve policy number 129? I'm not seeing any. All directors who are in favor of approving policy number 129, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any who are opposed, please unmute and let me know. And any abstentions? All right, we've approved the changes to policy 129 unanimously. Um, let's see, do you have an, oh, the next one would be electric services. So continue on, Graham. Okay, so we have uh, draft edit of the electric services regulations. And I will start by noting we had a lot of uh, good input from reviewers that the um, there's some issues with the header and header tracking, uh, sort of working with this document. It seems to be coming from an older format. So uh, we're, uh, Janelle and I will work to make sure that when it's ready to be posted, that uh, all of the um, headers uh, information is corrected. Um, sort of walking through here, there are quite a few small changes. These all came from a long consultation with staff who works with this document uh, regularly and uh, had a lot of uh, information input on this, basically, you know, where the rubber hits the road. So uh, one is that we uh, have added the peak power charge, um, but it hasn't reflected into our uh, billing components definition. So we need to add that in there. Um, another uh, good catch was uh, that um, the Roundup Foundation just said local organizations, not local nonprofit organizations, uh, because as a matter of law, Roundup is prohibited from contributing to organizations that aren't nonprofits. Uh, that is a nice clarification in there. Okay, hang on a minute. We've got Kohler. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that first edition that you had, Graham, um, mm -hmm. if I understand it correct, our peak power charge is a lot like the demand charge. It goes by kilowatts, not kilowatt hours. But this one says, that new edition says, where a member uses the most electricity. And shouldn't that reflect kind of like the one above it, number three, the maximum rate of flow of electricity? Because that could be quite so, different. So, so take this out and... Well, actually, since it's a full hour, they're saying the same thing. If it was a part of an hour or something, that's where it's a little different. But let's ask also Dan to weigh in on, mm -hmm. Dan Harms to weigh in mm -hmm. on the definition of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think both are correct. Um, like Britt said, you know, a kilowatt hour over an hour is a a kilowatt um, you know, is where a member uses the most electricity. Now, I, it doesn't say, you know, what we, did, what we don't want to say is uses the most energy. I mean, that's, I guess electricity would be a little more generic. I guess I don't see a problem with that because we are actually, you know, what we're, what we're measuring is kilowatt hours over an hour. So technically either one would be correct. And it would have to be changed if it was some period other than an hour. But in some ways, it seems as if this definition might be easier for a member to understand. But of course, members aren't the ones who are potentially using this document as regularly as staff. Any more comment, I think, or anybody okay? I think we're okay with it then.
and we finish with nonprofit. So now I'm going on to the next one, which is page 120 in my board packet. Mm -hmm. So we added this um, uh, cap on uh, how long installment payments run. This was designed to correspond uh, with other policies that allow um, installment payments for up to six months with no interest. Uh, Caller, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry to be bugging you, but this, uh, what we add is, but not to exceed six months, can that be interpreted as far as the incur no interest for six months or the period of time? And I'm thinking it refers to both of them. So a possible change might be to add after uh, were accumulated, comma, but not to exceed six months and shall incur no interest. Again, I don't know from a legal point of view, but to me that would be confusing if it meant just the interest or the whole, the whole time period. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So it would be, so you're suggesting. So that what I'm suggesting is that this it, would, it would read, it would read any installment payments under the provision of this rule may extend over a period of time equal in length to the period during which the errors were accumulated, comma, but not to exceed six months and shall incur no interest. Okay. Do we want to, do we? But what is the intent? Um, is the intent that the there's no interest for six months or is the intent that this applies for six months? Exactly. What is the intent? I believe the intent is that, that there is uh, that you can get on a six month payment plan with no interest. So yes, it needs to be clarified. It could just say, and shall not, uh, shall incur no interest for six months. <laughs> or, should, or just say, uh, such payment plan shall not exceed six months. Right. So make a whole new sentence here. So perhaps. And, and Carl, if you're listening in, as, as far as, you know, I wasn't sure how these installment plans work, but is that, um, is that the case that we're allowing payment plans, but they shall not allow, they shall not exceed six months. And when we give them a payment plan, there won't be any interest on it. Are we correct about this? That is correct, yes. Okay. So is this a better language than such payment plan shall not exceed six months? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that does it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. All right. Uh, next one is uh, uh, meter tampering. Uh, yes, Dan. Dan. Uh, we're not talking about bill payments. We're talking about errors in the meter. And this could be just for a one month period. But we're putting the six month limit on there to that if the error was 12 months, it's not to exceed six months. You won't credit them for anything more than six months, right? So any installment payments uh, under this rule may extend over a period of time equal and linked to the period where the error was accumulated. And then such payment plan shall not exceed six months. So if it was, I suppose, a seven month error, you would only get six months is how I would read that. Right. Or a 12 month error, you would get six right. months. But if it was a three month error, you would get three months. Right. At Dan Harms. Yeah, I just Carl, wanted to point that out. Yeah, is this? Is this correct? Because we had discussion about this, so this can get confusing. I'm glad Dan Huntington brought that up. Well, when we discussed it, um, I think this works when we're looking at, in the basis of a meter malfunction or a billing error, the one kind of extraordinary circumstance I don't think would fit into this. 
And I think that's the only one where this would be a problem. The, and I'm hearing what Dan's saying too, because I, I didn't follow where this was. And is this also the intent that if the meter is malfunctioning for nine months, we're only going to credit them with six months of, of if error? Is that the intent? If so, that's not what it says now. This is just talking about the payment plan to correct that error. It was my understanding that we did six months interest-free payment plans on other uh, other billing related issues and that, that the idea was to bring this in compliance with that. Oh. Yeah, and it doesn't matter how long the meter's been out of error then it's it's the payment plan that's six months, but the meter, we're gonna make it right if it's out of error for a year or out of error for a month. Is, is that correct? I, I think we only go back six months was the, was the intent, Brett, um, on, on other things that I've seen. It's, uh, and, I, and I think further down in the policies here, there's other mentions of that as well, where, you know, and I, I think that's pretty typical for other things where, you know, we could, there could be something unintentional out there that was, um, you know, an error for, for a while, you know, even years that, uh, that it, but not exceed six months there as well. Then in the, here's, I think what Dan sentence, is referring to. Yeah. And in the sentence then above, or is it captured because it says blow, but not to exceed because yes, it's clear. Now you're talking about payment plan in this part. And if the part below covers the length of time of which you're going to correct something, you're okay. You don't need to add anything more. This one here's I think it's okay because the part below captures what happens over the extent. In other words, if the meter has been off for two years, the part below says, well, oops, that's, that's a tough break, but we're only going to correct it for six months. That part above says, well, and then we could, we'll do it with a payment plan for six months with no interest. Okay, we're, we're okay without any further changes that make sense to everybody. All right, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Tim, your hand's up. Quickly, Tim, and then it'll be Bob. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I thought part of the uh, sort of the rules of the road that Graham gave us in providing these policy changes were if it's a simple wordsmith, you know, grammatical wordsmith, we could try and do it. Otherwise, if it's significant, we should send it back to committee. And I think we're at that point on this piece, perhaps. We're, we're, we're not following that ground rule, so to speak. I think there are some other things that I'd, I'd send in that I still haven't had a response back to and so forth. So maybe we go through this to see if there's other issues, but I don't think we should wordsmith and pass this at this point. It should go back to committee. Yeah, because it should be very clear if it's capturing the true intent of these two things. And um, yeah, it may not be as clear as it should be. So it's suggested that we So yeah, I think that's and send it to committee. Go ahead, Graham. I think that's I think that's right. It seems to me that there's enough confusion at least around this that um, now I will say I will say this that we discussed this as a committee um, in part because of a lot of feedback I got about something that's coming up. And the committee was hopeful that if there were uh, we wouldn't need to table the entire document over a few sections that we could get through what was um, agreeable and, and table and return things. So um, my suggestion would be that um, I table this and then we see if we can uh, get through uh, other sections of this 
document. Uh, Bob Lynch, go so, ahead. Let me ask a, just a clarifying question. Um, just help me catch up a little bit if I've gotten behind. Um, does this address the case like one I forwarded to Jessica just recently where uh, a member was being incorrectly billed and they figured out that the, they were being billed for their neighbor's meter for years? And are we saying the look back is only six months? on those cases where they've been overbilled? My understanding, Bob, was no, um, because that was a very unique circumstance. It's not yeah. a meter error. It's just a one-off crazy, we need to fix that type circumstance. Okay. So that that's being addressed separately as that was, that was yes. some kind of really goofy error or yep. strange cross wires. That's right, <laughs> literally. And so we, I, as I recall, at the um, Committee on Policies, we decided we could stay with the six months because the way the AMI meters work, there is no way you would get beyond six months without noticing something was wrong. Okay. And so that, that member, is that member happy? Just so, just so I know if I happen to run into him in the grocery store? I believe so. Thank you. Appreciate that. Or they run into you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Throw a rock at me. <laughs> All right. So the next uh, section is uh, meter tampering. Uh, we had a couple issues with this one. Uh, the cost hadn't been adjusted in quite some time. And uh, Carl verified that that $500 is a lot more in line with what this actually cost us than $250 was. Also, uh, we had originally had this as a refundable bond um, and uh, we felt that a fine that was imposed immediately was uh, more appropriate considering that there's about a $500 cost uh, to the association um, that is incurred immediately and that needs to be defrayed by the meter tampering member. Um, so uh, this following language tracks through about uh, the fine being non-refundable. And then there are some other uh, catches. Thank you, Tim, for catching these uh, overlooked references to fine from cash bond. Any questions on that? Not seeing any. Okay. All right, so here's our uh, low income energy assistance program. Um, we uh, had initially, I'd initially circulated this um, with the reference to human services, but um, uh, with some questions by directors and some follow-ups uh, to staff, it turns out that was sort of a catch-all reference to a variety of social ser services programs. So I've made a brief amendment to capture that. Um, basically, the idea is that um, we are allowing a program um, to the money that is being contributed by a program to be considered as though it's being applied directly and, um, and it will sort of help with our uh, disconnect, or I'm sorry, it will help with our, uh, our low income uh, members. Any questions on this? Uh, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, I, I didn't have any questions until you started talking about it. So I'm looking at F bills, the leap there. Is that what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, it, F bill, okay. yes. Okay, so that does mm -hmm. say human services. Were you trying to make that broader? I'm sorry. Were you trying to make the term human services broader, more broad? Yes. Yes, because when we had human services capitalized, it was some confusion about whether that was limited to La Plata or Archuleta County human services or, and so the, the, our, our consumers may apply for energy benefits from a variety of social services programs. Um, I have a list on an email somewhere of all the different uh, programs that they were anticipating uh, potentially receiving funds from. And so I figured a, a sort of broad generic term of 
social services programs would be the most inclusive and allow most uh, access by the largest number of low income uh, members to receive assistance. Okay, then I, I, I thought I was looking at the most up to date director point. I am, I'm in mm -hmm. Director Point Live. So what the words I'm seeing on your yeah, screen. Yeah, this, this was. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this Correct. is since sometime after nine o'clock. This is, a, this, so, well, this is, um, so I have had, you know, sort of, I'd, uh, I guess the idea was that in order to um, address the you know, wordsmithing at the meeting, that we would, um, that I was trying to get as much input from directors before the meeting to uh, be able okay. to okay. address this I, outside of meeting time. Oh, okay, I wanna just make sure that I don't have a, so I'm, I'm working on a slightly different thing than you. So yours is what's standing and yours is what we're gonna be voting on. I think social services totally makes much more sense than human services. I just need to look at your right. screen now instead of my screen. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So th there were there were some um, some what I considered to be uh, meaningful and valuable, like not wordsmithing changes, and also some grammatical errors that were caught that that I've tried to incorporate it in, into this document rather than sort of going through them one at a time during the meeting and having to watch you guys. Have, have you guys watched my typing skills? Um, this is, but that said, I do have, I'm gonna switch to this. Um, um, For this next portion. Okay. So uh, the next section was budget billing and uh, try and figure out what was the best way to balance um, budget billing and, uh, and uh, what was going to be the most efficient uses of uh, staff time and corporate resources and what was going to be the best fit for our um, for our uh, low or fixed income members. And uh, Sue, do you mind if I call you in on this? Is it, this was the, something that the committee was certainly willing to have tabled and sent back to committee um, based on a lot of the ongoing discussion around that. Does that summarize where we are on this right now? It does. <clears throat> there was a lot of confusion about the existing budget billing and the flexible budget billing or variable that the staff wants to incorporate. So that portion we will take back to committee at our next meeting. Okay. All right, so uh, here is a, just a, an ad by staff to modernize the scope of um, deposits that we receive. Um, before it was sort of uh, cash and irrevocable letters of credit from a bank. Uh, we wanted to expand that to allow more people to uh, be, uh, have different types of payments, including uh, a referral letter from a local assistance agency. This ties back into that sort of social services uh, assistance for our um, low income members that they can have, instead of coming up with a deposit for themselves, they can have a uh, local assistance agency uh, present the deposit for them. 
Any questions about that? Caller, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if it wouldn't be wise to also add with uh, the addition of check and credit, maybe approved electronic payments. I know my kids don't use any of the things that are listed there. They use um, Venmo and other things. So I, I don't know if LPA uses that now, but they might start pretty quick and that might be something that could be added. Just a thought. That, I don't know. Carl, does this kind of cover the scope of what we currently accept? Yes, I believe so, Graham. And of course, these electric service regulations don't have to stay fixed for six, eight years at a time. They can have more frequent changes if changes occur. Do we need, do we need to make any adjustments based on this or I think, are we all right? Is I it, think you're okay for the moment, okay. but right. and then yeah, go ahead. I was going to say then we've uh, um, removed uh, this um, uh, twelve months of uh, previous payments because it's already captured up here in two A. Consumer provides association of proof of good payment from their previous electric utility and that previous utility company can be us as well. So that was redundant. Um, we did have some confusion on this uh, about whether um, this was all electric service or uh, and it turned out it was just sort of a confusing wording. So we've changed from any elect all electric service to any electric service, meaning that it's not uh, entirely electric service, but just uh, electric service of any kind. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Um, and we've also um, taken out uh, the um, interest rate portion here to make things uh, consistent throughout on a six months of uh, interest free. Um, I'm sort of running that through the entirety of the um, of the electric service regulations. And um, we've removed uh, this installment agreements, the prohibition on installment agreements for uh, commercial accounts. And then um, we have removed this uh, as this section here is inconsistent with this lower section here. This is sort of some difficulty about um, when a check is returned, when, when is the time to correct it? And, and so the time to correct it is that if a consumer pays uh, by check, um, the electric service will be terminated without further notice if the, if the uh, check is returned, that, but this is after. So after a disconnect notice for 10 days, then if that is post 10 day notices paid with a dishonored check, then there will be no further grace period after that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions on it. Okay. And then we can see this low income energy assistance program moved up uh, higher where uh, it seems to fit in better. Um, we have a change here of uh, you know, eliminate, uh, terminating on Thursday instead of Friday based on our uh, LPA's Monday through Thursday uh, business schedule. And um, then we have um, uh, 
taken away this leaving a note of explanation about disconnected services. We found that uh, there's staff uh, safety concerns with these uh, tampered meters and that most of them can be remotely disconnected. And so we're, we've uh, taken this note of uh, the posting of the note of explanation away uh, for staff safety reasons. And that should be the end of the proposed uh, changes to the electric service regulations. So Graham, you're thinking that the board could approve all of this except for that, which is known to be tabled, two parts? Or do you think it's got to? Correct. Okay. Now I know there's a lot mm -hmm. here. I think it can, I think, I think the board can, can the board can move to approve as amended on the discussions and tabling described today. Yeah, and um, yes, board, there's quite a bit in here. We know there's going to be a little more work on this, but I think it would be helpful if you would approve all that has been laid out, knowing, of course, that if we've overlooked something or got something not quite clear, we'll get a chance again. But um, we'll see if there's any will for the board to do that. Uh, Tim, go ahead. I'll so move what Graham so articulately stated there. And he probably can write it down better than I can. <laughs> All right. There's a, a motion made by Tim to approve these revised electric service regulations. I'll second and that. And it's been seconded by Bob. Is there further discussion of this? And again, I'll mention, we know there's going to be another review of this by the policy committee. And then the board should have another chance to read through these. And at any time, if you find something that needs to be changed or clarified, you can do that. It doesn't have to wait for eight years. Um, is there any more further discussion on this? Okay. All those who are in favor of approving the electric service regulations revisions laid out by Graham, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, Graham, good work. I know that's difficult. We'll look forward to seeing some more revisions by the policy committee when you figure out some other parts that need to be. Uh, so we're finished with that. The next part um, of electric service regulations, go ahead. Uh, I was just, I, I, I'm sorry, you're right. We're done with that particular line. item. I just thought you were thinking we might be done with me. I have one more. Policy committee a couple of things. I see one is the bylaw amendment to conform to Colorado law. Now that's our a bylaw amendment. Now go ahead and explain that. Right. Uh, you might remember a few um, months back when we were in our run up to our election, we had a date that was incorrect in our bylaws. Uh, it stated that, um, that, uh, um, Director petitions needed to be submitted 60 days uh, before the election, and uh, by law that was actually 45 days. And so, I, at the time, I discussed that there was a governance bill pending, um, but that it had a lot of moving parts, and that I couldn't guarantee you that it would get amended. And uh, well, it, it did get amended. And one of the things that it amended was it moved that date to to 60. So my my understanding from, from talking with previous legal counsel was that we had sort of been anticipating this legislature moving that date from 45 to 60 for a while, and it sort of gotten out ahead of it by changing our bylaws. And so I said that until the, until the law actually changed, we needed to conform to the law. So I think it was back in February, we amended the bylaws from 60 to 45 now that the law has actually been passed and signed into law by Governor Polis, we need to move it back to 60 to again conform with the law. The copy of bylaws that I have still say 45, I thought. Is there a copy that's published or available or out that has 60? Um, well, yeah, so uh, let me 
bring up. I mean, I have a cop. I have a copy that says sixty on it, and let me pull it up so we can Hi. see where the change is going to be located. <clears throat> so the change will be located here. Oh wait, that's not it. That's the wrong sixty. There you go. The nomination petition must be filed. So currently that should be 45 days prior to the date of election uh, because that's what the statute had previously said. It's now been amended to say 60. Okay, and um, your understanding is we can do this by voice vote and not bring it to um, the members because it's following its state statute. Is that correct, Graham? It's, we can do this by voice vote? Yeah, sorry, yes, um, yes. This uh, just needs to be a voice vote. Uh, we don't need um, any other, uh, um, when, when it's done to conform with the law, uh, we don't need to submit it to the members. Uh, a mere voice vote is sufficient. And that's how we did it back in February. All right. So with that said, let's see if any director wishes to make a motion to make that change. Tim, go ahead. I so make the motion that we change it to 60 days to conform with law, state law. That case. All right, we have a motion by Tim and a second by Sue to make that date uh, time change to conform with state law. Is there any further discussion on this? All those in favor of this change, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that change has been adopted by a motion and voice vote. Okay, the, we looked at having an election supervisory committee update as the next item on the agenda. I know that was supposed to happen this morning, but here we are. Is there somebody available to make that statement or Graham, are you going to do that? Well, no, I believe Cheryl, Ayer, Ms. Ayers, the uh, committee chair is uh, in the um, attendees list and has been patiently waiting there all morning. At the Always appreciate the pace. Certainly. Uh, Janelle, can you bring her over to see if she is there now and is able to speak to us? Yes. Okay, Cheryl, if you are there, please unmute and give us an update from the Election Supervisory Committee. I am seeing no action at the moment. She may have stepped out thinking we'll never get to her. Ah, I see something. Cheryl, go ahead. I'm here. My computer wasn't responding when I told it to. <laughs> okay, we can hear I'll you. Just, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for appointing me to the committee and for letting me speak to you today. As you may be aware, the committee has had three challenges this year. The first one regarded a candidate using the La Plata Electric logo. And our finding was that that candidate did indeed violate policy 105 section two. That was easy because our instructions are to make a decision. We made the decision. La Plata Electric then took the action of sending out a press release and emails and such. The next two issues that came to us were far from easy. The second one involved two board members who had submitted letters to the editor of the Durango Herald supporting one candidate in the election. Because our authority and our responsibility is to make a finding, we found that there was not a direct policy violation. And we did much, much discussion and Graham helped us as we looked at it. The third concern was a board member, one of those same ones, 
on social media, posting a letter supporting a candidate. That one was even more concerning to us because that on that, the director also spoke negatively about the other candidate and then used another board member's name in the letter. And we felt that that implied that that board member agreed with what he was saying in support of one candidate. Well, the reason this is hard is because of the wording of policy 105. The first paragraph under section two says the board will not support a candidate. Interestingly, the second sentence says board members are prohibited from doing certain things. So in our mind, there was a distinction in the policy between the board and board members. However, that distinction doesn't exist in the public's mind. And so it um, has made it very difficult. We feel that those board members have spoken or written kind of um, in a way that they should not have. They did not make it plain any of those three times that what they were saying was their personal opinion. In fact, what they did was tout their board membership, which, and I'm speaking personally, I feel means they were using that board membership to try to influence the election. And part of what we're charged with is making sure there's a fair and impartial election. I wonder how it can be fair and impartial when individual board members are taking sides so publicly. So I was thinking, and I have some experience with obeying the law and some experience with finding loopholes. So just because it did not violate the policy for a board member to speak out publicly, I would like for you, I would encourage you to ask yourselves three questions. If I do this, is it the right thing to do? Whether it's legal or not, is it the right thing to do? If I do this, is it necessary for my La Plata Electric Board membership for me to do that? And thirdly, does my speaking out in support of one candidate enhance the public's perception of LPEA? My answer for you to the last one is no, it doesn't at all. Other policies you have encourage board members to um, not only give them permission, but encourage them to be actively involved in the, in the community. And everyone has a right to his or her own opinion. And people have a right to voice their opinion. We looked at several past letters to the editor from board members, and I was impressed by the statement from a board member from the past who made it very clear. He, he never mentioned his board membership, but he made it very clear at the end of the letter that this was his personal opinion and not to be taken as a position of the board or of La Plata Electric. And, um, we believe that that's what board members should be doing if they're going to publicly support one candidate. And we also, because we have no policing powers, we have no enforcement powers, we don't even want them, but we feel like the board has a responsibility to police itself and to do whatever you need to do so that this doesn't happen anymore in this election and certainly doesn't happen in future elections. When we come back to you at the end of, um, after we've looked at the final financial reports, 
we'll be making some suggestions. And I believe one of our suggestions will involve policy 105 uh, because it has made it challenging for us. It has resulted in what many would consider an unfair and a biased election. And it just has not helped La Plata Electric's uh, perception with the public at all. So I thank you for listening to me. Tomorrow we will be spending as much time as it takes at the clerk's office overseeing the counting. Then we will, um, I intend to join for the, for the meeting where you announce the results. We will be reviewing the final financial uh, reports that are filed. And then we will come back to you with our report and our recommendations for you. But I wanted to uh, mention this to you right now and hope that you would take it seriously and that you would consider not only your own actions, but the actions of your fellow board members and how they're perceived by the public. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you, Cheryl, for your statement. I do see one hand up, so we'll go with Sue McWilliams. Sue, go ahead. Thank you, gosh, here I get croaky again this time of day. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, for your input there. And just as a little bit of a follow-up, I have talked with Graham and uh, with a fellow director about the, the post that was put on uh, social media. And I, I think my recommendation as well would be to refer both policy 105 and 129 back to the policy committee to take a stronger look at for future. I also talked with the ESC committee about the situation that this put them in from a policy standpoint and truly 105 does not give them any kind of power. It refers it all back to the board of directors. So, you know, we, we continue to talk about policy 129 and I think even though we approved some changes to that today, we probably need to look at that again, as well as policy 105. All right, are there any other directors who wish to speak? Uh, John Witchell, go ahead. Sure, I'll weigh in on this. So, uh, so that person was me, just in case anybody who wasn't 100% clear on that. Um, and I think that the, I would encourage the revision of the policy. I thought I was complying. Um, I thought I was, uh, I thought I had communicated clearly and plainly that I was speaking in my own words. Um, so I would encourage the policy. I think Sue's right. I think we should, should kick it back. And I think if you came back and said, hey, if you're going to speak publicly, uh, please include this exact disclaimer at the top and bottom. Um, totally black and white. Um, if I had known, if I had had that language or I was aware of that language, then I would have, uh, you know, I would have, uh, I would have posted it because I, I believed at that time that I was in compliance. Um, so, um, you know, lesson learned. I think um, the other item that I would revisit um, in, in subsequent conversations is the, the failure to require the, a, a greater action to be taken with regards to the signs that were not, uh, the signs that basically look like the LPA color and typography signs. Um, I understand why we as a, a board and LPA as an organization, you know, can't get into the business of adjudicating every single infraction. Um, but the simple truth of the matter is, is that a hundred plus signs stayed live for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and continued to reinforce um, the, the implication that LPA was um, in fact um, uh, endorsing a, a given candidate. And, and so I think when I look at the policies, we're stuck in this weird place where Cheryl can come out and say, well, yeah, they broke the rules, but then LPA is in an untenable situation where we, we don't really have a, a, a clear cut mechanism to 
require a candidate to make corrective action without essentially taking on a huge fight. Um, and, and frankly, a very problematic fight in that particular item. Um, and, and if we could put down some policies that made that really clear, that said, you know, that we, we have decided not in real time, but if you do X, then you're required to do Y. If you, if you violate the policy um, of type and typography and font, then you are required to remove the sign it, it completely throughout the, organi throughout the community. If you uh, fail to post the, a message regarding, if you, if you fail, to, fail, fail to post the disclaimer according to the policy, you're required to, to post, uh, to remove it and then post a corrective post. And, and I think with a series of three or four bin you know, binary, if this, then that, I think you can really um, de-escalate a lot of the challenges that happen in this election. Um, so my two cents on the matter, um, since I found myself unfortunately in the middle of one of those items. Um, Mr. President. Yes, Cheryl, go ahead. Just to clarify, and I don't know how you would all have the information, as we considered the complaint to which John is referring, we found that there was a violation in using the logo of La Plata Electric, the Touchstone Cooperative logo was on the bottom of some of the door hangers. We considered the lettering, the L, the, the prominent L-P-E-A. And in fact, someone uh, rather jokingly said if it were purple and yellow, there would be no issue. Unfortunately, it wasn't purple and yellow. It, it is green. It looks a lot like what L-P-E-A uses. But our determination was that did not violate the policy because that those are letters and that's a font and those are colors that are available to anyone. However, he did use the logo on the bottom of some of his door hangers. So that's why we did not even suggest anything uh, about the signs or anything else that he may have done. It was just those door hangers and the Touchstone Energy Cooperative logo. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, um, from a previous uh, career in the high tech field, you know, there are trademarks you can have for fonts and registrations of various trademarks and logos and uh, yeah, font and, and word treatment and so forth. And so that might be another thing that should be considered if it's not already trademarked by LPA. Utilization of that kind of a trademark um, or, or acquisition of that kind of trademark. And then that becomes clear for uh, uh, like the ESC, the supervisory committee to make that determination. Okay, this was trademarked, it, 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 would, it is a use of a trademark you know, treatment, type treatment or something, then uh, that would be uh, uh, pretty clarifying, I think, for them. And I don't know whether we've ever done that before, but it's something that we should look at, in my opinion. All right, um, Kohler, go ahead, you're up next. Yeah, I'd just like to say I'm in agreement with what John said as far as making these things black and white. I'd also suggest that possibly in the future, that we have a candidate orientation for even sitting directors as well as new candidates, because it seems like we keep doing this every year, we run into problems. And I, I think if we could do an orientation and talk about some of this and get it right up front to every candidate, maybe that would eliminate some of the hassles because it, it, sure, it sure looks bad as far as the public and it is bad, so just a suggestion. And not a bad suggestion. And what I um, think it would be good if, um, I guess I'll look again to staff to consider adding that to the board packet because it is up to the board, the requirements for candidate to run. And one of the requirements could be attending a orientation session. So it's something to consider, but not to be lost. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, it seems that in the packet that you get as a candidate, I can't recall, 
<clears throat> but it does say you can't use any logos or identifiers. Is that is that correct? It's in one of the policies that's in the packet or pointed to by the packet. But how directly it's in front of my face, I don't know. Can somebody else answer that further? Uh, Cheryl, perhaps? It's my understanding that candidates, well, we all, all members have access to policy 105. I think they are given policy 107 and policy 105. However, um, the, as the committee discussed it, we discussed the fact that graphic standard, which is referred to in policy 105, is not identified very well in that policy. I like the suggestion if LPEA wants to look into trademarking those four letters because we certain and the way that they're presented because we found that that was not a violation. Okay, is there? I would just add two. Go ahead, Hillary. Sorry, I would just add two interjections here. Um, in the candidate packet, it does not explicitly call out that line of the policy, but it does tell candidates that it is their responsibility to review board policies 102, 105, 107, 108, and 109, together with the district map, um, bylaws, and articles of incorporation. Um, as far as the branding elements, we are planning on doing a, a bit of a repositioning exercise and that that trademarking could be something included in that, would be something included in that. All right, uh, Sue, go ahead. And just another uh, comment about the trademarking or logo use. You know, Touchstone Energy isn't um, specific to just La Plata Electric. It is for any co-op can use that Touchstone Energy, whatever it is, image, if they belong to that through NRECA. So again, it's not unique to La Plata Electric. Um, I'm not saying he should or should not have used it, but it's certainly not something that La Plata Electric owns ourselves. Any further comment on this issue before we move on to the next item in our agenda? Mr. President? Yes. I would just comment that somehow we got off of discussing uh, what the committee felt was a real problem, which is behavior of certain board members. And we got to discussing the behavior of a candidate whom we did find guilty of, of violating a policy. Um, so I would just reiterate that we would like for the board to consider its own behavior and those of fellow board members. Yeah, it's interesting that um, the reason there is an election supervisory committee in the first place was because of past behavior by past board members. I think it was a good idea that we got that to take some things away from staff, but there certainly had been difficulties in the past. Okay, Joe, your hands up. Anything further? Yeah, I just like to say that uh, I think John made a mea culpa that. Uh, and I had one of those early on. I wrote a letter, it was about an issue, and I didn't identify myself clearly. And, and uh, letters I've written since, I think there's just been one more. You know, I stated clearly in the first sentence, I'm, I'm on the LPA board, this is my opinion only. So I, I think that's pretty simple. And I think... Uh oh Joe froze up again, right? Here, go ahead. Joe, you froze up again, unfortunately, but I think we got your point. It's something that's not difficult to do. Anything else, Joe? All right. Well, then I'm, I'm going to move us along. It's 2.20. We're still doing okay. Um, with the, we have put something off twice now. So let's see if we can actually get it done. And we're hoping now to see in front of us what's going to be a new resolution 2021-10 that will change resolution 2021-09. So Carl, if you could put that up, um, it would be appreciated. It was suggested that there would be one more whereas in there as well. Let's see if we've got them. 
Yes. There's my whereas, um, just to say that the power bills are already showing the 2% reduction effective March 1st. And um, you can see the pending FERC approval in this clause and in this clause has been removed. And the only other change is the date to today. And obviously that it's not 09, it's 10. Okay, um, that looks great. Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, two things. Carl, can you shrink that a little bit so we can see more of it? You kind of went through it quick. And then the, yeah, I'm not sure how to tell you to do that. Yeah, maybe the, uh, re the read mode might help you out. No? Here we go. Oh, all right. <laughs> How's that? I think that's pretty good. So the one, um, the, maybe if you would consider striking the already in, in your whereas, just leave it as power bills from Tri-State are, are reflecting the 2% reduction instead of already, because that puts a time thing on it and resolutions. Yeah, I would prefer not to have that already part. If anybody cares. I think that makes sense. Okay, by me. Okay, any other, so that already, Carl, can you mark that out? If at least a couple of people are suggesting it. Um, as would be fine. And Kirsten, did you have anything else? Tim, go ahead. So I don't know if this is motion that was be, that's been tabled. If that's the case, how do we bring it back? Otherwise, I will just make a motion to approve resolution 2021-10. I think that's appropriate since things have changed quite a bit. So the motion has been made. I see Dan, your hands up, go ahead. Yeah, I think we need to rescind resolution 21-9 before we approve this one. That's we're gonna have that, that's on, gonna be on the books and we have yeah. two conflicting resolutions. Um, Graham, can you address that? Is there once, I mean, I don't, if we've done this before, it seems like we do have some, yes, there are some cases where our resolutions aren't in consecutive order. They skip things for some reason. I can't explain why. So I'm thinking that loud myself, but Graham, can you comment about that as well? I mean, we could, we could, we could take care of that through, uh, the, uh, through the whereas clauses, um, we could say, you know, whereas we um, like right above this, whereas it was included, we could say, whereas uh, on uh, May 19th, uh, 2021, uh, LPA's board of directors approved a resolution allocating uh, these requirements. I, I mean, I, so I think we could contain it all within one document if we made you know, some more reference to uh, what had gone on before. And so, uh, and then we could uh, go down to the uh, now therefore clause and uh, say, um, we have rescinded uh, resolution 2021-09 and replaced it with this 2021-10. Would it be possible, Graham, and this is a question too, in, in thinking about simplifying things, what if the motion was amended to rescind resolution 2021-09, and then that resolution would simply be deleted from our um, online records? Would that be possible, or is it better I think to- that's a, I think that's a fine procedural solution as well. Okay, so, so I think- <laughs> I think it might be a bit easier then, rather than changing what Carl's put here together, and not leaving 2021-09 up on our website to have the motion amended. Um, and then, <clears throat> or so yes, I'm looking for that action by somebody on the board to take. I see your hand up, Dan Huntington, go ahead. Move to table this till next meeting so we're not rushing through this thing. All right, there's a motion to table it to the next meeting, but I would state, Dan, one of the reasons we're rushing is actually to get the money out to the members <laughs> as quick as possible. But there's a motion to, to table this. Is there a second? I'll second that. 
Uh, Sue will second it. Yeah, it just seems like we're uh, trying to mix too much in rather quickly. And like was pointed out earlier, we did that last month in an in a order to try to get money out. And now we're wanting to change it again. So I think maybe some thought needs to be put into it before we act on it again rapidly this month. All right, a motion has been made to table this and it has been seconded. Um, at this time, I'm gonna bring back up the screen so I can see the directors. So I can figure out oh, there's this screen here. Okay. Um, all directors who are in favor of the motion to table this until next month, Please put your hand up so I can count you. Uh, there's no discussion for a um, table motion, I believe. Is any, could Graham, could you answer that or not to me? Yeah, you don't, I don't think we need to do that. I think you can proceed directly to the vote. I, I think that actually is what the- um, You know, the, you cut off the discussion of a previous motion that was sitting there. That's what a table actually does, um, unfortunately. But we'll see if it passes or not, and we'll know what direction to take. All those who are in favor of tabling these, I'm gonna count your hands and announce who you are. So please put the hands up, those who are in favor of the motion to table this. I see Dan, that's one. I see John, that's two. Sue is three and Joe is four. All those who are opposed to tabling this, please um, go ahead and put your hand up and let's count those. See, Kohler's one, Britt is two, um, Tim is three, Kirsten's four, Bob is five, and Holly is six, and Rachel is in the dark. I can't see your hand. I'm abstaining because I lost and, internet. Okay. Girl. I so it's, got... it's um, six to four, so that table motion fails in the count that I had, and Rachel is abstaining. Um, I miss, may be missing somebody. Was there another abstention? Well, anyhow, it failed um, when perhaps in somebody reviewing the record catch the names that I didn't. The motion is still to um, approve. Uh, let's see, no, there is a motion to approve this resolution. I was asking for an amendment to the motion to rescind 2021-09. Does anybody want to make that, um, amend this motion to do that? Tim, go ahead. So just point of process clarification. I made a motion. Um, it was not seconded. You you cut off conversation and uh, nice. by recognizing Dan, who then made a table the motion. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, my suggestion is that I will reframe that motion. I will that would work, and I will say that I will make a motion instead that is approve. Uh, Resolution 20 20 or 2021-10 and rescind 2021-9 at the same in the same uh, action. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Kohler. Seconded by Kohler. Is there any further discussion of this motion? I'm not seeing any. Let's go ahead and do a hand vote again so we can make, get a count for that. All those in favor of this motion to approve 2021-10 and rescind 2021-09, please raise your hand and I'll make a count and announce. Go ahead. I've got Kohler, Britt's two, and I've got Tim is three, Kirsten is four, Bob is five, Holly is six, Joe is seven, Okay, I've got seven, so it's going to pass. Now, those who would like, who are going to oppose this, please raise your hand to get on the record. Those who are opposed this motion, I've got Sue is one, John is two, Dan is three, three pros, and any abstaining. I've got Rachel abstaining because she couldn't follow the conversations because she was <clears throat> south of the border. All right, that motion is passed. So we have a new resolution 2021-10 and that also dictates to staff to um, get the money out. Show us the money. <clears throat> All right, motion to protect. The next thing would be the director travel and training requests. 
I found on page 205 of the board packet, if you want to hit 205 and jump over there, that there is an what looks like some NRECA courses, and then followed by that are some CREA courses a couple of pages later. As we'd ask staff to do, whenever they found some appropriate courses to put them up here so people could have in front of them, it would be easier for us to request uh, expense if necessary to attend these. At this time, are there any directors who would like to ask permission to attend any of these courses? Not seeing any. Kirsten, go ahead. No, since since somebody was attending, after that comes the risk management, the whole booklet, that wasn't meant to be in here. I'm sorry, that's just supposed to be in our um, overdrive or in our Google Drive. So ignore that. Do be aware that it is an NRECA uh, copyrighted thing and it's only for uh, directors and, and uh, employees of co-ops. Okay, will do. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, I was requesting permission to attend the um, Continuous Improvement of Governance class, 905.1, July 7th through 8th. I know. Okay, we've got one from Rachel. Are there any other requests to attend any of these courses? Not seeing any, I'm looking for a motion to approve that single direct request for training. May I have such a motion? So moved. so moved by Tim. Is there a second? Kirsten seconds. Kirsten seconds. Is there further discussion of these training requests? All those in favor, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Any opposed to training requests? No, and any abstentions? No, okay, the training request is approved. Now um, it'll be, Tim, we're going on to you. This will be the director travel and, no, the, the director expense approval. Um, hopefully you'll have the record straight to be able to tell us what we're approving that we've spent in the last month. So if you would, please go ahead. All right, thank you, Britt. Um, it's, it's a short one this month. So um, all the board members are here for this meeting. So that would, uh, and, and I wanna remind everyone, even though I report this year, um, the finance department um, really, really needs you to complete your sign-in sheet uh, because those hours that are um, included there help on the uh, form seven and other reporting. So I know myself, I sometimes forget that as well. I always appreciate the reminder from Monica and Jan uh, Janelle. So please, all of you fill that out. I don't know if there's some that from past meetings that haven't been completed. If you've ever been notified of that, please make sure that you do those. So anyway, this month, all 12 directors for um, stipend and uh, per diem. Finance and Audit Committee, uh, Directors Bassett, Lynch, Skihan, and Wheeler, four of us at half day. The Roundup board meetings, Lewandowski and uh, Skihan, the two directors that are on the Roundup board, um, half day times two. CREA board meeting, Director Metzler, um, one day, uh, well, excuse me, one half day. Um, broadband Committee, uh, Director Metzler, Skin, and Wheeler, uh, three at half day. Committee on Policies, um, that's Director Huntington and uh, Director McWilliams, both uh, half day. Director Lewandowski was uh, apparently not there for that, so he's not making a claim. Um, there were no other mandatory meeting uh, claims at this point. There were uh, two directors Director Metzler and Director Skihan that participated in the, in the um, risk management course. And I understand since that was put in the board packet that you guys will have a quiz for us here. In about <laughs> five minutes. You got it. So um, anyway, those two uh, each were a half day, half day each um, for two different half days of that. So that's all the expenses at this point. All right, may I have a motion to approve those director expenses? Rachel moves. Rachel moves, is there a second? 
John Lee seconds. John Lee seconds. Is there any discussion of these? All those who are in favor of approving these director expenses, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, they were unanimously passed, those director expenses. <clears throat> okay, the next thing on the agenda is there was a request for a CFC director position. Now that's on page 208 that starts with that information and then there's a paperwork to fill out and everything else. We tried to get this out to the board so that if anybody wanted to apply for this, they would be in a position to do that. At this time, has anybody stepped up and wants to apply for this and is going to fill out this form and pursue it? Sue McWilliams, go ahead. I would like to do so. Um, I think that my background in finance would be an asset to the CFC board. And, um, you know, I know that they work very closely with the NRECA. I have served on the NRECA resolution committee for probably three or four years, been quite a few years back now, but I think uh, I still keep up with those resolutions. And I think that it could be a benefit to both our co-ops and NRCA if we have me as a regional director, I guess. But I would need support from the board or want support from the board and certainly from Jessica. Appreciate you stepping up. Is there anybody else who wishes to challenge her to that position? I'm not seeing any. So to indicate support for her attempt to get on this, I guess it's certainly not a done deal. There probably be other directors who apply. I don't know how they'll choose them. We'll look for a motion and a second and to approve Sue doing this. Uh, Tim, go ahead. Um, I'm just curious what the financial impact on the co-op might be and if uh, Sue were to become that, um, that representative, is that something we would then need to pay per diem and travel and other kinds of things? And, does, Sorry, um, right, just putting on my treasure. Yeah. <laughs> does anybody have information on that? Carl, for instance, do you know what, what this would entail? I believe CFC pays for that, but Sue, do you, do you know? That's my understanding as well, as if any cost would be covered by CFC. Similar to what Tri-State does, um, you know, per diem or travel would be covered by them. All right. I'm looking for a motion to approve Sue applying for this position. I'll move by I'll make a motion. I got a okay. motion by John Witchell. Is there a second? Second by Kohler. Seconded by Kohler. Is there any further discussion of this? Yeah, I'd like to make an amendment. Uh, Kirsten, okay, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I'd like to amend it that we, uh, so it's not just that we approve her, that we endorse Sue for uh, the word position. All right. There's an amendment that we change the wording slightly so that we endorse Sue for this CFC position. Is there a second to that amendment? Second by Kohler. Second by Kohler. Any discussion on the amendment? Okay. Those who approve changing the wording to endorse rather than approve, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, the wording has been slightly abstained. Sue abstains, since it applies to her. The wording slightly changed. Now this is a motion to endorse Sue for applying for this position. Further discussion of this motion. Holly, go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, as the CREA rep currently, I do know that there has been two other candidates have thrown their hats into the rings from other Colorado cooperatives. And, um, so I would need further direction from this board if that would be the vote going forward as well at the CREA interviews. Yeah, I noticed sometimes our CRE rep has come back asking us for advice or for directions on some things. And of course, much of the time they act for the co-op uh, deciding how to do this. I don't know how soon this vote is going to come up. Do you know, Holly? Is it some CREA votes? I on? believe it happens at the next um, CREA board meeting, which is next Friday. Yeah, right. just to 
Can I clarify? Go ahead. So actually, um, we need to return interest and in the attached candidate agreement by June 23rd. It's a six-year commitment that runs through 2026, and it will be voted on at the regional meeting. And I'm reading this from CREA's email that was sent out. Okay. And um, let's just go ahead and get the motion cleaned up before we go on further with any other actions. So is there any discussion of this motion to endorse Sue for this attempting to get on this committee or this board? Um, all right, all those in favor of the motion to endorse Sue, please unmute and say aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposition or abstentions? S Sue abstains. All right, so that did pass so unanimously um so that is finished with that item so it sounds like you got a week to get the paperwork ready and get it through and get it in and uh, best of luck with that It'll be interesting to see what happens Thank okay that. the next item on the agenda i think we can keep working our way through here is um we were going to talk with our attorney. He said, no, nothing's happened, no updates. And as far as I know, that's what I know too. The only update I got in the last month is that Tri-State, remember Matt has been talking to us about how there's no possibility of settling, settling with Tri-State for the exit charge methodology. But Tri-State has asked for another, um, working group sort of meeting to try and explain the methodology again. That would be in for July 19th. That's the only thing I've seen happen. And I haven't seen any responses on that other items. Does anybody else have anything to add on these things in public session that are going on these litigation things? Otherwise we'll leave that agenda item. Nope. All right. No executive session. Does anybody have any need or any reason for an executive session that I'm not aware of? No, not seeing one. We'll leave that item. And there, we didn't have an executive session, so there's no possible action to take because of it. So now we're going on to reports. The first of those reports is the attorney report, and this is on page 220. Typically with these reports, we're asking the people who author them just to highlight a point or two if they think it's necessary and otherwise ask for questions because the full reports are in the board packets. So um, Graham, if you would start this out, with your board attorney report on page 220. Is there anything that you wish to highlight? You know, the only thing I was gonna bring up uh, based on uh, sort of last month's I heard a series of uh, director questions. Um, it wasn't that I didn't get good questions in the ensuing month. I just, a lot of them, as you can sort of tell, were candidate questions and uh, and things of that nature. So um, I don't really have a lot of additional questions to report back to the board. Okay, are there questions on the attorney report? Uh, Sue, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Graham, can you expound on what easements were transferring? I think it was on page 220 and it talks about easements. Yeah, it's the second one from the bottom, the second bullet point from the bottom. The easements to Tri-State? Just as I am sort of having a hard time pulling that memo up and um, it it all all it says is continued work on tri-state easement transfer. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the tri-state easement transfer we talked about this a little bit last month uh, when we uh, transferred some assets uh, up north near the San Juan County line over into Silverton. Uh, there were some easements that didn't get transferred along with that uh, sale that was uh, in, I think, January of 2020. And so this is just sort of a cleanup of that. And uh, um, right now where we really are on it is uh, that um, we have to get that released as collateral off of our mortgage uh, with CFC. So Carl and I are setting up a meeting with uh, CFC to talk to them about the mortgage release on that. But that is... Um, those easements, we discussed that uh, last month, I believe the, um, the transfer of uh, some of the transmission assets uh, north into uh, San Juan County. And this is just a cleanup of that sale from a year and a half ago. 
Okay, so it's easements only and not assets. Is that correct? Correct. All the all the assets transferred, uh, but you know, there's just you know the uh, tri-state wanted to uh, go back and and uh, solidify their access to that. So I've structured it in a way that because we still have assets in that area too, I've structured the transfer in a way that we still retain all of our own access rights, but they're basically sort of you know sharing a road with tri-state. Yeah. Right. All right. Are there other questions for Graham? Is that my frozen? You've been freezing up and back, but we heard enough my of it frozen? anyway. We can hear you, Graham. Okay, we're going on then to the next report, and that's the Roundup Foundation on page 221. Are there is there anything that you would like to point out there? Joe, is that you? Joe's actually having internet problems. It keeps yeah, it, it's it's Joe. If there's any questions, I can answer them. Kirsten, anything you want to point out? Any questions on Roundup? I appreciate you guys. It's now how you're putting the report out. Who has got it, et cetera, and how many people are signing up. There's a lot of good information now in the monthly reports on Roundup. That's good work. Yeah, that was all, all Joe's work. Okay, not the thing on Roundup. We'll go on to the next direct report. That's Tri-State, Kohler, page 228. So this month was our strategic planning. So most of it is in executive session and the board meeting itself is, is extremely brief. So I don't have too much to talk about, but I would say that one of the big emphasis and the, the top subject we talked about was the drought and the impact of the drought on Tri-State, which indirectly will have a big impact on us as well. Um, for instance, the, the low level in Lake Powell has caused a 30% efficient issue with, with power being produced by WAPA because it doesn't have the pressure it does when it has more water. And there's quite a few issues like that that were brought up. Also with the generation where they have their thermal units, that's Tri-State, uh, they need a lot of water to run those. And the ranchers and the farmers and everybody else needs a lot of water as well. So it's gonna be a very challenging time. So we talked about the drought the impact, and that just adds to some of the other financial challenges facing Tri-State. Tri-State, well, probably in the next one to two years, will, will be really challenged from a financial point of view, and I'll have more detail. I saw a couple questions from Kirsten. I couldn't dig into it, but I will answer those via email. That's about all I've got, to, unless somebody has questions. All right, Rachel, go ahead. I'm guessing this was something that was um, in executive session, <laughs> but just curious if you have any information you can share about the, uh, I think it was the internal cost things you all received about members exiting Tri-State. And again, I think I'm, it, it was an executive session for us, but it was not for Jessica and the member CEOs. So I, I think I would push that to, to Jessica and I would, I would be silent on it. Thanks, Kohler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, just to be just to uh, be safe, I would want to go back to Tri-State and see if I can release that information because there was something that I, I wanted to get a copy of, for example, that DMEA Kit Carson presentation, and they said that it's, it's not public. Um, so I'd have to, I need to go back and see if that information can be sent. So we'll get back to you. The six year anniversary of Kit Carson's exit is one month from this, from about now. I mean, one year, one year from about now. So stand by and see what happens with Kit Carson a year from now where they will no longer have their debt to pay down unless they've extended in some way I'm not aware of. Uh, more questions for here, Kirsten, go ahead. Yeah, Claire, I appreciate you telling me you're going to, to respond by email. One I wanted to point out to the whole board was about the organized markets lessons learned that ramping down can be an issue. And we talk frequently about ramping up and that, well, coal doesn't ramp up well and, and such. Um, but there's this thought of, boy, when you need to turn stuff down, you need to be able to turn stuff down fast because the electrons have to go somewhere. You can't run a windmill backwards, but you can shut it down. But then there's a big cost involved in that because you're not getting your production 
So it was interesting to see that it was a, a direction on ramping that I hadn't thought about yet. And I appreciated that. Um, and I would really appreciate it. And if you don't understand some of my questions, because I left them really brief, please, please be in, in touch with me because I'm very interested in, in, in some of this that was, I, and I hope you're not, I don't hope you don't have to say on each of them, well, that was executive session, but you're always good at teasing that stuff out. So thank you. Okay, uh, Dan Harms, go ahead. Kohler, I was wondering if you mentioned uh, reduced generation from the, the WAPA projects. Did Tri-State address how that might impact their carbon um, goals and aspirations? Just, you know, if we got, if they're saying 35% now, do they, I think a large part of that comes from that, those WAPA hydro allocations. I was wondering if Tri-State address that at all, if there's reduced allocations, how that might impact them? They did not, but that's a good question that I will ask him because I didn't, I didn't think about it either. So, and I know that WAPA has to provide the power that they say they will, but they'll buy it on the market, which means they might just buy what they can get a hold of. So it will have an effect, but I don't know the answer to your question. And the one slight clarification as I understood it, Kohler, is WAPA has to offer that power that they're supposed to supply, but it's up to the off taker to decide whether to get it from WAPA at the price WAPA can get it at or to go out and get it by themselves. Is, is that your understanding as well? WAPA has to offer it, but they don't aren't required to supply it. It's up to, would be Tri-State in this case for the part that's not being provided. So Tri-State could shop around and get a better deal. I, I did not understand that, but I will double check on that. That yeah, was not we, my understanding. Yeah, we went through that when we visited with WAPA as to if they don't meet their allocations, what happens? Because it did come up some. And, and, and actually, I saw even, Dan Harm shaking his head. Dan, do you know? I saw Dan Harm about? shaking his head, yeah, so he might know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Not that it's a big deal, but it, it could be an advantage to Tri-State because the WAPA is not able to get it as cheap as Tri-State can get it elsewhere. It makes some sense that Tri-State wouldn't be obligated to get something WAPA can't provide. Um, Tim, go ahead. So um, this is a question maybe for Kohler here. I know that in the legislature that just finished the... Um, they passed a, a bill that reduced the exemption for coal severance tax that uh, Tri-State enjoyed. So it's, there's a severance tax on, you know, taking minerals out of the ground. And I think Tri-State had some exemption for the Colorado mine and Colorado was reducing that um, exemption over some time. And I don't know if that was discussed or Maybe it's still waiting to be signed by Pola, so maybe that impact isn't known yet, but I'm just curious what kind of impact might uh, come about from that in terms of our own um, pricing for electric power. We did not discuss that, Tim, but I got it on my list here. So I'll ask, do you by any chance have the bill number? I don't, I could dig it up and uh, okay. Holly might have it because it. It was yeah. listed in CREA's report. It's um, SB 21-261. Repeat that, please. I'm sorry. SB 21-261. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So, Kohler, um, one thing that I'm just curious that they talked to the board about is that they were mentioning there's a $20 million shortfall in their budget because of the Texas crisis and a few other things. And the theory was that they were going to make that up this fall with um, deferred revenue or secondary sales. But a lot of that was contingent on a good water year and kind of normal things happening, which were no longer in a normal scenario. Did they mention at all how they make up that shortfall? No, and in fact, it's actually looking a little grimmer than, than what you mentioned because the member sales have not uh, recovered yet, mostly the oil and gas section. So, you know, they're getting hit by that. And there's a few other things that, for instance, the Texas expense was up more than what they thought it was gonna be. 
Uh, it's close to 11 and a half million. And there's a few other things. And they, I know they were anticipating making some of it up with sales this summer because the um, forward pricing is, is pretty high on power. But that's, that's not something that they're going to plan on. They're planning on the worst case scenario. And I, I don't have a, you know, an answer other than they're working. They're looking at all the different angles. And that's one of the things that, that we looked at in the strategic planning is, or what are the options for these different things that are getting thrown at us? Thank you. Yeah. All right, are there any further questions for caller? I'm not seeing any. Thank you again, Kohler, for the report and all the details that you provide. Um, the next one would be the Fast Track Communications report. That's on page 236. And Tim, is there anything that you would like to point out before you ask for questions? Sorry, I had to find the unmute there. Um, I know you guys like it better when I'm muted, but... Um, so, you know, there's a, there was a key employee that's provided a resignation notice um, that I'd just like to comment on that to, will be effective the 28th of June. And in discussing that with the board at the last board meeting and talking with uh, Kelly, the general manager, it's not perceived that that will have a, a material impact on ongoing operations in the in the short term. They're gonna hire um, someone, uh, actually, they're gonna hire two positions to fill that one. And, uh, and so, and there are some other things that they've done um, previously um, in terms of the way they operate that uh, reduce risk substantially from this kind of thing, as well as, um, what they're doing to backstop um, till they hire these new people is also, it, it was all answered to my satisfaction. Let me put it that way. And uh, and I, I came away with a confidence that there, this will not be hugely impactful in continuing operations. There may be some impact in terms of uh, how quickly new installs may be handled, but they'll still be within the contractual commitments that Fast Track has with any new installations. It's just that typically they, they, they exceeded those, um, those commitments and they may not be quite as quick. So I just kind of wanted to, that, that to me was a concern. Um, I did press and ask that a lot, a lot of questions about that. And I feel at this point confident as can be around uh, minimal impact in that regard. Um, other than that, I, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, yeah, the, the Tombo, knowing him, I know he'll be missed. He was pretty remarkable. I was remarkable. trying not to say a name there. <laughs> oh, it's in the pack. Oh, it's, excuse me. Uh, Sue, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Jim, one quick question. You know, we've been exploring broadband on our end to the home. Has uh, Fast Track been exploring grants and kind of pursuing a parallel line to give broadband to the home if Lopata decides not to? Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. The, um, the strategic plan that we all uh, on the Fast Track Board engaged in the strategic planning session in 2019 um, did not have fiber to the home or to the residents. Fiber to businesses is definitely has been part of the strategic plan and part of their effort. But fiber to a home or to a resident um, was not in that strategic plan. However, over the course of the pandemic and the impact that that has shown, uh, try, or excuse me, <laughs> Fast Track has, has altered that strategic plan to accommodate certain, I would say, uh, putting toes in the water perhaps, might be a way to put it, um, strategic partnerships with a couple of subdivisions that will uh, sort of stretch the muscles and provide them their um, an experience for, for providing uh, fiber to uh, residential premises. And uh, 
and that will inform another strategic planning session around that. They did apply for RDA funds that would have had that come through. There was a, a, a business plan and a rollout plan to accommodate if we if fast track one in those areas, but Connexon under bid uh, fast track and received the approval for those areas. So, um, so that that is one area where they applied for funds. There's another one which I reported previously this year to provide um, in Ignacio. A, a, a partnership with the town of Ignacio applied for grant funds for um, through the state of Colorado to uh, do a fiber to the home and uh, premise um, program in the town of Ignacio. That was, there was a lot of requests for a very small uh, round of funding. And uh, this, this grant request did not get funded. It will come up again, um, it was scheduled to come up again in July, but that um, that looks like it might be delayed with the uh, new round of different kinds of funding that's coming from the federal government into um, Colorado. And so some of those grant opportunities are being adjusted to accommodate this other funding and how it might be used. And it's not quite clear when clarity will come through on that, but Fast Track is, is preparing themselves to reapply for the Ignacio project should the opportunity become clear in terms of grant funding. Does that help, uh, Sue? Did that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. Sure, pleasure. Any other questions for Tim regarding Fast Track? All right, on page 244 is the CREA report provided by Holly. Holly, if you would go ahead and highlight anything and we'll ask for questions. Great, thank you. Um, the CREA board met the end of, May, uh, end of May and any of the legislation that is um, now finished for the year because the legislature did adjourn for the year. Kohler, I have to apologize profusely and Tim because I gave you the wrong number for that. Um, piece of legislation we were just talking about that's phasing out the, the coal exemptions. And that, that bill, sir, would be HB 21-1312, and it's Insurance Premium Property Sales Severance Tax is the title of that. Um, the only other thing that I would say, I don't, I don't know, I think I froze up, I, I'm not sure. No, we anyway. got you. The only other thing I would say right now about CREA is that they, um, oh, great, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm really impressed with the work that Dale Kishbaugh has been doing in the loss and control um, uh, commit, uh, segment of the organization. Um, he's been doing some great work and I'm really excited that he, through his work with FEMA, he is now, the state of Colorado is being asked to participate in a pilot program to streamline reporting procedures uh, for wildfire claims. So I think that's pretty exciting. And he's also been asked to work with the National Fire Protection Association on a fire detection uh, project. And let's see, um, I sent you some information about some NRECA resolutions that are being considered and supported by CREA. I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to take a look at that, but um, I did send something out about a week and a half ago. Uh, CREA is also going to be moving into the title sponsor position for the Pedal the Plains event on the eastern slope of Colorado. Um, it appears that the title sponsor did back out of that and CREA has supported that for many, many years. And uh, the funding for it is coming out of the international projects budget because no international projects will be done this year. And let's see, I guess that's about all right now for CREA. Does anybody have any questions? I'm looking for them. Thanks, Holly, for your report. Any questions? And thanks for clarifying the um, bill, just for help those guys look it up. 
Yeah, okay. and just some further information that did pass both chambers as of 6 2 of 21, so the second of this month. It does not show that it has been signed into law yet. All right, good. Um, then we'll go on to West United. Was there anything going on with West United? Western United did not have a board meeting since our last board meeting. However, last night sometime after five o'clock, I did get some financial information in a statement from CEO Mordini. And in that, just a couple of highlights from that. Uh, May 2021 sales were 21% higher than May 2020. Their year-to-date sales, and they run a different fiscal year, they run July to, to June. Uh, their year-to-date sales are $146.9 million. Backlog is strong. They continue to invest in inventory because um, the back ordering, the uh, lead time on getting products is still getting pretty extensively long. And I noticed in some of the appendix of the um, dashboard that our staff has been meeting with them and just making sure that they have um, on stock what is needed. Uh, something else of a little kudos to them. They just increased their rating to number 63 of the top 150 nationwide electrical wholesaling organizations up from number 72. And they're number three in sales per employee, which is pretty cool. Yeah, their growth has been Me astonishing. Too. But that okay. Yeah. Thank you, Everything Holly. I've seen from them, it, it's pretty encouraging. Yeah. Okay, any questions on any of the direct reports? Anything we missed? All right, the next thing I'd like to address, uh, John, go ahead. Uh, I saw maybe something I missed at the very beginning that I should have brought up, so it might not be appropriate for the agenda, but uh, with our meeting being towards the end of July, did uh, we need to address the county fairs representative? Or I know for my schedule, uh, I would need it done, you know, before a week or two before it's taking place, but maybe with it not being on the agenda, it might not be appropriate. What's the date that you have for those? Archuleta is uh, the fifth through the eighth with the auction, the buyer's auction being on the 7th of August and La Plata County Fairs 11 through 14 August with the buyer's auction on the 14th. Okay, and so the concern is our next board meeting would leave little or no time to pick somebody and have them prepare to go. Um, we've oftentimes done this on asking for volunteers in a sense. It's not anything that <coughs> is extremely formal and I believe needs to be on the agenda. Dan, do you have further comment on this? Dan, the, um, <clears throat> the mute thing again. Sorry. No, I don't have anything on this. I have another question to ask after we discuss this. Okay, so we'll hang on to this a minute to say, well, I'm, I'm looking for, would, go ahead. The reason I brought it up is I, I went for La Plata County last year and I would volunteer to go for both of them this year uh, as a buyer or, or just La Plata County. Uh, I thought it was a chance to go over and meet people that were in Archuleta. I could meet Holly and Bob and Kristen in person, perhaps, or something. So, well, well that would be great. Does anybody else also want to help out with these county fairs? Um, please unmute and let me know now. Otherwise, um, and John, I'm sure we would uh, appreciate that volunteering. Is there anybody else who can or would like to help out? Okay. Do you, so there will be some money spent for these but john that should be on the agenda next month to once you get an idea of how much and get these authorization to spend that but that will give you time to prepare them to know that you're our designated representative to go but you'll ask for permission next month okay uh, i think that was already in the budget when i talked with carl after last year and Jeannie bennett will have that i'll coordinate with her for signing up all right that sounds real good Thanks for you taking the initiative on that. Uh, Dan Huntington, what have you got? Um, 
I got an email a couple of days ago saying that our six o'clock meeting tomorrow night and that the Zoom logins would be sent. And I just checking to see if they've been sent yet because I haven't gotten anything. Uh, Janelle, can you address whether or not the logins for tomorrow's meeting have been sent to the directors? I believe they have. Drew can probably verify that one because I didn't set that one up. Is Drew still on? No, actually, Drew just got a red uh, fire warning. So he had to run to his home and I think make sure everyone's safe. So he'll, we'll, we'll make sure he looks at that, Dan. Well, it, it was a little confusing, but it looked like the directors, very few directors were actually going to be participants. And most of us had to sign up to be attendees. That's right, so Kirsten. Once, so, so Dan, I don't think you were on the list of participants. So if you want to attend, you have to sign up and then you'll get an attendee inv invitation. Where do you sign up at, Kirsten? Uh, it was at the, it was on the email. It okay. was a little on, on the website. Yeah. Janelle, do you and, mind sending them the link to the, the website, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. All right, that's right. There were just a few panelists who were going to run the meeting and everybody else was just attending, but they were wanting to collect everybody who was attending by having them sign up first. So it will be an extra step there, Dan. Uh, Dan, do you have anything else? No, that's all. I just, the way it read it, that it would, the link would be sent later. Yes. Um, Kirsten, go ahead. Okay, um, I think you need, we need to decide right now about the location of the next LPA meeting as things tend to be opening up. And so I'm looking for the will of the board for the next LPA meeting. Are you, would you like to have it in person at LPA's headquarters or is there any reason not to? And we're not asking, which still baffles me, who has and hasn't been vaccinated or who can and can't go because of that. Um, further discussion of this. Kirsten, go ahead. I move that we have the next board meeting in person. There's a motion to have the next board meeting in person at LPA headquarters. Is there a second for that? Kohler? Rachel Second seconds. by Kohler. Seconded by Kohler. Is there further discussion of this? Uh, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to verify with Jessica uh, that there's no restriction on that at this point. And use, um, of, use of the facility, that is. Thanks for asking. There is no restrictions anymore. <laughs> wow. Times are changing. I'm missing the boat here. <laughs> Just by a month. Um, further discussion of this motion to hold the next LPA meeting at LPA headquarters in person. Kirsten, your hands up. Do you have any more comment? No. Any further comment? I'm not seeing any. All the directors in favor of an in-person board meeting next month, please indicate so by unmuting and saying aye at this time. Aye. 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 Any who are opposed? Any who abstain? And I, of course, would abstain. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Uh, well, congratulations. That's good news. Um, it should be <clears throat> interesting to get together finally after all this time. Uh, Tim, go ahead. So, yeah, I don't know whether this is the appropriate time or not. There were a couple things earlier in the material in the board packet I had a couple questions about. Is this a good time to ask? Sure, because we're just about, that was what I was going to ask for last minute questions. Um, one was the report from, uh, I think it was Kirsten and Holly for the risk management thing. There was a notation in there, page 86, said legal reporting services available to board members. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant or what it is. Is that something that we should be able to access and is it useful to do so? Go for it. Yeah, well, uh, so NRCA has this thing called LRS, Legal Report Service. And it's sort of a compilation of what's going on, editorials from lawyers and such. And we, we, we as LPA do subscribe to it. So if you want to see anything of it, yeah, you can, I think we have to go through Graham because I think we have a single thing. Um, the, the instructor pointed out that this last month, 
the lead article was about the uh, dealing with uh, if there's any conflicts with folks getting um, money from non-members uh, when they're running. So that was one a, 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 an example that he brought up. But it, it sounds like it's a pretty good thing. Have you read it, any of them yet, Graham? You know, I, I follow it. Um, also, uh, it's uh, I found it to be pretty searchable on NRECA's website. So um, I, uh, you know, gone back and been able to research uh, past issues. Um, you might you might recall uh, I've cited it a few times, even in in board meetings. So I mean, it's it's valuable. I think there's multiple ways for you to get it. You can probably access it through your NRECA subscription, but I, I get sort of the Yeah, we we can't unless we pay for it. So I was was trying, ho hoping that if LPA had a subscription that, that if there was something specific we wanted, we could ask you for it, or is that gonna be in violation of the intent? I don't think there's a problem with that. I think I've, if you've seen uh, something that you like me to pour it on to you, just let me know and I'm happy to forward those articles. Okay, super, thanks. Um, All right, does well, um, there, there was Tim go ahead? Sorry. Yeah. Um, on, uh, I think it's page 61, um, the, the targets, it's about uh, you know, targets under the dashboard reports. It struck me that the carbon footprint from power supply reduced 35%. I don't, I don't know that I, I, if that's been there before, I missed it. And I, I'm curious why it's 35%. I thought we had a strategic goal of 50. And so I'm just curious what's, what's up with that. What did I miss? Uh, it's, it's because it's a five-year plan, Tim. And uh, if you do a linear extrapolation, you know, on our way to 2030, that's where, uh, I think we were, that's what I recall. I'd, I'd have to look at it a little more closely to confirm that. But. So you're saying we've already reduced it by 15 and we're on our way. We have to do another 35 in 2030? Well, it, it takes into consideration what we thought we were going to be able to do in that five-year plan. That was before we had the uh, partial requirements option here. Now that that's on the table, I think it can be very different than, than that. And it'll probably be, we, ought, we, we could be able to get to 50% to even by then. But um, at the time we made this report, that's where we thought we were gonna be able to hit. I think we'll be able to do better than that. Right, I mean, our strategic goal says 50 by 2030. So I hope we can get 50 by 2030, because- Right, that's what, no, that's- So-, so uh, yeah. I'd so say 50 by next year. <laughs> that, would be even, that would be even better. But I guess one other, piece out of this is I don't know that we've ever really come to an understanding of, as a board as to what is the baseline and and you know what do we have to do um, against that baseline I, I, I is our baseline simply the power that we get from tri-state we talked about other things maybe contributing to lowering our carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would request that maybe um, going forward or shortly, maybe maybe we wait till after the RFP thing is for the partial is all done. But it, I think where we've had great presentation around our electric rates and so forth, it's less clear to me where we are in terms of a reference of 2018 and what we have to do to achieve that 2030 goal. Um, so I would just make a request for that kind of a presentation. So we're all again, back on the same page with carbon footprint. So, okay. um, On a future agenda item then, maybe even yeah. maybe the whole sometime in the fall, but something to be think about. And the other part of that that I occasionally have stressed was in addition to a power supply goal, I was hoping that LPA could also have a goal for its own carbon. And obviously by getting some of these new electric vehicles and trucks, they'll be hitting that. But things that could be done and have been done, it would be nice to see LPA itself as well as power supply. So th those are thoughts for the future. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim, anything else? Uh, yeah, one last thing on um, page, maybe, maybe it's the next page after that. The media coverage highlights. Um, I don't know, I download this as a PDF. I don't use um, Director Point directly. Um, and it, I thought they used to be clickable links in there and they aren't in my package. So I would just make a request that those, I mean, there were some media coverage highlights that I'd never seen before. So I was gonna go look at them and uh, uh, these links aren't clickable. So, and I thought they were in previously. It would take me right to that, that site. So a request. Yes, they should be clickable. Um, we'll check in on that version. Um, there's a sort of a special step that you have to do at the very end when you're when you're exporting out of the graphic design software that we make this in to make the links live, and we may have neglected to do that again on this one. Um, I apologize if that's the case. You, you trained me too well. And I didn't <laughs> Thanks very much. Let's see if we can. And Hey, Brett, can I make a reminder to just if folks would like, if they have questions, you can always email them to us. Kirsten does a really good job of that so that we can answer them real time. So Tim, like with the links, if you wanted to, please feel free to email us before the board meeting and so that you can actually click on the links if you want them before the board meeting. But we're always open to folks also emailing questions about the board packet before the board meeting so we can answer those to help facilitate this meeting. Yeah, I, I appreciate hey. that and I try to do that, but we, waiting through 247 pages, sometimes I don't email directly, right, at that moment. And so then I see him again the next day or the, the day of, and I ask. So I, we hope, all make I hope we're not efforts. suggesting we, we have to email because asking is also very helpful. So. Okay. Um, we will all make best efforts to always continue to improve these board meetings to make them as efficient as possible but we don't want to, on the other hand, be discouraging people from asking questions, having conversation. Is there any further, anybody wants to bring up now? Go ahead, Sue. I just wanna make a comment uh, to you, Brett, <clears throat> and this being your last meeting, that I think you have been a wonderful president. You have handled all of the meetings so professionally, and I've been very, very impressed. I just wish the very best for you in your future ventures. Well, I appreciate that. I sometimes know I've been a lot more of a dictator than a board president, but I think you have to do that once in a while. Um, okay, I think speaking of being a dictator, we've gone through this pretty good. We're a little bit behind schedule, but I think all is well. So I'll ask one last time if anybody brings anything else up, and otherwise I'm going to adjourn this meeting and go start drinking, or I mean, um, <clears throat> go start exercising. All right. Well, I appreciate that, everybody. Good meeting. I look forward to you guys <laughs> getting together next meet uh, next month. I will continue to follow your activity. I'll continue to be around. You can count on it. <laughs> we'll right. see you Thank at you, the uh, public session, Brett. All right. We'll do. Good morning. Yeah, Thank tomorrow you. night. We'll see you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.